Hi, everyone. My name is Janine Stevens, <clears throat> and I am a director of scientific programs at Chenelia Research Campus. On behalf of Chenelia, I want to welcome you to the sixth in our series of planning workshops in the area of 4D cellular physiology. But before we get started, I want to take a moment just to provide a bit of background to those of you who are not necessarily familiar with Chenelia or 4D cellular physiology. With the effort led by Executive Director Ron Vale, as well as Jennifer Lippicott Schwartz and Nelson Spruston, Janelia will launch a new research program in 4D cellular physiology in 2022, with recruitment of labs beginning later this year. 4D cellular physiology will be a 15 year, 15 lab effort, broadly aimed at understanding function, structure, and communication mechanisms of cells in the context of their native tissue environments. We aim to leverage Janelia's highly collaborative and supportive environment, as well as the broad range of expertise of our scientists, including not only biology, but also physics, engineering, chemistry, math, computer science, and more. Since 2006, Janelia's unusual research model has facilitated productive interactions between tool developers and tool users, leading to advances in neuroscience, imaging, molecular tools, computation and theory, and software development advances which not only benefit our own labs, but many others around the world. And we look forward to doing the same as we work at the intersection of cell biology and physiology. So in order to maximize our impact in 4D cellular physiology, we are holding this series of workshops to allow us and the rest of the scientific community to learn about the state of the art in the field, the biggest questions and the, the biggest and most exciting questions and the conceptual and practical challenges to addressing those questions. So with that, I will turn it over to the workshop organizers to tell you a little bit more about the exciting program that we have over the next two days, starting with Mike Longacre from the Stanford School of Medicine. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Janine. Uh, and we're very excited that to have such an all-star lineup uh, participate in this workshop. Uh, as we learned this morning, there are almost over 900 people signed up for this uh, workshop. So that just speaks to the appetite and, and demand for understanding regeneration. We've called this replace, regenerate, and repair, but the overarching goal is to understand with few exceptions why humans do not regenerate when responding to an injury. Um, and I think that's one of the great unsolved mysteries um, in research and clinical medicine. And I think it's fantastic to be one of these 4D cellular uh, physiology workshops. Um, the goal here is to understand why humans don't regenerate but each speaker, I hope you do just a, a small amount on your latest science and then the majority of your 10 minutes about what you need to move forward and what are the blockades to translating your work to humans. Um, so we're really excited to have you here. We can't wait to get started. I wanna thank Janine and her staff. We could not be here without them. Um, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Shruti. Thanks, Mike. And thank you everyone for joining us, our speakers and our wonderful audience. Just to sort of review our rationale for how we put this workshop together, because it really is bringing together this fantastic group of thought leaders from such a broad background. Um, as Mike mentioned, our goal was really to understand how can we um, move regenerative medicine forward for humans therapeutically. Um, and so we really wanted to bring together folks who think about how tissues are built, how tissues are organized, how tissues are structured, how they develop, and then how we can recreate those original structures um, if they're injured, if they're damaged, if they decline with age. And so that was the rationale for putting the workshop together. And the two days of workshops are organized a little bit different. So the first day is really about how different tissues respond to injury. Uh, for instance, epithelial tissues or internal organs or liver and bone. And then we end with model organisms that are sort of the, the gold standard for regeneration. And uh, what lessons can we learn from those gold standard organizations? And then the second day is broken up into sort of the whole is greater than some of its parts. So what are the moving parts that are involved in regeneration, be it stem cells, be it inflammation, be it fibrosis? How do we mitigate some and pump the others up? And so that's really the, the overview of the workshop. And with that, I'm going to turn it to my colleague, Dr. Kara McKinley um, from the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. So Kara, Perfect. Thank you so much. So we are so excited to have this really fantastic set of speakers here to give you a sense of how the logistics of each sort of session are going to go. It's a 10 minute talk with five minutes of questions for the speaker. And then there'll be a 20 minute discussion amongst the panelists. And so really something that hopefully you've noticed from the way that the 
um, meeting is structured is that it's very discussion oriented rather than about sort of data transfer. And we would love for all of the attendees to really get deeply involved in that discussion. And so if you have questions that are sort of pertinent to the talk you've just seen, please put those in the Q&A box. But please also feel extremely welcome and encouraged to type in the chat ideas and thoughts and particular directions you might like to see. This is one of these uh, great moments in the conference where this is really more of a comment than a question is actually really encouraged. Uh, so please go ahead and put those sorts of um, big ideas, wild ideas, dream thoughts and experiments you have in the chat so that we can have a sort of rich discussion about what we think the limitations are for us moving forward the field of human regeneration. And so with that, I think we can move on to our first session, which is epithelial tissues and will be chaired by Jeroen Fuchs from Technion and Jason Mills from Baylor College of Medicine. All right. Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. I'm excited to co-chair the first session of this really incredible workshop, along with my colleague, Jason Mills. I'm going to be brief and say that we have a terrific lineup of speakers, real visionaries in repair and regeneration, who simply propelled this field forward. So the first session is dedicated to epithelial biology and different tissues. The first two talks are going to focus on the great advances in lung biology and the direction in which the field is moving. And then we'll hear about the exciting progress in intestinal regeneration. So I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Laura Nicholson from Yale University. She's going to talk to us about the attempts to engineer the lung alveolus. So Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Yaron. And it's, it's so wonderful to be part of this session. And I'm just so delighted to be involved in a, in a broad meeting that, that's really focused on regeneration per se and on translating that um, to, to the human and to, to the patient. So um, I am an adjunct professor at Yale, but, but I'll provide a little bit of context and say that I'm actually sitting in the offices of our startup, our startup company, Humicite, which has actually been engineering human replacement arteries for a number of years. And we're in late stage clinical trials with those tissues now. So it's certainly very near and dear to my heart that uh, this, this workshop is focused on translating regeneration uh, into the clinic. So uh, our, our work at Yale has, has focused for more than a decade on uh, the problem of trying to uh, engineer lung replacements. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, that really comes down to an issue of, of engineering alveolar replacements. And alveoli are the delicate air sacs that really mediate gas exchange in the lung. They're in incredibly efficient and uh, are also very stereotypical in their structure. They're about 200 microns in diameter and have a very uh, set uh, panoply of, of cell sources that, that make up the, the, the alveolus. So if we think about the criteria to engineer a replacement lung, um, because the lung is, it has the primary job of doing gas exchange and that requires a large surface area, using a large surface area to repopulate cells onto that surface is really critical. Um, and my laboratory has worked for a number of years on developing uh, acellular matrices from native lungs, which retain much of their alveolar structure and provide that surface area. With the repopulation, then what's important in regenerating alveoli is that uh, the, the air blood uh, barrier is maintained, that the mechanics of the tissue are proper, not, not too stiff and not too emphysematous. And ideally for, for an engineered tissue, the cellular components um, should be autologous. Although in lung regeneration, I think the reality is that these components will probably be allogeneic. So the overall paradigm that we've been working on in my laboratory for more than a decade is to take a native lung and to decellularize it uh, very carefully so, so that we retain you know, the 40 or 50 key matrix elements that are, that are part of that matrix. We then repopulate that matrix with specific cell types and either analyze in vitro or uh, deliver uh, in vivo in, in model organisms. If we think about the challenges that are involved in actually doing human scale uh, lung engineering, it's actually pretty daunting. Um, it, it, one of my fun facts is that the human lung exchanges about five gallons of pure oxygen every hour uh, in a normal human. <clears throat> and this is accomplished by gas exchange through about 200 million alveoli. 
at which sit at the ends of a complex airway tree with 23 generations of branching. Over and overall, if we were to imagine growing 200 micron organoids in six well dishes, for example, then my estimate is that it would require 2 million dishes filled with organoids to generate enough air sacs uh, to, to essentially mimic the, the, the amount of surface area of a human lung. And so the important takeaway uh, from my standpoint is that engineering lung uh, functional organ tissue is, is certainly partly about understanding the, the, the cellular communities and the alveolar structure itself and the cell biology and the communications underlying that. But it's also about physically engineering a structure which is implantable and which has the right surface area. So uh, our group has been working on this, as I mentioned, for a number of years. We reported in Science in 2010 that, that we could take rat lungs, decellularize them, and then repopulate them with allogeneic mixtures of cells. These were, these were epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and, and mesenchyme. And we showed in early experiments that we could translate these, transplant these lungs into the left chest and actually could maintain gas exchange for several hours. And we were able to measure fairly efficient exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide <clears throat> across the barriers in these engineered lungs. And that was, that was the good news. Um, but the bad news was that after a few hours, these lungs invariably failed. And they had two key failure mechanisms. One was intravascular thrombosis. Uh, you can see in the upper left-hand image here that, that the engineered lung is very red and beefy looking, and that's because a lot of the vasculature has clotted. But in addition, uh, the, the, uh, the barrier function or, or the separation between blood and air in the air sacs was also not perfect. And as you can see in the histology in the lower right, um, th there's evidence of bleeding into the airways. So, so clearly these lungs are not suitable for long-term function. So since that time, we've been very interested in trying to understand how we can best engineer the community of cells that makes up the alveolus. And uh, in, in modern lung biology, there, there actually still remains some debate as, as far as the exact identities of the cell types that, that inhabit the alveolus in, in mouse and, and other rodents and then in man. Um, however, th there, is a, there is a general consensus that, that there are several types of epithelial cells, type one and type two cells, um, and as well as several types of mesenchymal cells, and then probably two flavors of microvascular endothelium. But what, what's very interesting about, about lung airways, distal air sacs, is that there are type one al alveolar epithelial cells, which actually are very thin cells, which contribute a lot to the barrier function of the airway, um, but also are actually enormous cells that span across multiple uh, alveoli in some cases, and also are very closely opposed to the microvascular endothelium, which sits on the other side of the basement membrane. So trying to understand how these collections of cells talk to each other and, and how they maintain homeostasis in the, in the native alveolus has been something that my lab has been working on for several years. Um, and one, one of the uh, projects that we undertook a few years ago was to look at the connectomics or to use single cell RNA sequencing to look at how different types of cells communicate with each other in the alveolus across species. Um, and so what you're looking at here is actually the connectomes um, with, with cell types not labeled, but these are the connectomes that we've generated from looking at, at populations of lung cells in mouse, rat, pig, and in human. And if we, uh, if we provide the, um, the labels for some of, these, uh, some of these cell types, what you can see is that actually the, the types of cells and the structure of the communication, which is indicated by the, by the heaviness of the lines here, is actually fairly conserved across species. And we think that's important because by looking at that, um, because alveoli are fairly stereotypical structures, even going from rat to human, uh, the mouse alveolus is probably a little bit fundamentally different from human, but going from rat to human, these alveoli are pretty similar. So understanding the communication patterns, we believe could provide a roadmap for eventually uh, engineering an alveolus uh, from scratch, as you will. So one thing that came out of our analysis is that the type one cell, 
which is the cell that, that uh, modulates a lot of barrier function, but also extends across multiple alveoli in many cases, is also an incredibly important signaling hub. I suppose this shouldn't be surprising given sort of the geometry of the, the alveolus, but we've seen that type one cells talk to themselves, but they also put out very important cytokines and speak to other cell types uh, as part of maintaining the, the, the homeostasis of the alveolus. And this is just some violin plots showing some, some, of the, uh, some of the key factors that are produced by type one cells across different species. Obviously this is, this is too small and it's, it's an eye chart uh, for the audience, but, but I'm, just, I'm just trying to point out that, that key signaling molecules are made at very high levels in type one cells um, and in similar patterns across species. So we've tried to use some of these uh, things that we've learned from, from single cell signaling and combine them with some of our bioengineering approaches to repopulate engineered lungs, not just with one or two cell types, but in fact with three or four cell types. Um, and uh, in addition to trying to, to trying to get the right cellular components repopulated into engineered lungs, we've also been making efforts in, in recent years to provide the correct mechanical stimuli, um, including vascular perfusion and also breathing motions, which are known to be important not only during lung development, but also uh, during to, to stimulate the differentiation of different cell types in the alveolus. And as you can see from these images on the bottom of this slide, when, when we grow engineered lungs from acellular matrices at uh, under ventilated and perfused conditions, that the cellular repopulation is much more efficient. And uh, I'll just finish here, this is my last data slide, um, with a comparison of, of what repopulated lung matrices look like uh, as you improve the, the cell types and numbers and complexity that you're repopulating. So as you can see on the left, if you repopulate a lung matrix just with epithelium, um, it looks kind of like liver um, and, and doesn't take on a, a normal phenotype. But, but as you add endothelial cells and then mesenchyme and then even alveolar macrophages, what you can see is really a dramatic progression in terms of how the cells repopulate that matrix and, and the spontaneous structures that they take on, which become much more reminiscent of native alveoli. So just to finish here, um, and I know I'm a tiny bit over time, um, it, it does appear that, that, there are, that there are single cell sort of connectomic uh, patterns that are visible across, across species. And the, the fact that these signaling uh, patterns are conserved probably means that they're important. And uh, we're going to continue to focus on making sure that we have the correct cell types and also are stimulating the correct cell-cell crosstalk in our efforts to, to engineer alveoli uh, from the ground up. And we hope that in the next one or two decades that that will result in, in, a, in an engineered lung that may actually be functional and useful for patients. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, if anybody has questions, please write it down in the Q&A box. Uh, in the meanwhile, Laura, uh, got this question. Are there neurons in the alveoli? How do they regulate function and response of lungs to different metabolic on hormonal states? Yeah, so there are definitely uh, nerves uh, and innervation in the lung. Uh, at the alveolar level, probably not so much, but there's certainly innervation uh, in the large airways and the medium size of conducting airways, and also probably in the vasculature. Um, the, the, the neural component uh, regulates uh, airway caliber and, and can cause air, airway dilation or constriction under different types of stimuli. Um, but there's not a lot of evidence actually of, of a neural component in the distal air sacs, um, at least not that I'm aware of. All right, uh, so we have another question from uh, Rene Wasco, hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, so fantastic talk. Uh, do you think that the structure of the lung has been maximally optimized by natural evolution? Or do you think it could be possible to completely re-engineer an artificial lung or components of an artificial lung to maximize O2 exchange and vitro production? So forth. That's such a good question. And it's, it's close to my heart as a bioengineer. Um, the, uh, so mammalian lungs are remarkably conserved. There are some lungs uh, in different animals, for example, in some types of birds and in some types of amphibians that are structured fundamentally differently. Um, 
that said, uh, my, my sense is that uh, given, given the amount of oxygen that's required for human-sized mammals, my guess is that we're fairly close to optimized. Uh, there, have been, there have been clinical devices that, that have been developed that are more sort of uh, hollow fiber, parallel flow kinds of devices for, for gas exchange. Um, but because most of those devices have a much more limited surface area, um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get gas exchange as efficient as, as we do with native lungs. So I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think we're probably pretty close to optimal. All right. Uh, another question from uh, Ed Harlow. Are there examples of cell transdifferentiation in the reconstructed lungs, or is the new construction off from seeding of different cell types? Uh, also a great question. Um, in our hands, yes, there's clearly uh, examples of epithelial transdifferentiation. Um, some of this is unpublished, some of it's published, but, but clearly, you know, we've shown that, that when we seed type 2 cells, which are the native progenitor cell for the alveolus, into some of these constructs, depending on the conditions, uh, we get clear differentiation to type 1 phenotypes. There is emerging literature now that type 1 cells can back differentiate to type 2 cells. In my hands, we haven't seen that yet. But we have seen uh, more proximal epithelial cells, basal-like cells, which when they are seeded into the distal lung, do not really become type 1 or type 2 cells. I won't say that, but they certainly take on some markers of those cells. And there's at least a partial transdifferentiation, which I think is driven by, by the identity of the distal matrix. Okay, and we have time for just more, one more question. Uh, so Rahul Gupta says, great talk. Uh, by any chance, did you look back to find any reason for abnormal coagulation of the engineered lungs, which was made initially? Yeah, so that was really a, a partial failure on our part. So we didn't really have complete uh, endothelialization of the microvasculature, which is actually a whole difficult engineering problem in and of itself. So we know we didn't have enough endothelial cells in the vasculature. And without endothelial coverage, there's, there's bare exposed collagen to the bloodstream, which we know activates platelets. And we think that's probably what drove the coagulation. All right, Laura, thank you so, so much. Outstanding. We're right on time. And our, our next speaker is Dr. Carla Kim from um, Harvard uh, Medical School. And she's going to continue along the same uh, theme, broad theme of, uh, of looking at the lung. So uh, uh, Dr. Kim. Excellent. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. All right, I want to uh, thank Iran and Jason for leading this and for this invitation to participate today. Uh, so my lab, uh, located at Boston Children's Hospital Stem Cell Program, uh, we have taken the approach of trying to use stem cell biology to better understand the normal lung and lung diseases. And here I've listed many of the most common lung diseases most of us are well too aware of these days. And I would like to highlight that some of the major features are that there is either an abrogation in the number or the function of the epithelial cells that either line the airways or those that make up the alveolar space. And uh, certainly you can appreciate that here on the right in this image from a patient with emphysema compared to normal lung on the left. Now, uh, lung diseases are certainly very complex. And the biology of the lung as we know it uh, is certainly also has that complexity with a large number of different epithelial cell types. Uh, as depicted here in this slide, we know there are three major niches or microenvironments where different types of epithelial cells reside. And those major areas are the trachea, the bronchioles and the alveolar space. And you can see in this illustration from the mouse lung, uh, that the cells in each of these regions have very distinct morphologies. And of course they have important uh, functions every moment that we breathe. And they also each contain their own set of stem and progenitor cells. Now these cells intimately associate with uh, mesenchymal cells that are very diverse and are still being defined along with of course immune cells and endothelial cells that all come in a, a number of different flavors that are being further defined every day with new single cell RNA-seq. And I'd just like to highlight that so much of what we know about this cell-cell interactions and the images in these pictures 
is about the mouse lung. So we still have a lot of biology that really needs to be learned about the human lung. Uh, in this slide, I'm just depicting for you uh, a number of different cells that have been reported to have stem cell activity within each of these different um, niches. Uh, basal cells that sit along the basement membrane of the trachea are one of the most well-defined stem cells within the pulmonary system. We also know that there are a variety of different cells in the distal lung that have progenitor cell activity. And just honing in on that region, which our lab uh, spends most of our time thinking about, we know that there are multipotent cells uh, that can give rise to both airway and alveolar cells. We know that the club cells, which line the, the bronchioles, can self-renew and give rise to ciliated cells. And AT2 cells uh, can give rise to more of themselves in type 1. However, as the years have gone by, uh, subsets of AT2 cells have been identified that can act as stem cells. And every single cell type pictured here, perhaps with the exception of ciliated cells, has been shown to have some kind of uh, progenitor or cell or proliferative activity in response to different forms of lung injury. So we think that one uh, important goal is to identify the molecules that control the proliferative capacity of these different lung progenitors and see how it controls their specific responses depending on the injury context. So with that in mind, uh, tools that my lab has been building uh, and using our organoid um, co-culture systems and you can see images of some of these organoid cultures on the right, which we've published. Uh, and we've been developing an assay to be able to transplant uh, lung progenitor cells derived from these organoid cultures so that we can test the function of these cells and help contribute to potential cell-based therapy in the future. So in these few slides, I'll show you how we've taken DS-RED uh, cells, cells from DS-RED mice, sorted our favorite populations by facts, and put them in these co-culture uh, organoid cultures. We then used single cell suspensions of these cells and delivered them into mice that received a bleomyosin injury the day before. Uh, and this is an injury that's known to damage the alveolar space. We can then interrogate the cells in those recipient mice by fax or by immunofluorescence. And what we have been very happy to see, for example, when we transplant alveolar organoid cells from mouse into a recipient mouse, we can detect those cells by fax. And here you can appreciate that we see very nice DS red positive cells that are also positive in green for SPC, which is an alveolar type two cell marker. We can also see resident AT2 cells here that are green, but not red. Uh, and this shows us that the transplanted cells indeed can uh, express proteins that uh, just as their normal uh, uh, recipient mouse endogenous counterparts, and they look like they're distributed appropriately. However, one thing we don't see uh, is the formation of the very important alveolar type one cells, as you heard about from Laura. Even though we know that our organoid cultures produce AT1 cells, we do not see these in our transplanted recipient mice. And uh, differentiation of AT2 cells to AT1 within human cultures has also been a barrier in the lung field and will certainly be an important um, area to advance. One thing that we have observed with single cell RNA-seq is that by isolating the transplanted cells, their native counterparts and organoid cells, we can see very nice overlap of the transplanted AT2 and the native AT2 cells. We can also appreciate though that our alveolar organoid cells are distinct, even though they retain an alveolar features uh, predominantly, they're still different from the cells that are residing in the lung. And we're really interested to uncover those differences further. We're working on showing that those transplanted cells can be functional. And we're also working with many different groups, including uh, investigators that I'm collaborating with in the breath foundation sponsored by the Dutch Lung Foundation. Uh, and here, many of these investigators have developed ways to culture human lung uh, cells in different organoid cultures. And just to highlight some of the things that we think are very important as a group in thinking about, as we think about what is really needed to push this field forward, we've been asking, can we indeed engraft human cells in the mouse lung? 
uh, we need to really establish whether human cells can be successfully engrafted as functional cells in other animal models other than mouse. We need better readouts for cell delivery and engraftment, especially of human cells. Uh, we need to be able to do physiology in live animals. Many of the uh, measurements of lung function uh, are done as terminal experiments in mice. So we, we would like to see that to be improved. Uh, it could be useful to develop human reporter cells so that we can detect uh, those transplanted cells. And certainly uh, further development and engineering of mice to be even more humanized, of course, perhaps immunocompetent, uh, but to also have those other stromal cell components that are so important would be a great advance. Uh, we've also been thinking about how to improve our proof of principle experiments. Can we deliver mouse organoid cells into mouse models of relevant lung diseases? Uh, we're working and asking, can we actually show that alveolar cells have a beneficial effect in an animal that represents, that truly represents a disease model? Uh, and these are, would be very important, um, uh, I think a good basis for going forward and learning how to then manipulate that disease condition. We're also working uh, within the team to understand uh, bioengineering approaches like you heard about from Laura. We'd like to know, can small molecules or other uh, means of delivering cells, can that enhance transplantation? We need to consider uh, if it will be an allogeneic strategy how does the immune system uh, come into play and how can we manipulate that to make transplantation more successful? We also want to think about how is the microenvironment distinct in each disease setting and how will that be a challenge uh, for cell-based therapy and, and just for basic understanding of lung diseases. And finally, uh, working with uh, understanding the extracellular matrix and other components and how we can use those to enhance engraftment will also be a priority for our field. So I hope that today uh, I've shown you a few examples of the approaches that, that we are taking and some of the important questions in the field. And I just wanna thank my lab members who have contributed to this work. Uh, and I look forward to interacting more with all of you. Thanks very much, Carla, for the, this uh, stimulating talk. And uh, we're open for, for Q&A now from the audience. Um, you know, we're following on the, the lung theme. And, and I think so far we're, we're seeing that maybe there is some hope uh, for at least epithelial-based uh, ba uh, tissues for regeneration. We have a question from Ellen Baez-Vasquez. Awesome talk. Thank you. Could tissue-resident immune cells be playing a key role in the maintenance of the in vivo lung since immune cells have been known to have many functions aside from canonical immune-related functions? Has anyone tried including healthy tissue resident like immune cells in the development of these organoids? And do you think such an inclusion would enhance transplantation? Yes, uh, thank you for that very nice question. Uh, so indeed, uh, the immune cells are a very important component to consider. Uh, several groups, uh, namely one example I can think of is Jason Rock's lab has shown that macrophages are very critical in supporting alveolar regeneration in a pneumonectomy model. And his group has shown that macrophages can support alveolar epithelial cells growing in an organoid system. So indeed they can, even if you will, replace uh, some of the other types of stromal cells that some of us use in our co-cultures. Uh, we haven't explored that uh, yet in the transplantation system, but I think that is a really important direction to go and learn more about. One thing that we have seen in our transplant recipients is that even though we don't get type one cells coming from our transplanted cells, we have seen uh, in very uh, you know, early studies that there is less, there's less of a symptoms of fibrosis in our recipient mice that did receive cells. And so we don't know yet if that's because the alveolar cells that successfully were delivered are signaling to their resident neighbors, or could we also be impacting the immune system in some way? So I think that will be a lot of fun to explore more. We have another question in the Q&A from Ulysses uh, Santa Maria. Why does it seem like the lung has so many stem cell types? This is much different from blood or brain tissue where a single stem cell type leads to a wide array of differentiation and specialized cells. So a question about trans differentiation and plasticity. Absolutely. 
so we like to perhaps in the lung field, we might think of things as being complicated, but I feel as we dive deeper into any of our favorite tissues, that there are many examples of multiple types of progenitor cells that have specific, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, programmed ability to only give rise to certain cell types. I think there are even examples of that in the blood. Uh, but why is it so complicated in the lung? I think Again, it goes back to that, those very important niches. We know that uh, the niche can actually be very instructive of what type of epithelial cells uh, can grow. I think it can also direct the behavior of the stem cells from different regions. So some of the parallels of what we see about adult lung stem cells is parallels what happens during lung development to allow those different areas to form. What I think will be interesting is to see, again, as Laura mentioned uh, and came up in, in Ed Harlow's question, what is the degree of trans differentiation, if you will, or ability to switch between lineages? Uh, I think it's very important to keep in mind that there are disease states such as pulmonary fibrosis, where cells have been observed to, uh, per, for example, have features of both a basal cell and an alveolar cell, which typically don't exist together. So we know that happens in disease states. We don't know what it exactly means yet. Uh, and I think being able to explore that plasticity will be really important. We have, uh, I think we'll make this the final question from Dr. Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz. Which of the lung epithel epithelial cells are involved in secretion of mucins? And does this play a role in the lung regeneration repair? Thank you. So uh, from my knowledge, most of the mucins are largely uh, produced by airway secretory cells. Uh, there are certain mucins that are mutated in lung diseases, and, and that's become a, a feature of many investigations. But I think that uh, it's even being discovered that perhaps some alveolar cells uh, can also uh, produce those mucins, but that's, I believe, on the horizon. Uh, and to what degree those mucins play a role in, in repair, I think that uh, still... I don't know that literature as well, uh, but I think there's still really very largely unexplored. And I think another important thing to understand will be how, how do the different airway cell types, even those that are not proliferative, how do they signal to those secretory cells? So all still open questions. Thanks, I think we're perfectly on time and I'll turn it back over to Yaron. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Carla, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Thaddeus Steppenbeck from Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He's gonna talk about the intestinal epithelium as a regenerative repair system poised to take off. Thad, we're really excited to hear your talk. Great, uh, thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, and, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to represent this, uh, I think, amazing field of intestinal epithelial biology. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, I'm going to basically um, talk to the first six or six or so slides are going to be on why I think um, the intestinal epithelium is uh, a great system. And then I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, interesting challenges moving forward. And my slides are not moving forward. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so why is why is the intestinal epithelium an attractive uh, developmental system to think about uh, to think about repairing regeneration? So as um, as was first really noted uh, by Lieberkuhn in the fifties uh, with the uh, advent of uh, microscopes, which he helped to uh, invent, as he noted these these frequent invaginations that, that lined the uh, the gut and were named after him. Um, since this time. Uh, Cell biologists have been particularly fascinated by these epithelial cells that line these structures. Um, and over the last 50 years, many work of many labs, we've come to understand the, that, um, that there are a population of stemic progenitor cells that are at the base of these, uh, of these crypts. So this is where proliferation takes place. Stem cells are located more or less at the base and then the, the committed daughters or progenitors are more in the central portion here. Um, what I think is, is particularly interesting here is that there's this defined um, upward and outward movement of cells here. So as cells differentiate, uh, they, they move, most of the cells move up and out of these uh, particular structures. There's a particular hierarchy of lineage differentiation, of multiple lineage differentiation that occurs. 
And then the stem cells actually are quite interesting as well. We talk, heard in the last talk about multiple stem cells being present. Even with such a simple structure, there are really multiple uh, stem cells that are recognized to be present within the structure, uh, more quiescent like stem cells and more active uh, uh, stem cells at the, at the very base. Again, with, with the important point to, to emphasize here is that there's perpetual replacement regeneration here. So you can think of this almost as a, something that's in motion throughout your entire life. The, um, the other thing that's an attractive part of the, this system is that there's a lot of these crypts that are present within the intestine. So if you think of uh, a crypt as like an egg and then fitting into an egg carton, which would be the wall of the gut, you literally have 25 million or, or approximately 25 million of these structures in an adult human and about 750,000 of these in an adult mouse. There is some region to region variation that occurs, but the, but the basic structure and basic function uh, holds true throughout the length of the intestine. And this, I think, makes this a great system when you think of the sheer number of, of, of repeating structures that are present in this organ. Not only epithelial biologists are interested in this, but, there, but there's also a lot, of very a lot of interest in other fields as well. So stromal cell biologists are very interested in uh, like things like myofibroblasts, capillaries, and, and even innervation of these crypts uh, that can control uh, function here. Immunologists have gotten on board looking at, at how uh, immune cells interact, particularly with stem cells at the base of the crypt. And even uh, those people interested in the microbiome are interested in microbial products and microbes themselves that can influence uh, intestinal epithelial biology. So what we have here is we have like really a tripart system where you have the intestinal epithelium interacting with a variety of mobilizable uh, uh, immune cells that can interact with various, uh, various cells, both stem and progenitor cells. Um, and then various uh, 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 components of the microbiome or symbionts uh, that, that interact both directly with the epithelium and with this uh, niche. And this then, uh, this then can control the, the overall proliferative response of these particular cells and, 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 turn, and change turnover from very slow to very fast, depending on, on circumstances. This is also a repair system. Um, so um, you, can also, you can actually very seriously injure parts of the intestine and wipe out areas of crypts. And then these crypts can then uh, repair themselves, actually without fibrosis, which is interesting. And uh, this can be demonstrated in experimental systems, such as a, an, an endoscopic system for mice, which you can then use, uh, you can make small one millimeter punch biopsies, and then watch them repair over, uh, over a few weeks. And what, um, to kind of summarize a lot of work here, uh, the, the basic punchline is, is, is to actually repair these structures and get new crypts. You get these channels uh, that, that, that form from uh, crypts that are immediately adjacent to these areas of injury. Uh, and then these, these subdivide out to form new crypts. And this is shown by doing uh, classic lineage tracing experiments where you can label crypts pre-injury, then injure, and then show that the, the new, these channels then um, come from uh, uh, pre-labeled crypts that are present. The third part of this that makes this really exciting is, 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 is a tremendous advance in cellular platforms to model this. So the organoid system was uh, by Hans Cleavers was really first described in the small intestine, uh, which is picture is shown here. This is now, there is now uh, dozens of other systems that have taken uh, offshoot from this particular, uh, this particular uh, seminal uh, observation. Uh, we can now skew these organoids to specific uh, lineages. We can develop steroids that are, that are enriched for stem cells. There are various two-dimensional cellular platforms now where you can look, uh, have both apical and basal lateral access. And then this has been fantastic for developing flow systems and then looking for co-culture with, with various microbes and immune cells on, on the apical or basal lateral surfaces. And again, being able to ask questions in vitro now where you can think about microbial components and immune components that are driving uh, uh, biology that you can see in vivo. And this also has opened up human, which has been a phenomenal system. So I'll mention uh, just a few uh, challenges that I see going forward in this system as it's, as it's taken off. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, these aren't all inclusive, but just a few things are in front of my mind. The first is that there's really, because this has been successful, there's been an explosion in the number of papers that actually use uh, uh, systems of, of gut injury and repair and, uh, and intestinal epithelial organoids. Uh, the number of papers now per year is going to very much is will be in the thousands very soon, um, and it's impossible to read all of these papers. So I think we're going to have to have ways of of, of kind of, of of incorporating what's going on across literally hundreds, if not thousands, of papers to be able to try and understand at a deep level uh, uh, the biology that's actually happening. Second challenge uh, is that is what we'd like to be able to do is be able to interrogate these epithelial cultures. Uh, at, at much higher uh, uh, throughput type of screen. 
Um, they've been great for low throughput and medium uh, throughput screens. My, my lab and many other labs have, have done this. This is just an example of one of the screens that, that, that we've actually done, looking for bacterial metabolites that could, that could affect epithelial proliferation. This is great for, for again, for if you're looking in terms of hundreds of, of, of components, but if you get into thousands or tens of thousands, it's very difficult and something that we need to address. And human cells actually are, are quite challenging here. A few labs have really nicely shown uh, success in, in doing CRISPR uh, manipulation of, of primary human epithelial stem cells, but this is something that has not become robust and, and widespread yet. And there are a number of challenges here, I think, that, that, that would be great if we could overcome and then make this widespread within the field. The third challenge I, I, is, is in vivo visualization of turnover. So you have this, this birth to migration and death that happens within, within this particular system. And we're really great at taking static images of this um, and, and interpreting, trying to interpret them. But what we'd like to see is we'd like to see this in real time using things like uh, two photon uh, and trying to solve some of some, some real challenges with, with being able to visualize the intestine, particularly over a long period of time. And then even taking a, a process like cell death uh, which there are many flavors that can occur within the intestine. All of these, uh, all of these have been shown to actually occur. It, we, what would be great is to actually be able to visualize them all of them at once and know the relative contributions of them uh, and to be able to study them in more detail. So again, being able to go from just static images of, of biology to something that's more vibrant and vivo, I think would be, uh, would be really spectacular. The fourth is that we'd like to be able to use uh, the, the human as now more of an experimental system. So we have these really nice epithelial systems that we can set up in, in, in culture. And this has been, I think this is gonna really, uh, uh, really give us some real deep insight into what's going on in a number of diseases. But we'd like to be able to go in and be able to, 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 to sample and, and uh, kind of look at how the epithelium is functioning within, within the human. Um, we have the ability now to look through the entire gastrointestinal system. Uh, gastroenterologists have developed these double balloon systems where they can now visualize uh, the entire length of the small intestine, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and now uh, what's, what's coming on, on board now are these, uh, these very sophisticated capsules that you can swallow, that you can visualize now, and even, and even uh, sense various things that are happening in specific regions of the intestine. So what I'm dreaming of down the, down the, down the road is that we can take these capsules do um, more sophisticated, make them a more sophisticated kind of tool where we can go in and basically sample stem cells in very specific areas of disease and get an idea of what's actually happening with these cells. And the fifth challenge is, uh, is, is more conceptual. Uh, with, with various inflammatory diseases that we see in the intestine, where I've, I'm, my lab and many others are very interested in how inflammation actually affects uh, differentiated cells and stem cells over time. And What's the, I'm just showing uh, one piece of data from a, a, a paper that we have uh, in submission where uh, we're very interested in, uh, in, in these, these, um, these kind of flattened epithelial cells that migrate over areas of damage. Um, what we've described here and found that this is a form of adaptive differentiation. And this adaptive differentiation is really required then for the, for the, for the system to actually repair itself. So we're very interested in this. As, and, and we're also very interested in what's actually going on in stem cells in these particular so with that, I'll just say thanks to everyone in the field uh, for, for this growing field, which I think is uh, pretty amazing. It's multidisciplinary and, and always very uh, uh, exciting. Thanks to my lab members past and present, and I can take some questions. Okay, so I'll start. So meanwhile, while we're getting other questions. So I wanted to ask you specifically regarding uh, control of different stem cell populations within the crypt, whether we're talking about plus four populations or LGR in the base of the crypt. Um, I'm wondering what you think about the regulation from both the epithelial side, as well as more the mesenchymal side, telocytes, uh, specialized fibroblasts, and so on. So if you could elaborate on that. Sure, yeah, we, we've learned a lot about, about how, specific, how there are, homeostasis, we've learned that there are specific um, fibroblast-like populations that, that definitely seem to be really part of, uh, really part of the, uh, the mesenchymal niche. And they, they produce factors that are absolutely critical to maintain uh, intestinal epithelial stem cells. And so I, I, you know, th this, I think, is a, is a really, um, again, another one of these seminal observations uh, in the field. And I think what, what, um, what we're interested in going forward is, is moving from homeostasis to injury. How then does this how then does the plasticity of the niche, how does it impact 
uh, what happens during injury and the decisions that, that stem cells actually make during injury. Um, what's interesting is it looks like stem cells can actually almost completely stop dividing during injury, essentially as a protective mechanism. And then when the damage is passed, they can, they can expand greatly uh, uh, and, and, and then repair the damage. So trying to understand how you go from this kind of, hypo, uh, kind of hypoplastic state that's a, a protective uh, response then to this regenerative uh, hyperproliferative state, uh, which is trying to repair, I think is something uh, that we're very interested in. We and others are very interested in. And then how this relates to all these things. Okay. So we have a question from uh, Judith Bergman. Uh, can you please tell us about panacell differentiation? What are the different stem cell and progenitor cells? Uh, yeah, so in the small intestine, um, in the small intestine and homeostasis, you, you have a, a really interesting lineage called panda cells that, that doesn't migrate up and out of the crypts. In the small intestine, it's the one that actually stays behind uh, in, this, in the stem cell niche. And it really, it really, um, it really uh, is really, uh, really part of, again, part of the niche with the, with the, uh, with the epithelial stem cells. So another uh, a cell type that pr produces critical factors. Um, there are a wide variety of factors that, that are play a role in panda cell differentiation. I don't want to go into all of them now, but um, but it's uh, but but that process I think is, is very important uh, then for to maintain uh, to maintain uh, the, the structure at the base of the crib. One thing that's been very interesting it's been very difficult to culture panda cells in vitro uh, for reasons that aren't clear. So you grow these flat two-dimensional cultures and you don't get panda cells very well. And I think it, it, potentially it's because of the curvature at the base of the crypt, or there's other factors that we don't know uh, that, that play a role in panda cell differentiation. Uh, things like FGF seem to play a role, uh, but there's still a lot more work to do. Okay, uh, quite a lot of questions. Okay, so uh, from uh, Jennifer Lipping and Schwartz, uh, what role do neuronal cells play in the control of intestinal repair, uh, including sensins and response? Yeah, so we're we're just I think we're just getting to to this uh, 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 now, um, and so we've we've recognized uh, that that there's been innovation really for the last few decades. The types of cell cell types that are actually innervated seem to be everything from stem cells to intraendocrine cells. Um, I think that this is more of an interplay of basically motility of the intestine uh, and controlling this with what's going on with absorption. Um, but, but I think that the role, there, there's been, uh, there's older literature to suggest that neurons actually play a role in repair. And I think this is still a rich area to try and, and understand. We don't understand the details yet. Uh, I think we have time maybe for just one more uh, from Qutin Yang. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Regarding uh, of or organ repairment, what would be the more realistic way of repairment, regeneration? Oh, that's on me. Sorry, the question. So, um, I'll ask just one one last one uh, from Prayag Murwala. Excellent talk. Although you mentioned myofibroblasts in the intestine, why do they do not scar? Yeah, so that's a great. That, so this is so this is a great question. So so with repetitive injury, you get you get scarring. So if you have repetitive damage to the mucosa, you will start to see fibrosis. But what's very interesting is you can you can have a one off injury uh, and and no fibrosis. So I think this is I think the the system is very well set up to not scar with one with a single injury. But as soon as you start having repetitive injury, then you can start seeing uh, even local scarring within the mucosa. Okay, Thad, thank you so so much. Uh, I'm gonna hand things off to Jason, and he's gonna start our discussion uh, with Laura, Carla, and Thad. So fantastic session, everybody. And now uh, the really fun part, which is the 20 minutes of, of panel discussion. And, and uh, um, I think uh, we already have some, some questions from, from panelists uh, to other panelists. So um, we, can, we can touch there. But I think you know, there are a couple of themes that emerge. Um, one is that there's a lot of plasticity and a lot of potential for repair. I mean, I, I don't think any of uh, uh, the talks here were at all unoptimistic about humans' ability to to repair epithelial organs, and you know I think we should probably uh, touch on that, and also on how um, we manage to uh, how we can use mouse systems to better understand human systems. You know, we that we we touched on that a lot, but we should probably expand on that. You know, can we put human organoids in mice and uh, and learn more about how to regenerate human um, epithelial-based tissues um, that way. And then I think uh, one thing that we probably should talk about at some point is, 
you know, whether, especially in the intestines, we have an option in the GI tract of, of going from adult sources of cells and using plasticity and expanding, expanding them um, as sources for repair. Um, but, but also we have the option of differentiating from um, induced pluripotent stem cells and coming the other way from sort of a juvenile uh, state. So I think these are all sort of themes that, that come up um, again. Uh, and I think uh, maybe uh, uh, since uh, in, the, in the panelist chat, uh, uh, Carl had a question for you, Thad, about, um, about intestinal stem cell transplants into, into mice uh, from humans, you know, what, what your thoughts are on how we get uh, human, model humans in mice. Yeah, so this is something that's definitely been done. So you can you can you can abrade the, the intestinal epithelium in the colon, and and uh, it's been uh, Toshi Sato shown that you can get you can actually just essentially enemize with intestinal epithelial stem cells from humans and get them to engraft. So there are systems um, you know where you can focally do this. We don't have the ability, I think, though, to to nicely coat. Uh, the entire gut um, yet with, with what it would be a humanized uh, uh, intestinal epithelium. So I think that that's something that's something that I think is a little ways uh, ways off. But you can model it focally uh, um, within the intestine, but it's an injury system. That's the that's the that's the one caveat. Um, well, the, part of the reason I asked the question too, right, is that you know with the, coming from the embryonic standpoint and differentiating in uh, in vitro if you inject those organoids from IPSCs into kidney capsules of say nude mice, then you get a lot better differentiation, right? So there, there's definitely uh, uh, the ability for mice to instruct. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah, but the, the, for sure that that's the case. That's been nicely demonstrated. But the challenge with IPSCs and, and fetal, uh, fetal cells is that, is that to use them, they, they have to go through this, essentially have to go through development. And so I think that this is this is this is somewhat of a challenge. So Mike Helmrath has done some, I think, really groundbreaking work trying to actually um, doing what what uh, you know what Carlo is actually trying to describe, which is growing lungs ex vivo or, or that type of method, but trying to actually grow scaffolds and, and things like that for the gut, uh, and then and then populating them with uh, with epithelial stem cells. Uh, you, it's very hard to get the gut to actually lengthen uh, in vivo. And so, so for people that have short gut syndrome, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's gonna be a transplant situation. And so there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of desire to create these systems where you can create uh, gut on ex vivo that you can, that you can transplant because um, allogeneous transplants are so challenging. Um, so, this is, so this I think is, uh, this I think is gonna be a really interesting area of uh, an investigation. And sort of following up on the theme of having to injure first, and this is open to everybody, um, you know, Carla and, and Laura as well. Ellie uh, Tanaka, Dr. Tanaka here is in the in the chat, asked us to talk about whether you need always to injure or de-epithelialize, um, de -epithelialize, whether with, you know, uh, humans and mice or mouse on mouse. Uh, yeah, this is Carla. I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, we, in our lab, we've tried uh, delivering into mice that did not have any injury and we don't see any retention of cells. We also tried an airway injury called naphthalene and we don't see any retention there, but other groups have used naphthalene plus irradiation. So there's a certain you know, combination or type of injuries does seem to be required. Uh, one thing that we've seen that I didn't show you is if we deliver uh, multipotent cells into the same injury model I showed you, we get some cells that incorporate into the airways and look like they're basically normal airway cells. But we also see uh, patches of cells in the alveolar space that look more hyperplastic. And these patches contain cells that seem to be in transitional cell states. And these are interestingly states that others have observed. So it does seem that cells delivered into the injured lung know that they need to go to a certain location. I think Hal Chapman's lab has seen evidence for that, that when you get proper differentiation of the cell type you think you want, that, it's, that it is uh, because of hypoxic signals, for example. So there are definitely, it definitely shows that, that epithelial cells are somehow receiving a signal of where they should go. 
but there are also some mixed up signals that an injured lung has that, that we need to understand better how to manipulate that scenario. I mean, would you that helps. In, in situ, in a, in a lung, not where you're transplanting, that in, in order to get repair at all, you need some kind of injury. I mean, all this plasticity is always, I think, almost always at least induced by some kind of injury. And, and we had a, you know, we all had met uh, beforehand a couple of days ago and had an interesting discussion about this. Uh, and I, I was surprised to learn from uh, Laura's comment that there's tremendous amount of capability of the lung, almost like a liver to, to rebuild whole structures. But of course, it's after injury, like massive injury, like flu. So, you know, injury seems to be um, a, a constant theme, right? I mean, that's what's inducing the plasticity. That's what's inducing the cells to be instruct, uh, receptive to instruction. Yeah, and I think that, you know, our, our work and the work of other laboratories looking at cell-cell signaling and how communities of cells interact, you know, I think we're going to find that there are quiescent signals there, you know, active quiescent signals that are part of maintaining the homeostasis of any collection of cells, whether it's in the crypt or in the alveolus or wherever. And my guess is that when you when you take away an important quiescence inducing cell source like type two epithelial cells, for example, in the lung, you're probably going to be removing some of those repressive quiescent signals and then allowing <clears throat> resident stem cells to sort of take over. Um, so I think that's part of the balance. Um, one of the one of the things that that I've the way I've been thinking about our engineered systems for a very long time, both for vascular engineering and for lung engineering, is that we have essentially the we're we're creating essentially the world's worst injury model, where we have in this in the setting of lung in, in the setting of lung regeneration, we have a denuded scaffold that that really looks as if it had the world's worst case of of influenza um, attack it, and so. How we how we reintroduce cells into that system and the other cytokines that we provide, you know, is is we're hoping using native tissues as a roadmap, um, we're hoping to be able to identify the key factors that really coax cells to repopulate that scaffold and then execute on those already existing programs that are already there to to, to battle uh, lung injury. Yeah, I mean that, that's actually that was a kind of I, that was a remarkable statement you had there that that uh, that totally turns the Waddington landscape of hierarchy where the marbles roll down and then just stay there because they've kind of cell intrinsically reached a differentiation state. If you think that you know you need an active signal for them to stay at the bottom of the you know hill to be to stay AT1 cells and AT2 cells, uh, that's pretty remarkable. And then even just the very fact that you remove the cells. Um, from the lung in the first place then becomes an automatic plasticity inducer. In other words, you know, the cells change by the very fact that you're harvesting them to, to transplant. We're getting a I think that's probably true. fantastic questions in the, uh, in the chat box here. Um, a lot of them have to do with the fact that you'd, you'd almost have to have an injury, right, to, to be able to increase basement membrane and other interactions to, you know, to seed cells um, from one um, place to another. But I, I think uh, in some ways we've already, um, sh we've already are talking about the very fact that harvesting cells in the first place is an, is an injury and you know is stimulating them. Well, one thing we talk about in our lab is the fact that organoid cultures or whatever culture we all develop of our favorite cells in many ways, at least in the lung, uh, we think that most of the cells are, are, more, are quiescent unless something is damaging them, at least for mouse. We don't know so much about human. We're all interacting with the environment so much more. So we might also think our organoid cultures are actually closer to a model of injury than the quiescent state at all. Right. Clearly in, in our stomach ones that we do all the time, they're, they're not normal. They're injured. They're constantly, that's why they're dividing all the time. They, they think they're trying to repair something. So that was the first microarray that was done where they realized that cultured cells had an, had an injured uh, response. So yeah, so that's for sure. Yeah, I think, and I think that's held true as we've gone to primary cell systems yeah. across the board. Yeah, I like we actually uh, direct organoids into specific sites of injury, for example, in the lung. 
Well, I think we could explore different means of delivery. We've been putting cells intratracheal, but there are certainly uh, techniques that could be developed to inject only in the alveolar space. Uh, you know, where do you need to go? Uh, that could, there's so many things that one could play with there. I think also something Thad said earlier uh, about can you make a nice monolayer or coat the whole epithelial surface? I think it's also important to think about for a lot of lung diseases, we don't know how many cells would be needed, which is the right cell that's needed. If you think about cystic fibrosis, actually, there's been amazing developments in therapeutics. And a lot of that was because more channel activity to help that lung be functional. So if we could narrow down, you know, we don't necessarily need lung depending on the disease state. Uh, maybe what are the number of cells that will be sufficient uh, and what type should they be? I think those are important questions. I want to, I want to throw like one of the big questions in the field. So if we look at humans, right, we have fairly limited regenerative capacity. And mostly it's wound healing, wound repair, where we actually have formation of a scar. And I'm wondering, you know, your thoughts on one, why do we have that mechanism, right, of wound healing and why don't we have regeneration or it's very limited? And what do you think we could do in order to actually change the fate of an injury from repair over to regeneration? So I, I would argue in the intestine, we actually have a pretty good, and, and the gastrointestinal system, we have a pretty good uh, uh, ability to repair. We can have pretty severe injuries that uh, that, that can repair over time. So I, I think I think it's, it's essentially you're tapping into uh, a fundamental property of the organ where you have this constant ability to regenerate, um, and and which I think which I think is key. Obviously, there, there's a size of injury which you can't um, send stem cells across and and then basically repair. Much as the skin, you can have. Uh, you can have uh, wounds that are that are too large to be able to uh, to repair, but I think I think I think that that's really that's really what we're we're talking about is the size of the actual injury uh, in the intestine, and then your ability then to to manage the repair process. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because in the skin, actually, from very large wounds, you can actually have regeneration of either hair follicles or sebaceous glands. So, if it's in a relatively minor wound up to about a one centimeter square excision. We don't see that, but larger than that, you start seeing hair follicles and sebaceous now being regenerated. So it's really interesting size-wise. Do you think that in the intestine, it's dependent on activation of stem cells uh, within the crypt, or you think it's... Yeah, the first, thing, the first thing you have to do in the intestine is you have to cover the wound. So there, I, I, that was my last slide. There are these wound uh, uh, repair cells. They're differentiated cells. They're a modified differentiated cell. They have to cover the area of injury first. So you don't do anything with stem cells in the gut until until the wound is really sealed, and then you're in a position to, to expand stem cells and then try and form these structures then that can go in and, and, and re-engineer your cribs. But, but we don't know we don't know I think the, the limits on on these wound channels like how how far they can actually extend uh, and what's the largest size wound that we could actually get to to create new cribs within that structure. But new cribs come from from old cribs. Um, it's a a lot of questions in the chat sort of over over time about the, the idea of stem cells and whether stem cells can be exhausted or uh, uh, or how they avoid senescence. But I, I kind of wanted to touch on a bigger, even bigger point of view. And of course, I kind of seeded the, this uh, when I was talking about all the plasticity and the very fact that, uh, you know, or Laura's point that uh, maybe you need constant signals to have differentiated cells and, and quiescent cells. You know, is the whole hierarchical stem cell model holding us back? Um, I mean, it works pretty well in homeostasis in the intestines um, for sure, but you know, in the lung, does it even make sense? Do we, we keep trying to force things into a stem cell model, you know? And, and I, I've done a lot of historical looking at where this idea that uh, stem cells are the end all and be all of how um, uh, tissue repairs, and it's relatively new. I mean, it only kind of came around in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And before that, everybody thought, you know, organs were plastic, and and most cells could do most things. Uh, you know, what what are, what does everybody think about that? You know, how is is the stem cell that traditional Waddington stem cell model holding us back? Well, I think it it uh, a lot of it does. I agree with you, Jason, and I think a lot of this comes initially from 
from hematopoiesis and, and, uh, and the bone marrow literature, which obviously is the most mature literature. And there, I, I do believe that the Waddington model and, and the more sort of linear development of cellular differentiation probably applies. Um, but, you know, I, I think the lung is, is perhaps on the opposite end of that spectrum um, because there are so many different cell types and because there are varying needs for regeneration. Sometimes, sometimes there's a need for proximal airway regeneration due to mechanical injury or, or, or bacterial infection. And sometimes there's need for distal regeneration and that's a completely different tissue and a completely different process. So, so the concept that, that you would have one single progenitor which would then divide in an asymmetric fashion and give you X and Y, I do think is too limiting for, for complex organs like the lung. And I, I, I think it has held back, I think. It's sort of been engrafted from the hematopoietic stem cell and the bone marrow literature, which where it works very nicely. And even actually epigenomically, you can see that the switches there are much more dramatic than they are in other tissues where it seems as though things are, are quite plastic. And, and I'll make another point historically, but also sort of an Evo Devo point that, you know, if you look at the earliest multicellular metazoans, I mean, it's not as though they uh, spent a lot of time having uh, hierarchical stem cells that are dividing constantly and differentiating. You know, mostly they had cells that differentiated to be able to perform specific functions. That was the whole point of multicellularity. And then if there was a damage or an injury, then they would just return to the more unicellular like uh, state, repair the damage and then go back. So a lot of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of plasticity cell intrinsically within uh, the repairing cells, but a lot of the um, uh, repair has got to be driven, as Carla touched on a lot, uh, um, by the, the niche signals and, and also Laura. So, um, so I think those are, uh, we've t touched on some really big themes and they're just an incredible amount of questions that I've been trying to distill into, into, uh, uh, into more directed questions. Uh, there was a lot of more um, mechanical questions about how important having the existing sort of uh, mechanical infrastructure is in in um, the actual regeneration process. In, in other words, you know, um, the epithelial cells need those kind of cues to be able to uh, uh, undergo these differentiations and trans differentiations and de-differentiations. Is there any way to kind of de novo um, build a lung or do you have to have some scaffold? Um, you know, I think uh, actually the thermodynamics gets to be pretty hard. Um, it, you know, trying to build a lung with air sacs and trying to coax cells to grow out into space, um, into air, and then lay down matrix is actually a pretty tall order. You probably have to do that all on, on you know, on, uh, submerged. But, um, but you know, I. Right now, we don't have the technology, you know, from, from an engineering standpoint, we don't have the technology to make a protein matrix that has the fine structure of lung or most of the other organs we would want to regenerate. So, um, you know, I think the question would really become, could, could, you, could you get enough fetal-like cells um, and put them in, in a sufficiently conducive environment uh, that would mimic, you know, that, that would get them to execute that program of organ regeneration. I, I, I think that that is the way that would have to go. Um, but, uh, and, you know, it may be that stem cell biology does that in the next 10, 20 years. That in the GI tract, what do you think? Scaffolds or is the epithelium organizing enough? Um, yeah, right now, right now the system needs help, right? I, I, I agree with what Laura said. I think, I don't think we understand um, how the mesenchyme transitions from early fetal development and then and then progresses uh, to, to be able to mimic this in vitro yet. So I think I think we make we do our best to bioengineer scaffolds and, and, and populate them with cells. Um, well, you, you made a comment even uh, earlier um, uh, when we were meeting about even mesenchymal cells potentially participating in, uh, in the process directly as opposed to just informatively. Well, anyway, I think we we're pretty much run out of time. I want to thank everybody for a fantastic uh, session uh, and uh, um, you know, I look forward to the rest of the sessions and uh, thanks a lot to, to your own. I, I, I'm glad that we managed to uh, match color schemes. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks that, uh, Carla, Laura, and thanks for all the outstanding questions. I'm really sorry that I, I, I just tried to distill them. They kind of were firing off the charts for me to actually try to ask individual questions. So um, uh, we can uh, address some of them in uh, by typing later. Um, and I think that's it. We're on break now, according yep. to.
agenda. So I uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. That was a great session. Um, we will indeed take a short break now. We'll break for about seven minutes and return at um, 1155 a.m. Eastern for session two. All right, everyone, I think we will go ahead and get started with session two. Um, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to our session chairs, Tom Rando from Stanford and Shruti Nayak from NYU. So over to you guys. Great. Thanks, Janine. And uh, thank you, everybody, Kara, Mike, and Shri, for organizing this fabulous workshop. Great, great first session. Um, so this session, session two, is actually the kind of negative space of the workshop because this focuses on the organs that don't regenerate. And um, that will focus, obviously, on the biggies, the central nervous system, and the heart, um, which, of course, clinically translate into major problems like stroke and spinal cord injury and myocardial infarction. So we'll hear three great talks in that uh, area, and then we'll move to a discussion. And I'll start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Eileen Anderson from UC Irvine. Eileen? Great. Thanks um, very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just go ahead and hit play here. Can everybody see that OK? Looks yes. good. Perfect. All right. So um, of course, just briefly, I'd like to um, really thank the organizers for the invitation to be here today. I think conceptually the idea of this workshop is a really great one. So I'm excited to be able to participate. So what I'm going to lead off with is this idea of stuff that doesn't regenerate, um, in particular, the central nervous system. And um, while it there is some capacity for regeneration in some systems like axolotls. This is not true, certainly in um, mammals and in adult mammals. And it has kind of two different aspects. One is the failure of the connections of the central nervous system, adult axons, to grow um, and uh, be able to reconnect, certainly after injury or in the context of disease. And this is because of a combination of inhibitory factors and just the loss of growth associated gene expression capacity. But what I'm going to talk about really is focused on the other aspect of this regeneration failure, and that has to do with stem cells. And so CNS neurogenesis is also limited for a variety of reasons. It's niche restricted. There's regional variation. For example, there are differences in the adult brain and spinal cord in terms of whether or not the neural stem cells cells that remain resident in those different areas are capable of generating all three different populations, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. Neur um, neural stem cells in the spinal cord don't like to make neurons, and there are niche factors that are restricting that, for example. There are certainly declines with age, and the role of modulation by the niche of these factors is really quite poorly understood, although we do know a little bit about it. Um, and with um, age or after injury, there's some lineage bias, bias, and this can be because of, you know, positive signaling down a particular injury or the uh, down a particular lineage or the loss of um, direction towards becoming a more diverse set of cells to really recapitulate what is normal. And so there are consequences to this in terms of regenerative medicine, both in terms of endogenous stem cell repair capacity and in terms of thinking about transplantation strategies um, for regenerative medicine. So to recapitulate some ideas that you heard in the first um, session, all stem cells occupy a, occupy a place in the microenvironment. This is called a niche. This is just illustrating a basic niche and a basic stem cell within that niche. Um, but something that's really important, certainly in the context of the CNS, is that that niche can change. It changes with maturation. So the niche that's present for an adult is not the same that's present during development. It changes um, in the context of disease and injury. And maybe just as importantly, it changes as a system is trying to repair itself. So in the case of spinal cord injury, for example, one of the very important things that happens early on after injury is to wall off that site and restore blood-brain barrier integrity and the signals that are welling off that site may very well be contributing um, to the niche in a way that's limiting the capacity of stem cells in terms of doing their repair job. Moreover, stem and progenitor cells um, have properties that de define them and yield variation between them, even if they're all within the same category of cell. And for much of the work that happens in my lab, when we think about transplanting cells in the context of regenerative medicine, um, the variation between different cell lines is something that really hasn't received enough attention and needs to be considered in terms of ultimately what the regenerative repair capacity is. 
So coming back to this issue of um, uh, factors within the niche, there are extrinsic factors and also intrinsic properties of the cells that, um, that come together to influence what repair capacity is. And these, of course, contribute to all of these different sorts of factors that are important in terms of defining repair capacity, maintenance of the stem cell population, self-renewal, survival of those cells, whether they're endogenous or transplanted lineage restriction, as we already discussed, the differentiation capacity and how differentiated those cells can be, and the migration capacity, which may be very important in some structures like the CNS or spinal cord, where cells may have to go a long way in order to be able to exert their effects. And so understanding why stem cells behave in specific ways in complex adult and injury microenvironments is important, both, of course, on the basic science side of things and in the context of translational medicine. Over the last few years, as, as we were just discussing in the previous session, there's been a move towards 3D models of CNS structure and connectivity. This is just one example of a paper from Sergio Pasca's lab um, that um, is taking that organoid model to the next more complex level, certainly in the context of spinal cord injury, by hooking up different organoids, a cortical spinal uh, muscle pathway, in order to be able to get to a more sophisticated um, in vitro model. But I think it's important to point out in the context of what we're trying to bring out today that 3D organoids are just not yet complex enough to really address the sorts of things that are going on in injury or disease, certainly in the adult CNS. Their utility has some limitations because of the ability to generate sufficiently mature tissues to, to mimic the critical de defects, deficits that are present. Um, in terms of tissue repair in the CNS is limited. They fail to recapitulate physical signaling factors and biomechanical stress, blood flow, for example, or tissue stretch or changes in stiffness. And they fail to encompass um, aspects of immune cells and interactions, which certainly in the CNS, we have an increasing recognition is, is really critical. In the spinal cord, in, uh, spinal cord or the injured spinal cord. I also want to bring out the point that there's a dynamically changing environment in the context of niche and what's going on acutely is not at all the same as what's going on in the chronic system. And that is true for both the structural remodeling that's happening in the context of CNS repair and in terms of these features, for example, of the immune response or the mechanical properties of the tissue. We know that immune cells provide extrinsic signals to neural stem cells, certainly ones that are transplanted into the spinal cord or into the injured CNS, and that these are dynamically changing over time. So if we look at days post-injury in a very crude measure of just what immune cells are there at different times, they're changing much more dynamically over a much longer time period than we imagined um, even a few years ago. And the implication of that, the consequence of that, is that if you do nothing other than to change the time of transplantation of your cell population, keep it identical in all other ways, that niche and the extrinsic factors that are present within it are dictating the capacity for repair. We know that manipulating extrinsic signals can change the capacity for CNS repair. This is from some work we did recently identifying one signaling pathway for extrinsic signals that is important. So if we generate stem cell populations using CRISPR gene editing that are deficient in one receptor that matters, we can take cells that fail to repair and make them repair, or we can get rid of the ligand and just deplete it from the microenvironment and that will also convert to repair. So extrinsic factors are important. We know that. Um, intrinsic properties of cells are also important. Um, and so I just want to illustrate that we know that neural stem cell transplantation shows promise not just in rodents, but in humans. This is from one of a clinical, a number of clinical studies that's been done in recent years, transplanting neural stem cells into spinal cord injury, where even in a phase two clinical trial, there's some early evidence for promoting recovery of function, but we know very little about how intrinsically different, different CNS stem cell lines are, even if they're derived in the same way. And so in fact, if we generate a bunch of different stem cell lines using the same protocol in parallel times, all the same reagents, CGMP and compliance. In fact, even in a dish, these different lines, which are all in different colors here, show wildly different properties in terms of their capacity for self-renewal, differentiation and fate and migration. And we know that if we take those cells and now transplant them, that has um, the parallel implications in terms of whether or not in vivo those cell populations are able to yield repair. And we don't understand very well the differences between these lines. 
We've tried a little bit as um, have just a couple of other groups to see if even using crude metrics like um, um, gross RNA seq, bulk seq, we can establish um, cell identity and potency characteristics that could be predictive in vivo. And in fact, you can. So this is just to thin slice some data and show based on an in vitro profile that was developed a predictive um, uh, metric to say which cell lines might be effective in terms of in vivo repair. And in fact, just demonstrate that even with the very crude techniques that we've tried so far, in fact, you can get some um, uh, metrics that will tell you something about cell identity and potency that may be informative in terms of clinical trials. So with all of that um, kind of thin sliced and on the table, um, in the spirit of this meeting, I wanted to, to throw down the proverbial gauntlet for some things that we need to think about in terms of replace, repair, and regenerate in the context of regenerative medicine um, and things that we're going to need in order to be able to advance. So one is to be able to better interrogate dynamic changes and extrinsic niche, niche factors and put those together with intrinsic cell programs to screen for dominant factors um, that are driving both endogenous and donor stem cell behavior. So I've shown you that we can change the capacity of cells for repair, but really you would wanna emerge towards having some sort of a master switch or understand you know, what's gonna be the most important among what's clearly gonna be many factors that are driving those things. I didn't bring it out in this talk today, but I'm just gonna highlight briefly and perhaps we can come back and discuss that there are real limitations that have to do with cell origin in terms of studying CNS stem cells. And so if you're starting with a pluripotent population or an iPSC um, cell, we just aren't that good at driving them towards being the same as tissue differentiated or tissue educated neural stem cells like fetal tissue derived. And we need to understand more about that. Then from the translational side, just two quick points. We need new approaches to be able to track and follow cell identity, purity, and predict the retention of functional activity in vivo. I'll give you just a slice of that. And from a translational perspective, we have no way right now to be able to follow donor cells in vivo, validate their survival and location, and try and be able to support and enable more realistic clinical trials in the future that are really going to be in in terms of what we can do um, in the clinical context for repair. So with that, I'll just thank uh, a whole bunch of people in my lab who contributed to this work and stop my share. Thank you, Eileen. That, that was great. Um, so we have Tom, one you're question. You're muted. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the question came in, has anyone created CNS uh, brain or spinal cord organoid that combines mesodermal lineages which is at the center of scarring of generation. Yeah, not that, not to my knowledge, not that I've ever seen, and that's absolutely right. right? The, um, that's another um, area in which the complexity of organoid models in the long run, we're gonna have to expand to be able to really have good utility there. Actually, you know, I know that your, your talk was focused on transplanted uh, exogenous cells and endogenous stem cells, but just to harken back to the discussion from the previous session, um, just your thoughts on this idea of plasticity. I mean, you know, neurons are unlikely to de-differentiate and, you know, form other cell types, I think. But, you know, within the context of the spinal cord or, or parts of the brain, you know, do you think of that kind of plasticity as opposed to a pure stem cell model? Yeah, I, w I found that discussion really interesting and, and I was pondering it quite a bit on the side. I I think there is very little evidence that that neural stem cells are willing to back up and um, become something else, right? That this is a model that may be much more akin to the classical, you know, hematopoietic or bone marrow derived kind of model where things are quite linear in terms of the way the differentiation capacity happens. The other thing I think that's really important and I, I didn't bring out here is um, at least in the CNS, the stem cell niche can be depleted. And I'm not sure that that's true in the same way um, for other types of organs like intestines, right, that really have this monster capacity in terms of re regeneration. And so, in fact, there's some evidence that after injury, certainly in the brain, if you drive a lot of proliferation in an attempt at repair, that's coming at the expense of the long-term capacity of the class and stem cell pool. And that may be a different factor that we need to consider and know more about than we do right now. Interesting. Yeah, actually, I was thinking, you know, maybe less about the neural stem cell lineage 
um, as much as really other cell types. I mean, like cells of the ventricular system, you know, you know, you know, oh, you know, really kind of thinking of the whole organ and tissue more broadly, you know, if you get a big injury, is there plasticity among the cells and their neighbors, you know, kind of like we were hearing about in the lung? Yeah, um, and there certainly is, right? So microglia, as an example, right? Or um, core plexus endothelial cells, CPEC cell, right? Or another example of this, where we know there's a lot of plasticity in that response. Those cells have at least some capacity to self-renew and we don't understand it very well. And they certainly are signaling both to their more differentiated neighbors and to the stem cell populations that are retained there. And we know very little about that. So yeah, I think they're, and, and whether you could induce plasticity there and thereby, you know, change maybe the way some stem cell pools are activated as a means to encourage further repair or, you know, are those cells putting on the brakes in some way with their own plasticity in terms of attempts? I think those are really important questions. Great. Maybe we'll come back to that in the discussion too. I think it's a broad question. Uh, so we have another question. I think this relates to what you were just saying. It's, I'm curious how microglial cells can contribute to the regeneration plasticity if there, if there is any. Yeah, and microglial cells are a great example. So I, I showed, and you know, or their partners, macrophages, monocytes, right, which are infiltrating into the CNS quite a lot, certainly after any kind of an injury that, that disrupts the blood-brain barrier at all. Um, and those cells are dynamic in their own way, of course, right? So they're changing what their activation state is on a single cell level and even on a population level in a way that's giving cues and directing. So the problem with microglial cells is there's some data that suggests um, maybe they get stuck in one state. And so once they become stuck in some sort of activated phenotype, they may be limiting the plasticity of the rest of the system. And so one way to think about that is whether we need to kind of reactivate plasticity in those responding glial cells in order to be able to release repair potential. And there are a lot of people interested in this right now. We just don't know the answer yet. Great, thanks. Okay, we're, we're out of time. We have a few more questions. We'll come back to them. So Shruti, thank you, Eileen. Thanks, Tom. So, I'm, so folks, I just want to have, thank you so much, Eileen. And I just want to remind you to please ask your questions in the Q&A box um, and not in the chat um, because that just lets us keep track of them. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna go to our next speaker. I'm really excited to um, introduce Dr. Sumura Bayan, who is on her way to starting her own lab at the Gordon Institute. So Sumura, please take it away. Um, thank you very much, uh, Shruti, for the kind introduction. And thank you, organizers, for inviting me to share my point of view and how we can tackle lack of regeneration. And, uh, you know, as we, uh, Eileen already greatly mentioned, central nervous system has very limited repair. And there are multiple approaches we can try to overcome this. One is either transplantation of uh, stem cell drive uh, cells or neurons, but this may not be always efficient, especially in regions of the brain where multiple different cell types are injured and multiple different neurons are lost, or the structure has laminar structure like here you see in the cerebellum and has a very large structure that needs to be repaired. So today I'm going to focus more on the possibility of uh, activating the in-situ stem-like cells or neural stem cells in response to injury. But this is not an easy task. First of all, from a stem-like cell to go to a functional neuron, the after injury, multiple different steps need to be accomplished, like activation of the population, proliferation, uh, lineage plasticity, migration, and eventually differentiation and maturation. And obviously, this is a hypothetical order, the order of the events. We don't really fully know in which way. And the, obviously, the signaling we need to understand that's going to induce all these different stages. In addition to this, the starting populations in different regions of the brain may be different, where it can be the classical neural stem cells in the neurogenic niche or some different astrocytes that may take on stem like. Uh, properties or other quiescent cells that are uh, uh, us and others are defining in certain regions of the brain that may have some stem uh, cell capacity. And in addition to that, the type of injury also matters, which types of neurons, to what extent the cell that is and so on, that's going to all dictate the type of regenerative response that we're going to observe. 
And today I particularly want to focus on the lineage plasticity aspect of this, because in my opinion, this is kind of one of the initial hurdles we really need to pass on to be able to really even tackle whether we can integrate newly generated neurons into an injured uh, system. And uh, to talk about this audience does not need much introduction about the lineage plasticity, but here you can see diverse, diverse stem cells, hypothetical cases giving rise to a different progeny to fulfill the cellular complexity of a region in the brain. And upon, uh, during development, the extent of lineage plasticity between these different components of progenitors uh, within a similar lineage or even from different lineages is still not fully understood. And this even becomes more important in the context of injury when a certain component is lost. Where is the compensatory populations? What are our populations of interest that have the ability to change fate even within similar lineages and, as I said, across different uh, lineages? And importantly, we need to understand the molecular factors and signaling that is regulating such decisions to be able to really uh, use endogen stem cells for repair capacity. But this is really hard to study when especially such events are very rare or not happening in the brain. And this was always a challenge that I found um, to um, uh, found in getting into this field. So we wanted to turn our uh, focus to development where some of these responses might actually be happening. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the developing cerebellum as a powerful model system to answer some of these questions. So well, cerebellum is unique in its ability uh, in its development from rest of the brain because majority of its growth happens after birth. And here you see an MRI series where the uh, cerebellum undergoes vast proliferation two weeks after birth, and this is a, a mouse brain. So this has multiple consequences though. First of all, it makes it susceptible, susceptible to injury around birth, where actually indeed cerebellar hypoplasia is, for example, second leading, uh, leading risk factor for autism spectrum disorder. So there's clinical interest in under, understanding the regenerative uh, capacity of the developing cerebellum. Um, but on a stem cell biologist's point of view, this may also mean that there's increased plasticity and regenerative capacity during this period. And over the several years in the Joiner lab, we were actually indeed uh, were able to show that neonatal cerebellum is highly regenerative and can recover almost to full extent from loss of its different types of neurons in a critical time window. And I'm going to walk you briefly through some of these findings. So this is an overwhelming slide, and for once that was actually in, uh, intentional. I just want to show you that the complexity of the systems and the lineages we're dealing with only within one subregion of the brain. So some different regions of the brain also have their own different complexities and so uh, and stem cell or progenitor populations that we need to still gain more insights. And now with the increase of the single cell technologies, we're understanding more and more on the um, diversity of the progenitors of the brain during development and the cell types in the end. But you can see different types of cells of the cerebellum, whether them being excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons or the astroglia, are generated from different progenitors that are defined from various embryonic zones. So there's a lot of decisions that the progenitor and stem cells need to go through. And then you can see the neonatal development is established by these various different subpopulations of progenitors that continue to undergo proliferation. So in order to test the um, regenerative responses, we started injuring the mouse cerebellum at birth by killing different cell types. And when one system we killed Purkinje cells, and I don't have time to show you uh, to full extent, but what we observed was in this case, we were able to identify a new dormant population. We call them immature Purkinje cells, uh, progenitors, which was able to re-enter cell cycle and replenish the lost cells. In another study where we killed the granule cell progenitors, this time, to our surprise, we actually observed an adaptive program, a reprogramming of a normally gliogenic population to replace the lost cells. And the point I want to reiterate here is that you can see different types of injuries actually induce different types of regenerative response as well, which is adds another level of complexity to the system we're trying to study. And I want to kind of talk, walk you through this interesting adaptive reprogramming we observed. And in the neonatal mice at postnatal day one, when we killed the granule cell progenitors, what we had observed was that the specifically the cells 
uh, gliogenic stem cells that are in this particular layer were able to proliferate, migrate to the site of injury, and then as they reach, change their fate and give rise to the lost cells. Over the years now, using single cell technologies and lineage tracing, we are gaining more insights into what are these molecular events that are occurring within these cellular responses. And then we were able to identify a, a transitory cellular state that is required for these gliogenic cells to now make neurons. And this is particularly exciting because ASCL1 particularly, which was a gene that we identified, has been shown to induce neuronal fate in many different contexts, but the neonatal cerebellum actually is able to turn on this transition on its own. So understanding what is the upstream of this transition will be critical in understanding how we can stimulate in endogenous cells to make neurons. So interestingly though, however, both of these regenerative systems I talked to you about were really tightly regulated by a developmental age. And although in the adult cerebellum, we have these stem-like cells which fulfill some stem cell criteria, uh, they are, and they are able to respond to injury by increasing in numbers, we do not get any proliferation on neuron production. So moving forward, we would like to use this system to understand what are the cell intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms that enable regeneration in the neonates and inhibit regeneration in the adult cerebellum. And actually our main goal is to be able to use the knowledge we gain during the development and identify blockages so that we can enable and enhance regeneration when it's not happening. The way we look at the problem is uh, two folds actually. First, first of all, the decline with age may be due to lack of developmental signals at the end of development, which provides this pro-regenerative milieu to these cells. And furthermore, silencing of the stem cells or stem cell activation or differentiation programs as the development ends as an, another layer of blockage of why these cells may not undergo certain uh, plasticity, uh, lineage plasticity or lineage choices we wish them to make. So using some of the existing approaches and actually building on it and improving some of these approaches such as single cell omics where we can do comparative transcriptomic and epigenomic analysis in the regenerative permissive and inhibitory states and combining this with sophisticated in vivo injury models and lineage tracing and mutant analysis will really tell us how we can evade some of these molecular, understand some of these molecular mechanisms that's required for this. And I do not envision this to be a single, we're gonna find a key molecule that's gonna solve all our problems, but rather the goal should be to be able to identify and be able to con in a controlled manner manipulate all these different stages that is required to achieve from a stem cell to neuron uh, differentiation upon injury. And then some open questions moving forward are that whether there are similar regenerative permissive periods in other subregions of the brain or similar plastic progenitors in these different regions of the central nervous system. What are the functions, we touched a little bit upon it, but what are the functions of other cell types, particularly, for example, astrocytes that undergo more like a glide? Uh, scarring uh, response in the brain upon injury or microglia, the resident immune cells of the uh, brain upon injury and whether they are pro or anti-regenerative in different contexts. And importantly, how do we translate our findings to the human brain uh, is going to be the biggest challenge ahead of us. And we hope that the organoid field and possibly organoids that mimic certain aspects of injury may be really interested to uh, achieve uh, some of these uh, questions we're trying to answer. With that, I'd like to thank my lab uh, and Dr. Joyner has been a great mentor uh, to formulate some of these ideas. And a little uh, Shruti already mentioned, but we'll be moving to Garden Institute in uh, next spring. So if you thought any of this was interesting or have questions, please feel free to get in touch. And I'd like to take um, if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Samura. That's I really love this idea of like defining the heuristics of development and then applying them to regeneration. All right, so folks, we're open for questions. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, is it possible to maintain uh, animal brains in vitro, maintain their functionality in vitro to understand neural regeneration? So have you tried any ex vivo systems? Yeah, yeah. That's and what are your thoughts on them? That's a great question. And I didn't have time to show many of the uh, data we had, but 
we are able to certain extent keep them alive, for example, as slice cultures in the younger brains. And we can using reporters uh, follow these cells. And that's how I actually we were able to identify it to a certain layer of cells that's responding to injury and mig their migration to the site of injury and so on. But there is definitely moving forward, and this is something that may be interested for uh, HHMI as well, is to building more reporter tools, more imaging tools that we can actually expand on this. And we can culture these cells in vitro, but on the tests, uh, some organoid aspect moving from 3D cultures and so on, cerebellum is a little bit lacking behind the uh, um, rest of the brain organoids. And actually these neonatal progenitor cells are not represented in the existing organoid cultures. But the, so I guess there's a follow-up on that question, which is, do they maintain functionality in vivo or yeah. ex vivo? Sorry. Yeah, ex vivo, at least in terms of them in, uh, uh, migrating to the inside of injury and turning on certain initial genes. Yes, we do. But the, our window of imaging is also very limited. And usually, like, let's say this regenerative neonatal regeneration takes around four or five days to really fulfill from activation, proliferation, migration, and so on. We can do this imaging in like eight hour, 12 hour windows that is faithfully. So we're kind of keeping them in vivo and then dissecting and trying to capture that bridge. So there's definitely a lot of room for improvement to uh, move this to an ex vivo system. Great. And then we have a question from Renee Wasco. Um, so how important is spatial location when one progenitor type cell can compensate for another? lost progenitor type? And do you think that nearest neighbors matter as first responders? Yeah, so that's an amazing question. And actually, I didn't again get have time to show, but for example, in the when we did the Purkinje cell experiment, which is right next to these adaptive reprogramming cells spatially, our bet was that these normal plastic cells that I showed you elaborated on further was going to actually give rise to their nearest neighbor. They don't need to migrate. They don't need to go through all these crazy transitions, fate transitions, but it wasn't the case. So that's why I think it's really important moving forward, understanding the nature of the injury and the signaling that is also coming from the cell that is dying, which induces these responses. So we don't know the answer yet, but there is it's not as straightforward as your nearest neighbor is repairing your uh, injured cells. So that's definitely moving forward something that we will keep an eye on. Very cool. So I think we're out of time for the Q&A. So Tom, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, so our next speaker needs no introduction, Eric Olson from UT Southwestern, um, rock star and pioneer in development regeneration of both heart and skeletal muscle and uh, with strong translational applications, which we'll talk about today in the heart. Eric. Can you see my slides correctly? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today to talk about uh, organs that uh, do not regenerate. And I think uh, no organ exemplifies the challenges of regeneration more so uh, than the heart. So to put this in context, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, as all of you, I think, are well aware, accounting for hundreds of thousands of deaths per year and one in four uh, total deaths. And so this is a, a tissue that really begs for new strategies for tissue regeneration. There are both acute and chronic causes for uh, heart disease. These in include myocardial infarction that occurs in response to an acute vascular occlusion, hypertension, genetic mutations represent a chronic cause as well as uh, chemotherapy. Now, interestingly, although the adult heart cannot regenerate as schematized here and is accompanied by the formation of a fibrotic scar in response to injury, the neonatal heart retains a robust regenerative response as, as schematized here. And so our laboratory has sought to try to decipher the gene regulatory mechanisms that underpin the neonatal regenerative response and to try to reactivate those under conditions of adult heart uh, disease. In the neonatal regenerative heart, there are several key features that lend themselves to regeneration. And these include a glycolytic metabolism, 
a proliferative capacity of cardiomyocytes and a primitive immunity. Whereas in the adult, which is non-regenerative, there's an oxidative metabolism that is thought to impose a barrier to regeneration. In addition, cardiomyocytes are quiescent and polyploid, which prevents them from re-entering the cell cycle to restore lost myocytes that occur in response to damage. And there's a robust adaptive immune response that can play both positive and negative roles in the regenerative process. This slide illustrates several of the key features of neonatal heart regeneration that we and others have uh, uncovered. First of all, it's important to point out that the neonatal regenerative response is sustained by proliferation of pre-existing cardiac myocytes throughout the remaining myocardium rather than through a cardiac stem cell pool. In response to a variety of injuries in the neonatal period, these can include apical resection of the heart, permanent myocardial infarction or others, this, these cardiomyocytes reawaken their proliferative activity and regenerate the missing myocardium. This is accompanied by activation of a fascinating layer of cells that surrounds the heart known as the epicardium, followed by inflammatory infiltration and new blood vessel formation that ultimately restores the complete structure and function of the heart. In contrast, in adulthood, these various cellular processes are blocked and are replaced by a robust fibrotic process that prevents uh, cardiac uh, restoration. So why can't the adult heart regenerate? As I've indicated that there's an antagonism between the repair process, which is robust in the neonatal phase and the fibrotic or scar forming process, which becomes uh, particularly robust later in life. So there are several key features that, uh, of the adult heart that prevent it from regeneration. One is the blockade to proliferation of cardiomyocytes. Another, as I've said, is the robust fibrosis and scarring. Another is that too many cells are lost. Within minutes or hours following blockade of a coronary uh, vessel to the, to the left ventricle, billions of cardiomyocytes can be lost. And there's a requirement for the functional integration of, of newly formed cells back in with the remainder of the myocardium. What are the requirements that would, that would be needed to restore function or regenerate the human heart? Well, the first is obvious as schematized here. There must be remuscularization of the heart. There has to be revascularization to restore blood flow to cardiac muscle cells, which are especially uh, sensitive to oxygenation. There has to be electrical stabilization to restore the, the synchronous contractility and electrical activity of the heart. There has to be resolution of fibrosis and immunologic uh, normalization of the injured tissue. Several of these features are highlighted by the, the myriad cell types that comprise the heart. We've tried to deconvolute the complexity of uh, cardiac cellularity by single nuclear and single cell RNA sequencing. And from these studies, we've recently uncovered at least 22 different non-myocyte cell types that are resident in the heart or that infiltrate the heart in response to injury. And in addition, there are at least four to five cardiomyocyte cell types that show varying ranges of uh, maturation and complexity. And it's the the integration of all these cell types together that determines whether the heart can ultimately respond to injury or not. As I mentioned, one of the fascinating cell types in the heart is the epicardium shown here uh, highlighted in red, which provides a layer surrounding the heart. And elegant studies in zebrafish have shown that the epicardium serves as a signaling center for various uh, secreted factors that can pr promote cardiac regeneration. Using single cell RNA sequencing, we've recently deconvoluted the gene expression patterns of the epicardial cell in response to injury, both in the neonatal and the adult stage. And this complex slide shows putative ligand receptor interactions that emanate from the epicardium, which secretes these various factors to target corresponding receptors on the various cell types in the heart. And we're currently trying to modulate these types of signaling interactions within the cardiac microenvironment as a strategy for promoting heart regeneration. So this comes back to the, to the fundamental problem. The neonatal heart can regenerate, the adult heart cannot regenerate. In our lab, we're currently taking a number of approaches 
to modify this regenerative response. And these include reprogramming of fibroblasts toward a cardiomyocyte fate. I'll speak about that in just a moment. We're trying to activate regenerative signaling using information gleaned from single nuclear RNA sequencing to identify signaling pathways, morphogens, and molecules that might promote this pathway. And lastly, we're using genomic editing to modify uh, mutations or normalize mutations in the many, many genes that lead to cardiomyopathy uh, in humans. This slide illustrates the, the potential and the challenge of cardiac reprogramming. Cardiac muscle cells are not like skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle has a single factor, myOD, which can convert fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes. In contrast, cardiomyocytes require combinatorial interactions between multiple transcription factors and chromatin remodeling enzymes in order to establish myocardial cell fate. Work from our lab and other labs, notably Deepak Srivastava's lab, have identified combinations of reprogramming factors which, when introduced into fibroblasts, can restore the muscularity uh, of the heart and convert these cells, which would otherwise form scar, scar, into cardiomyocytes. But there are several challenges with this approach that we're currently trying to address. One is the efficiency of reprogramming remains relatively low. The Cardiomyocytes, so-called induced cardiomyocytes that are generated by this process are relatively immature. These cells must be integrated with the surrounding myocardium to form seamless contractility of the organ, and they must be the factors must be delivered by viral delivery. In addition, there are many other strategies that we and others are deploying to try to uh, repair the heart. One is to use cellular replacement or cellular scaffolds to restore cellularity and structure. Strategies are being deployed by us and others to promote proliferation and prevent death of cardiomyocytes in response to injury. Revascularization and blockade to fibrosis represent important strategies for heart repair. Fibroblast to cardiac myocyte reprogramming, as I, as I mentioned, enhancing the contractility of the heart, and finally, genetic repair of cardiomyopathy mutations. Ultimately, I believe it will be the combination of many of these approaches that together will allow us to restore the function to the adult heart and to modify the many different cell types that must work in concert for the, the seamless contractility of the heart. Now, with respect to Genelia Farms, what are the types of tools that would really advance uh, the work that we're pursuing, as well as the work from many of the other uh, speakers that have talked about uh, non-regenerative tissues and organs? One is we need better tools for lineage tracing and live imaging of various cardiac cell types. And this is especially important in the heart where there's, as I mentioned, dozens of cell types that integrate to form this organ. We need better screening approaches to identify regenerative genes and molecules that could have uh, both antifibrotic and pro-regenerative activities on the various cell types of the heart. Especially important we need better delivery methods, both viral and non-viral, to deliver genes and molecules to the various cell types in the heart. And this, this really poses one of the fundamental challenges that perhaps Genelia could ultimately help us to advance. And finally, we need bioengineering strategies because the heart, as you can appreciate, is a three-dimensional integrated organ that must also integrate with the vasculature and, and other uh, aspects of, of the body, and we need better bioengineering strategies to incorporate these various cell types. Lastly, then, this is our group in Dallas. We're always interested in ambitious and fun-loving students and postdocs, and this work that I've described to you obviously represents a new frontier in science and regenerative medicine with many different uh, interesting questions to continue to explore with clinical implications. And with that, I will stop sharing. And good, thank you very much. Terrific, thanks, Eric, that was, that was great. Um, so a lot of questions have come in and actually many of them are along very similar lines. So I'm gonna try and summarize three or four questions. Um, basically the, the question is, is this, Eric, people are asking, you know, is there an immune response and a fibrotic response that occurs in the neonate that is cleared or does it not occur? And really how is this different between the neonate and the adult? A lot of questions about the fibrotic response and the immune response. Compared yeah, to so those are really good questions. 
the immune response is highly complex, and we are studying uh, many aspects of uh, innate and adaptive immunity in the neonatal and the adult heart. I will say that one of the, the principal uh, immune components of regeneration, won't be surprised to you, is macrophages. And we've shown that macrophages, uh, well, of course, they clear debris in the neonatal heart, but they also are the source of, of various uh, secreted factors which have uh, beneficial effects on proliferation and uh, vascularity. So I think this, the aspect of immune signaling and regeneration, whether it be in the heart or other tissues, represents an enormously exciting frontier for, for young people who are interested in this, this field. The second uh, question you ask is about fibrosis. So fibrosis is, it's an essential step in uh, repair of the adult heart in the sense that if you don't have fibrosis, it can lead to cardiac rupture. So it's, a, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You need, you need fibrosis to prevent rupture, but it ultimately serves as a barrier to regeneration. So I think strategies to fine tune the fibrotic response would be uh, warranted. Great, thanks. Uh, a question came in about the induced cardiomyocytes. Is the immaturity of induced cardiomyocytes related to the persistent cell cycling that mature cardiomyocytes lack? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the induced cardiomyocytes become post-mitotic so that they don't continue to proliferate. Uh, but I think full maturation of cardiomyocytes likely requires a combination of transcriptional outputs as well as electrical activity and uh, coordination with surrounding cells. So there's, there's a number of, of variables that have to come into play to induce the maturation of cardiomyocytes. And we've recently generated some exciting data in which we think we've identified at least one chromatin remodeling enzyme that participates in uh, acquisition of the mat mature cardiac phenotype. So, so, so I, I just have a follow-up. So, so in terms of the reprogramming, wh what about a strategy of actually reprogramming back toward a more proliferative cell type um, and then inducing the differentiation toward a cardiac cardiomyocyte phenotype? It's a, very, it's a very good question. It's a very promising approach. So perhaps some of the most exciting work that's been done in this area is work showing that the hippo YAP pathway done by Jim Martin and our group and many others can uh, promote the proliferation of cardiomyocytes and can repair uh, the loss of myocytes in response, response to myocardial infarction. So that represents one very important uh, aspect. Another area that we're pursuing is uh, the control of polyploidy, which also likely is associated with the barrier to proliferation. And we've recently identified a novel RNA binding protein that we think controls polyploidy. And so that represents another uh, lever in the pathway to manipulate the process. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. So we're, we're running out of time in the Q&A. So I think we'll uh, we'll move to the the broader discussion uh, panel, you know, with uh, Eileen Sumeru and Eric, and we'll be joined also by Amy Glickman from uh, UCLA, who uh, will be giving a talk later in the uh, Emerging Leaders and Regeneration session at the end of the day. Uh, but I'll turn this over to Shriti to start off our our group discussion. Awesome. So thank you all for your really wonderful talks, and a special thanks to Eric for pitching immune cells. I'm an immunologist, so I'm definitely like, yes, go macrophages. Um, Don't ask me any hard questions about immune cells. <laughs> yeah, and people are like, we don't want the jargon. We just want the good stuff. Uh, but in any case, I think there were a lot of fantastic themes that came out of this talk. So the first, you know, which was kind of what is this dead space and why is it dead space? So it seems as though um, in contrast to the last session in organs that are poised and constantly regenerating, the organs, the internal organs like the CNS and the heart, um, not only change their microenvironment but lose their progenitors. And and recovering that, um, you know, we heard about multiple strategies. Um, and maybe I want to kick off the conversation with the a broader overview about transplantation versus endogenous reprogramming, and if there is some middle ground. So I'd love your your thoughts on that. I, I'll just chime in on that just to get started. So there, at the risk of stepping on some toes, 
there's been more than a decade of clinical trials in which uh, investigators have tried to transplant cells back into infarcted human hearts. And I think the take home, clear take home message from those studies is that it does not work. It doesn't work because cells can't, exogenous cells don't efficiently integrate themselves into the uh, myocardium where all the cardiomyocytes that remain are really tightly connected by tight junctions. So I believe that the best strategy for regeneration ultimately is to reprogram or uh, convert endogenous cells in the heart toward a cardiac fate rather than trying to do transplantation. Now, is that different in the CNS? Do we... Oh, I think you're muted, Aileen. And so I guess I, I, can, I can jump in there. Okay, so I guess I can jump in there a little bit. I think um, in the in the CNS, at, at least in spinal cord, there's actually a, a really robust progenitor population that's maintained into adulthood, and that's um, the cell populations that generate oligodendrocytes and also astrocytes. And they're very capable of responding to injury. They do it very robustly. There's kind of an ongoing debate in terms of spinal cord injury. Um, in that there's now, it was thought that axons that got demyelinated, that progenitor pool couldn't remyelinate and take care of and make them improve their functionality. There's a lot of recent data that suggests actually that progenitor response is really robust. It declines with aging to some degree. It changes depending upon the size of the injury, because if they have to migrate a long way in to be able to do that, by the time they get to the right spot, they either may not be able to get there or they may not have the capacity to really terminally differentiate and effectively myelinate. What we don't know, I would say is still a hole in the literature, although probably there are some folks out there that would disagree with me, is whether that's enough. So it's not necessarily clear that you get functional connections that are reestablished in spared axons. So I think about it as our tools are not refined enough to be able to see whether there are gaps that are too big for the electrical signals to bridge, right? And so we could have this really robust progenitor response and yet be lacking that final mile to be able to get what we really need to make the most of the circuitry that's spared. But overall point being, and then I think Sumer maybe has a few things to say, is there is a robust progenitor response, there can be, but um, it still doesn't get us there. And the gaps in why that happens are still fundamental. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Just to add on it, it's really gonna depend for the CNS, the region or the type of injury that is working on. For example, I mean, tomorrow, Lauren Studer is going to probably elaborate on, but like when in the Parkinson's, when the dopaminergic neurons are just really defined function and so on, in such case, putting in something that will fulfill that function may be effective in regenerating, but in a like a stroke model where there's a lot of different cell types affected and so on, even we get some stem cell activation in different regions of the brain or like cells gaining stem cell-like properties, I agree, is it enough? And I think moving forward, increasing our temporal resolution and single on the single cell level, understanding all these transitory states and where are these cells are actually blocked, making that final push will be very critical in uh, moving forward to fulfill that gap of knowledge. Amy, did you I want to add in? Yeah, yeah thank you, Tom. I would also add that I think there are some differences here in terms of, of exactly the type of injury that we're talking about and whether or not it's really critical to reclaim that fibrotic core, that fibrotic core, that lesion core, versus really rather we'd rather induce plasticity in the in the surviving and spared tissue. And I think this is probably different when we're talking about stroke versus something like spinal cord injury. So in stroke, we might not necessarily need to reclaim that fibrotic core. We might really just be looking at more inducing plasticity in the surviving tissue. And in those cases, yeah, we absolutely see robust responses from oligoprogenitor cells as well as from astrocytes. And I think Sumer is completely right that this is going to be region dependent, that we see differences, whether we're looking at white matter, cortex, striatum, all of these different regions have very different responses. And, and trying to figure that, those out in an injury specific way, I think is really critical. So, so I, want, I want to raise a, a point that I don't think has been brought up yet today. And I think it relates to this question and kind of Eric's uh, skepticism or you know, glass half empty about the, the, the success of transplantation experiments, which, which I agree have been very disappointing. Is this about scale? And you know, we, we haven't really talked about this so much, but you know, 
the molecules in neonates and adults is the same and scale wise and, and mice and humans. And the cells are pretty close to scale, but the size of the organs are vastly different. So I think when we've injected cells as a bolus to try and cure organs, it doesn't work because you, you know, they're not vascularized. They don't know what to do. They're running around kind of looking for cues. And I wonder if this is more about scale or if there's a big part of this, which you know, in an organoid culture, you start at the scale of a single cell or a few cells, they figure it out. But you know, putting a bunch of cells into a tissue that's infarcted or, or damaged is probably just the wrong idea because we're starting with macro level therapy for what is you know micro or at least cellular level scale. So I'm going to throw that. Out. Eric, can I can I throw yeah, that to you to start with? I'll, I'll take that. I mean, I think scale is a very important issue when we're trying to extrapolate from model organisms as to how a process might work in a human being. And I'll give you an example. The elegant work that's been done in the zebrafish has shown that the zebrafish heart can regenerate, uh, shown by Ken Poss and many others. The zebrafish heart is approximately one millimeter in diameter. The human heart is 10 centimeters in diameter. And as I mentioned, billions and billions of cardiomyocytes can be lost almost instantaneously in a human heart. And so just the, even if you understand the underlying fundamental processes, there's just a very big number there that you have to overcome. And so I think thinking about ways to augment that either by cellular scaffolds or uh, growth stimulatory uh, mechanisms uh, are well warranted. I would argue that scale isn't the only issue in terms of regeneration, at least when we're talking about the brain. With, with very small infarcts um, in, in the cortex, there's this great smallest stroke model from David Kleinfeld's lab in Andy Shi. You still see a fibrotic scar and that scar doesn't, doesn't disappear over time. You still see functional deficits lasting for a long time. So the size of the functional deficit, I think scales with, with the size of the injury, but just having a very, very small infarct is still enough that, that you can't get regeneration across that fibrotic scar. I have a question for the sure. neuroscientists that maybe reflects my naivete. If you were able to uh, create new neurons within the brain in a region of stroke or whatever, and if they were able to establish functional connection with surrounding cells, how would they restore the information, the memories, all the other outputs that were lost when, in response to the original injury? Or how do you superimpose learning on top of new uh, neurons to restore what existed before? So I don't know if Amy wants to, to go there. I, I think um, probably the three of us would say something very similar, which is that this is still going to be very region dependent. So um, if your primary injury is to the hippocampus, you're probably not going to restore enough um, proper new memories and transferring them out to a distributed cortical network in a way that's going to give you you know, to make you not HM, right? Um, if you're talking about somatosensory cortex or someplace that's commonly affected by stroke, you've got a different problem. And there you may just need to be able to, because the brain is retains a lot of plasticity, a lot more than we recognized 20 or 30 years ago. And so you may just need to be able to enable some bridge circuitry to happen and shockingly the brain may figure it out, right? In a, in a way that's kind of amazing. In the spinal cord, it's probably something in between because of the organization of the cord, right? It's segmental organization. If you've completely blown out the motor neurons that are at one level, the odds that you're going to be able to replace those and get regeneration out to muscle to make contacts in a meaningful way to restore that at level function are probably not great. But a combination of putting in some neurons that can make bridge circuitry to enable sort of a bypass circuit to flow and restore some function below and have plasticity take care of the rest that may be very viable in in terms of an approach I, do the two of you guys want to chime in agree. And, yeah i completely agree i think especially when we're talking about the brain 
letting letting the, the cells, letting the neurons in particular be in sort of a more plastic state and then letting the brain for itself decide what it wants to prioritize and what functions it really wants to relearn. I, I completely agree. I think that can be done in combination with various rehab strategies. And there's a lot of that work being done at various institutions, including UCLA in terms of, in terms of physical therapy approaches for patients. But I think inducing that plasticity and then letting, letting the brain figure itself out is, is, is a promising strategy. Yeah, I, I would chime in here. So not, but can less I a ask it? So I was just gonna say, I was gonna chime in less as a neuroscientist as, as a neurologist and you know, clearly, um, I think what the, what's been suggested so far is so clearly true in regard to, for example, injury to the developing brain or the young brain. You can remove huge parts of the brain and get you know, very, very robust development of functions. And I think that's an interesting idea. Like even in skeletal muscle, there's increasing evidence that in response to a large injury, um, <clears throat> the remaining muscle can actually adapt in ways that even if you don't repair the injury, you can recover function that was unexpected. Um, so I think, you know, that's a very different model of repair because you're not actually repairing the injury, but the plasticity of the tissue in the organism uh, may, may make up for a lack of regeneration. Sorry, I have I mean, a question yeah. for, uh, I have a question for Tom on that note about my other favorite tissue and one of his favorite tissues, and that is skeletal muscle. Why did nature make the heart so complicated? As I said, it takes many factors to make a cardiomyocyte. It only takes one to make skeletal muscle. Heart has no stem cell. Skeletal muscle has an amazing stem cell population. Why should skeletal muscle be so regenerative and cardiac not? So I'm waving my hands here. So, um, I mean, I, I guess I, I think of, of limb injury as being part of something that was, has been evolutionarily conserved importantly for survival, whereas heart injury has not been an important drive for evolutionary survival. Um, you know, a heart injury is rarely, rarely occurs without death, whereas limb injury occurs all the time in nature. So that's my hand-waving argument that it's a, you know, evolutionary conserved mechanism. And, you know, I guess the question is why does liver, why did we retain liver regeneration? Liver injury probably never occurs without death either on that scale, but that's retained. But I guess I think of skeletal muscles as being part of the, 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 the limb mesenchyme, that it has to be good at this. That's just a speculation. Eileen, did you want to chime in on your, I think I interrupted you before. Oh, I, I just was going to come back to this issue of scale, because I do, I do think it's an important one to, to think about. Um, certainly in the CNS, we know from some some older studies and even some recent ones that scale does does matter. It matters for that progenitor response. There are some limits to how far progenitors can go, just how far they can migrate and how motivated, if you will, they are to get to a particular site. And so scale does limit um, repair capacity to, to some degree. But I agree that it's not the whole story. And I, I wanted to come back to something that, that I mentioned, thinking of um, Eric's you know, the original exchange about transplanted cell populations, certainly in the context of cardiac, where, you know, this hasn't yielded what one might have hoped in terms of the potential for repair. And so the question I was going to pose back is, has the right cell population been transplanted? So I know in my own work from, from CNS, if you transplant, at least in my hands, um, an iPS-derived cell that's been neuralized. These cells get kind of locked into being neuroepithelial. They fail to read cues in the environment. You can drive them with a whole bunch of growth factors and they'll exhibit insanely robust growth, even in the adult CNS, but they're not really listening to the environment in a way that lets them integrate. Um, and tissue-derived fetal human neural stem cells are a whole different kettle of fish. They, they listen to the environment in a very sensitive way, and they do terminally differentiate and, and listen to cues and really integrate with the, with the CNS. So is there actually some sort of issue in terms of cardiac? I know we have issues in CNS, right? But where you need to make the, the, the system a little plastic so that it's giving cues, and then find the right kind of you know, stage of stem cell development so that it can use those cues to, to integrate in a way that has not, you know, been successful with other populations? Sorry, it was a really long-winded question. That's a good question. 
integration in the heart is critical. And that is, as you know, the heart has second to second rhythmic contraction and even a subtle perturbation in that can lead to a lethal arrhythmia. So it's a difficult, and cardiomyocytes are integrated together in a, an electrical, almost syncytium with tight junctions, and they don't really accept strangers very easily uh, into that. So it's, it's difficult to think about how you would get a billion cells to incorporate in, into that kind of architecture, but along with the electrical activity. So I think that's one of the challenges. Jennifer, you had a question? Yeah. yeah I was just going to say, this falls right into um, Eric's question about why is it that heart can't regenerate versus coupled muscle and other tissues can. I think you just said it, Eric, that the, the heart is such an integrated system that it can't, it can't take time off for any part of itself to undergo a day or a week long repair process, which is what a limb does. You know, if you damage a limb, it, you know, you, the organism as a whole can still function as the slow regeneration occurs. The heart can't do that. It, you mess up any part of that system, you're going to get arrhythmia or other things that are going to um, lead to complete collapse. Uh, so that, that could be part of the challenge is that this is a, such an integrated um, organ that it doesn't, it doesn't allow for it. Um, yeah. Right. I, mean, I there, agree. There's whole organ transplantation. I mean, that's the alternative, right? Take the, take it out and put in a new one. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what you do with hearts nowadays, right? Yeah, I guess in the extreme. But can case. I ask a follow-up question to that then? Which would be during during development of the heart, right? It is contractile. So is not the biomechanics of that a cue in terms of cell integration and differentiation? Because that those biomechanical signals are normally very important. So why, do, and then if that is true, then why does that become a negative signal as opposed to a positive signal for integration, which it presumably must be at some point? I'll let Jennifer take that one since <laughs> she's obviously thinking about this. I, I'm, this is, I'm totally out of my, uh... Um, wheelhouse, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the you have to think about what that what the heart's doing in that neonatal state. Um, you know, I think it's it's not doing as many complicated things as the adult heart, and as a result, it can be more flexible um, in terms of um, you know something messing it up and it just try to reestablish itself a different way. Um, it also probably comes back to this, the issue of scale once again. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say that because in skeletal muscle, again, as an example, the contraction of the muscle in the setting of an injury results in the alignment of the developed regenerating cells, unless the injury is too large, in which case the contraction is, is harmful. So I think it really is about scale there where um, those biomechanical cues are, are, are important and, 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 uh, instructive in relatively small injuries and are destructive in very large injuries. Can I also add one thing to the concept of scale and uh, neonates versus adults? I think Eric also pointed out in his talk as well, but one thing we're missing is that the microenvironment regarding the immune microenvironment in the neonates is still also very mature. And I think Shruti would appreciate this. And we still don't know to what they may be in a more uh, pro-regenerative state, whereas in, as they mature in the adult, they also become inhibitory to certain cues. So uh, I don't think it's like, I agree with the scale problem, but coming back to Amy, I think it's not the only factor why it's uh, regenerating versus not regenerating in the adult. So I think we are out of time. So thank you, everybody. It's a really great discussion. Um, thanks, Rudy, for co-hosting the, the session. And we'll turn this back over to you, Jimmy. Wonderful. Thank you. That was a great session, everyone. Um, we will take another short break now, about seven minutes, and we will return at 1.10 p.m. Eastern for session three. Thanks, everyone. All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's get started with session three. And to do that, I'm going to turn it over to the chairs 
who are Kristen Nows from MIT and Quentin Smith from UC Irvine. Over to you guys. Uh, thank you so much for the organizers for this great res research workshop. So we're going to transition a little bit to tissues that do have the capacity to regenerate. Um, we're going to be focusing on the liver and bone in this session. We have a lineup of, of uh, three great speakers. We're going to go ahead and start with uh, Charles Chan from Stanford University. Thank you, Quinton, for the kind int introduction, and uh, thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Chuck Chan. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery and the Stem Cell Institute at Stanford, and the work that my laboratory uh, works on is on skeletal stem cells and using skeletal stem cells and skeletal de development as a platform to understand some key questions, including um, how are different shapes programmed genetically um, in the midst of uh, tissue turnover and growth, how do we maintain these shapes um, in terms of the different types of tissues in the skeletal system, um, you know, how do they form and when do they form during the development? And uh, very importantly, also to use the skeletal system as a way to understand how different types of stem cells um, interact with one another and to coordinate their activities. Uh, in particular, uh, the interactions between the HSC, the hematopoietic stem cells, and the SSC, the skeletal stem cells. And you know, as we've heard from um, many great talks uh, just, just now, um, the, most of the adult organs are composites of different types of tissues, uh, some of which still retain stem cells uh, that could self-renew and give rise to other cell types. Um, but somehow there, in these tissues uh, during growth and regeneration, there has to be some sort of coordination to produce tissues with the appropriate functional architecture. And so our, the, the way that we address how these interactions um, occur and what type of interactions exist uh, began with our study of the uh, immune system and how it develops. So um, some of the, you know, the immune system or the mature cells of the uh, hematopoietic system as well as the immune system are derived from a self-renewing hematopoietic stem cells now isolated now more than th uh, 30 years ago by uh, Irv Wiseman and his colleagues at, at Stanford. Um, and this stem cells had the ability to reconstitute an entire hematopoietic system that's been a myeloablated. Uh, since that time, um, many other investigators um, worked on defining the downstream uh, progenitor lineages that the stem cell gives rise to as it uh, differentiates into very functionally diverse and morphologically diverse uh, cell types that would include um, cells as different as erythrocytes, platelets, um, the cells of the innate immune system, macrophages and dendritic cells, microglia, and the cells of the adaptive immune system, including um, B cells and T cells, just to name a few. So what this diagram here shows um, the lineage um, or a relatively uh, accurate lineage map of the stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells at the apex of this differentiation hierarchy and many of the downstream progenitors and by the virtue of being able to isolate each of these different cell intermediates in purity, um, this allows us to characterize their transcriptional regulation and the um, genetic differences between a stem cell and a more committed lineage. And thus identifying um, the extrinsic mechanisms that help determine whether or not um, a stem cell goes down towards um, a, a, rep, a lineage pathway that ends up with erythrocytes or another pathway that ends up with production of B cells or T cells. So also listed in this um, map is their uh, cytokines, the extrinsic regulatory signal that has been identified that controls some of these steps. So by identifying uh, uh, the stem cells of a tissue, a particular type of tissue, as well as the immediate downstream lineages, this allows you to really determine 
um, how mature cells, uh, tissue specific cells form from um, non-committing stem progenitor cells and the regulatory process that, that occurs. So if you were to think of hematopoietic stem cells as sort of the seed and to, um, as the, of the hematopoietic system, you know, then one of the questions is like, where do the regulatory signals come from? In other words, like what is the soil that nourishes that seed? And so in the adult bone marrow, um, the, this is the site of mature uh, adult hematopoiesis. And that's, this is where the majority of adult hematopoietic stem cells normally reside. A cross section of this marrow tissue um, shows that there's actually many different cell types uh, within this tissues. And so one question would be, uh, what are the origins of each of these individual cell types and how do they interact with one another? Um, at some point, it was thought that many of these different cell types, including adipose, vessel, hematopoietic, maybe bone lineages, have, um, are produced by a potentially a common progenitor, so-called mesenchymal stem cells which had the ability to respond to its local microenvironment and, and respond to these types of differentiation cues and turn into the appropriate type of surrounding tissues. Um, and this was drawn from results in um, most of it, which was uh, generated in vitro um, uh, by which these sorts of mesenchymal stem cells could be induced to turn into tissue types resembling um, various um, relatively diverse uh, tissue types found in organs um, under appropriate inductive conditions. More recently, using single cell techniques, um, you, one could also appreciate that there is many different um, cell types and tremendous uh, molecular and cellular diversity amongst the cell types in the bone marrow. So an important question is uh, how are these different cell types um, related to one another? Um, are they of the same lineage? They interact with each other um, or are they derived from one another? One another? So uh, to address this question, we use this pros uh, technique of prospective isolation using flow cytometry. And we purify different cell types from the bone marrow according to um, differential expression of surface markers. And then we establish an assay to isolate these different populations from um, mouse skeletal tissues, embed them in matrix and transplant them into the renal capsule as a functional readout. So this is just showing the different types of progenitor cells that we have been able to identify from um, GFP mice and then transplant it into non-GFP immunodeficient mice for functional readout. So we've isolated, uh, for instance, GFP blood carrying blood vessel um, progenitor lineages, um, adipocyte lineages, and also um, skeletal lineages, skeletal progenitor lineages that has the capacity to form an ectopic bone when transplanted into the kidney capsule. And if you were to take a cross section of these bones, you can also appreciate that um, they have the ability to recruit um, surrounding vasculature into the uh, newly forming bones. And if you were to uh, take a cross section of these bones, you can also identify a marrow cavity within these bones that contains phenotypic as well as functional hematopoietic stem cells that can reconstitute myeloblated uh, mice for the lifetime of the animal um, and give rise to full multilineage engraftment, including uh, myeloid engraftments. Using this system, you can also um, ablate uh, certain genes important in these processes. And for instance, you can take these skeletal progenitors, transduce them with a lentivirus that overexpress or downregulate um, uh, and a, a gene that's important in this process uh, to evaluate whether or not um, they can repress certain aspects of niche formation. So for instance, here we have knocked down austerics and that led to um, the loss of the ability of these skeletal progenitors to innate, initiate formation of the niche. So working with Mike Longacre, then we then took this assay forward 
to ask whether or not these scalable progenitors are in fact um, multiple types of stem skeletal stem and progenitor lineages, or are they related to one another? One another? And using um, an in vivo lineage tra tracing system developed by um, the Weisman group, um, these rainbow mice, we can determine areas in the bones that give rise to uh, multi skeletal lineage um, formation. So this is a cross section of a rainbow mouse showing in this grow plate area that there are linear um, differently colored clones that encompass areas that stain blue for cartilage and areas that stain yellow for bones. If you were then to micro dissect out this clonal containing region and profile them um, using uh, transcriptional analysis, um, you would be able to identify different surface markers. Um, and we found some of these that allows us to fractionate this growth plate population into multiple um, populations that we then determine the function of by uh, uh, transplantation into the kidney capsule. And we were able to identify eight different types of cells, uh, four of which when transplanted in the kidney give rise to bones, one that gives rise to cartilage, and three that gives rise to bone with marrow through uh, cartilage formation. So we worked out that, that these cells are actually intermediates of one another. Um, they all stem from this self-renewing um, cell type that we term the skeletal stem cells because it has the hallmark characteristics of self-renewal and also its capacity to give rise to these subsequent uh, lineages that differentiate into uh, cartilage, bone, stroma. Now we see also a, a lineage that seems to give rise to tendon. So using this as a, a template system, where we were also able to identify um, cell types uh, cross, corresponding, corresponding to these progenitors in human skeletal tissues. And you know, I, this is just kind of like a very brief overview. Um, this is a very really busy field now, and I just want to highlight um, other investigators who are now determining that there are actually pretty diverse uh, there's a, a high degree of diversity in the skeletal stem cell lineages. There are um, skeletal stem cells that are more primed towards um, giving rise to adipocytes, for instance. Um, and there are um, differences in terms of the skeletal stem cells and their activity, depending on um, where they come from, what type of embryonic tissues, and where they are situated in adults. Um, so just getting back to the utility of working on these lineage relationships, uh, we were able to use this system to identify key extrinsic signals that can control the lineage outcome of these cells and to see how these types of signaling are altered in the context of disease and aging. And so very recently we have found that injury could be used um, or could be induced through a procedure called microfracture. Um, to activate local pools of quiescent skeletal stem cells. And normally these skeletal stem cells in their endogenous environment gives rise to fibrous tissues. Um, but we found that with the appropriate extrinsic guidance, uh, you can turn these, uh, you can skew the path of these skeletal stem cells in the normal injury environment in the cartilage from fibrous tissue towards um, stable um, cartilage tissue. And so that's what's seen here. We induce these um, ectopic okay, Chuck, fractures. Yes. Chuck, I'm sorry. I, th I think we're running out of time. I just wanted to have the opportunity to open questions to the audience before we transition to the next talk. So we have about a minute or so if anyone wants to ask a question to those, towards this particular topic. Thanks. I'll just uh, jump down to the end then. Um, so we've also been using the, the system to look at aging and um, um, with the relationship of the skeletal stem cells with other uh, organs. For instance, we found a novel pathway in the brain that controls skeletal stem cell activity. And, um, and you know, there's also crosstalk amongst the liver. And so, you know, we would like to, um, um, I think what would really aid our studies is new tools for mapping lineage relationship between stem cells and differentiated cell types in vivo and new tools for defining cell-cell interactions in the local micro environments and systemically. So Great. thanks, thanks, Great. and happy to take some questions. Yeah, I, 
I think for the interest of time, um, we'll just try to do one quick question. Um, and I, I can go ahead and go ahead and ask this. Um, so we really talked about like hematopoietic stem cells and they have huge clinical potential. I was wondering if you could just quickly, briefly, next 10 seconds discuss, you know, what can we learn about, you know, fetal liver and their, that niche in supporting hematopoietic stem cell expansion? We can learn tons. Um, fetal liver, as Quinn alluded to, um, certain types of cells, such as the hematopoietic stem cells have ability to migrate. Um, this is not a characteristic that we have seen in the skeletal system now, but the hematopoietic stem cells can migrate from one site to another, from the fetal liver to adults. And I think it would be great if we were able to learn from this process and see how we can also get other stem cell types to migrate uh, systemically and home to the right environments. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Kristen to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Quentin. Um, for our next talk, we're really excited to have Stuart Forbes with us. He is live from the Liver Transplant Service at University of Edinburgh. Hi, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, really exciting to speak here. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Good, <laughs> then I'll begin. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about regenerative medicine for the damaged liver, but to, to, to come at it from a, from a sort of clinical perspective or translational perspective. So conflict of interest, I'm a founder of Resolution Therapeutics, uh, a macrophage cell therapy company. So, um, yeah, a really interesting question came up about why the liver has been, uh, has evolved to be so regenerative. And uh, I've got a completely untestable hypothesis. I think it's the, the plants were trying to poison the dinosaurs. Uh, and I think uh, the dinosaurs whose livers could survive the poisoning where some of it could regenerate uh, were the ones that gave rise to children, uh, uh, baby dinosaurs. So that's my pet theory. So um, the, the, the liver is a beautiful regenerative organ. If we reset- Stuart, can I interrupt you? I'm sorry, for one second. Are you sharing slides? Yeah. Can you I try am. to unshare and reshare because we're not, we hear you and see you, but we don't see your uh, slides. I'm so sorry. Uh, let That's me right, try. take your time. Um, yeah, okay. Fantastic. There we go. Does that work? Yes, indeed. Ah, oh, perfect. So, um, yeah, so we can cut away two thirds of the rat liver or mouse liver, and it will grow back to the same size in 10 days. And um, essentially, uh, if you mark up those cells for proliferation, you can see it really is, occurs in cells throughout the parenchyma uh, in zone one to three, we call it. Um, there is some preferential uh, zonality. Zone two cells probably proliferate more but essentially uh, it can occur anywhere. And it's pretty undramatic, but the, the amazing thing is the liver grows back to the right size. Uh, and the hepatocytes that are normally uh, mitotically quiescent just start to proliferate. Okay, so we, re we rarely take normal livers and um, do this experiment. Sometimes we do, sometimes we, get, we take the husband, part of their liver or the wife and give it to the partner. And, and the nice thing is that both both bits of liver grow back to the right size for each person. So there's something that tells the liver when to stop regenerating as well. The problem is, of course, uh, clinically, we don't really deal with normal livers. We deal with very damaged livers uh, due to alcohol, fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis or, or biliary disease, for example. And this is what happened to uh, the gentleman on the bottom left. His uh, liver was eaten Prometheus says liver was eaten every day by the ego and every night it regenerated. But unfortunately, what then happens is you get scarring, you get cirrhosis and eventually cancer. So even regenerative organs can have that problem. And it, essentially, um, the liver shrink as well. As it becomes cirrhotic, they become smaller. And what has recently become clear is that senescence is a key uh, factor uh, that the hepatocytes uh, stop proliferating with injury um, and, and it's in any injury we're now seeing this and, and you get this shrinking and failure of, of, uh, and the more injury the more senescence 
you do get this ductular response. I hope you can see it at the bottom, um, where you can see uh, these ductular cells that spread out uh, and um, uh, they give you um, uh, their pattern. And I'm just going to get my laser pointer, hopefully. Yeah. And it's been uh, thought that um, in human liver, if you look, as you get cirrhotic, you see these ductular cells spread out and they form what you think are bipotential cells and can regenerate the liver. But that's been very controversial because there's no lineage tracing studies in human liver. So it's just been a, you know, a, a hypothesis or, or, or an observation. And, and the question is, do these ducts really, uh, are they really a backup system or not? In, in mice, it's been controversial and, and some very good lineage tracing studies failed to show any um, regeneration from the ducts into the, into the liver and to, into hepatocytes. But essentially, um, uh, what became clear is if you, if you block regeneration in hepatocytes, uh, here by overexpressing P21, but many other ways have been done to do, you know, to achieve the same thing, uh, then you do get some lineage tracing out of ducts into hepatocytes. And at the same time, those same systems that, that induce senescence model the, 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 the biliary, um, uh, model the kind of liver disease you get in, in humans. And you can just see the video I've just shown of these ducts. If you look at them in, in, in tissue, they spread out like trees with leaves on. Okay, now the mechanisms underlying this is very poorly understood, but I just wanted to highlight a paper from Mary Hirsch who's done some very nice work in this area. And just to show the widespread um, change uh, in the gene expression profile in the ducts as they undergo this regenerative response. And um, equally, the widespread epigenetic changes here on the bottom uh, of all the ducts. So clearly these cells become highly active as they regenerate. Now, uh, one of the key issues I wanted to mention is that the niche determines the outcome of of, of the cells, but also transplanted cells. So um, here's an example of this in, in, from my laboratory where um, in, in one mouse, we can knock out um, MDM2 and that induces senescence in the hepatocytes. And if we keep doing it, it induces necrosis in the hepatocytes, uh, but senescence as well. And that creates a perfect environment for transplanted cells to spread. And these hepatocytes can beautifully repopulate the, the, the recipient liver, unlike the controls. So the niche is very deterministic. And in fact, we, we've even done this to an extreme where we can take a single ductulous cell, expand it and expand it in vitro, uh, and then transplant it into this model and do repeated deletion, repeated deletion and injury. And, and you can regenerate much of the liver from, from, from that single um, uh, cells uh, uh, progeny. So what about human studies? That's a great news, but what, when we get to humans, it's different. In cirrhosis, you've got a very scarred tissue, you've got scarring, um, you've got senescence, and it's like the rocky ground here, if you can see my pointer. And, and hepatocytes transplanted into patients with cirrhosis, we've already done that experiment clinically, it, does, it goes very badly and the patients all die. Unfortunately, in, in, in the cirrhosis, it's not curative. And even if we get beautiful stem cells and make bad sites, I fear that the same thing will occur. It is different in, in metabolic disease, uh, where the niche, if you like, is more receptive. And, and um, we, we, we can find that metabolic disease can be cured by a bad site transplant. But here, you've performing a form of cellular gene therapy, but essentially the niche is more, more um, receptive. And in my final uh, area I wanted to talk about is really in the liver. I, I believe we've got to take an approach to try and reduce scarring and stimulate regeneration and remodel this horrible liver. And, and, and it's been shown that if you um, remove the insult, even from cirrhosis, you get a partial regeneration that's a patient's liver biopsy where they had the hepatitis treated. And if we delete the macrophages during this uh, recovery phase in mice, where we remove the injury, uh, what we find is if we delete the macrophages, um, we don't get this scar resolution. Um, and so macrophages are key for resolving the scar tissue. 
And in fact, even in the epithelial components of regeneration in the damaged liver, macrophages are key. Uh, they, they eat dead cells and upon eating these dead cells, they secrete wince and they pattern the regenerative response. And if we, if we eliminate macrophages, the epithelial response is very different. Because of that finding, I've been very keen to try and develop cell therapies, of, some of which have completely failed, uh, but one we're interested in is developing macrophages. And now we can take out monocytes. That's me having my monocytes removed. Uh, they've been differentiated into regenerative macrophages and infused into mouse models of injury. And, and, and it's nice to see that the scarring goes down, uh, this my fibroblasts are less activated and the liver functions improve, the bilirubin's down and, and et cetera. And so we're now um, doing this in humans with cirrhosis where we take out their monocytes, we differentiate them into you know, macrophages of a regenerative phenotype in inverted commas uh, and reinfusing them. Uh, and we've done this at phase one. And we're now uh, just completing phase two and we're randomizing, hopefully all being well, the last patient tomorrow, uh, which is great. It's been a very long program. And just to show you one piece of data from the, the phase one study, and you can see the MELD score is a, a, a liver score of injury. And if we infuse macrophages into these patients with high MELD scores, it appears that the, the scores seem to go down. Now, you'll know there's no control on here. It's not a true experiment. And that's what the phase two data will hopefully show us. So I'd like to finish uh, on that, and I'd like to obviously acknowledge my team and collaborators uh, around the world, and also my, my uh, uh, funding sources. So in summary, I'd like to, to say that the, um, uh, stop sharing, I'd like to say that the, um, the gap between experimental models and the, and the patients is large, and we need realistic models to, to, to actually validate our data. And, and to make it a, a realistic platform for translation to now stem cell therapies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stuart. So we now have time for Q&A if you wanna type it either in the chat or the Q&A box. So the first question we have is from Ahmad Naban and it's a question about cancer. And I just wanna first say to the audience who's less familiar with the liver field, one thing I find super fascinating about the liver is that despite its remarkable regenerative capacity, spontaneous liver cancer in the absence of chronic injury and cirrhosis is exceedingly rare. So we really only see cancers after years of chronic injury and regeneration. And so Ahmad is asking, um, Stuart, you had mentioned that there's this difficulty in engrafting cells into a cirrhotic liver, but clearly cancer cells have no problem growing in that environment. And so is there anything we can learn about engraftment and how you might do it from these cancer cells that are clearly achieving this? Yeah, I mean, just to say, um, I mean, cancer can rarely occur in, 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 without damage, but you're absolutely right. In the vast majority of times, it, it, it is in, in injury. So that's, I agree there. Um, it, I mean, I think the difference is that the, the cells are, are not um, recirculating. Um, and there's been some weird clinical studies where people have taken out livers and put back cirrhotic livers, but for reasons that are com complicated to explain now. But in that situation, those cancer cells engraft very poorly. Um, so there's something um, about the vascular supply, et cetera, of the liver. I think it, in terms of growing there, I think the situation's ideal for growth. Um, there is uh, obviously a collection of epithelial mutations occur with injury. Um, the, the liver becomes fibrotic and stiff, and we know stiffness promotes proliferation of cancer cells. And as I say, um, local growth, growth factors are activated. Uh, the niche is activated in terms of cancer-associated fibroblasts and cancer-associated macrophages. So it, I think it's a sort of environment that develops over time, um, but you need, a, I believe you need the, the mutations for those cancers to actually take off and grow. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so we have a couple questions now about the role of macrophages, both in sort of um, preventing or enabling regeneration and also in terms of cellular therapeutics. So the first question is from Patrick Barhouse, and he asks, um, 
in addition to the deletion of the inflammatory macrophages, has there been work done investigating the addition of the anti-inflammatory or pro-regenerative M2 phenotype macrophages? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I haven't showed that data, but we, we, we developed that system in the mice, uh, first of all, in both chronic injury uh, and also in um, acute injury, and, and they are different settings. But in acute injury, essentially, the liver, you, you, you get into problems because you've got so much necrosis, maybe three quarters of your liver, which then, if there's not phagocytosed, uh, you get rampant inflammation and organ damage and, and death and sepsis. And so by infusing macrophages, we've shown in, in mice models that we can dampen that down, eat all the dead stuff, and then stimulate regeneration. In the chronic, I think it's a very different setting. And, and I think you are relying on breaking down scar tissue as well as some pro regenerative effects as well. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have done that in the mice. And broadly speaking, M2 polarization seems to be better uh, for, for this situation. And sort of following up on this theme of the macrophages, there have been some questions about what, you know, how is this regenerative phenotype of the macrophages induced? How is it maintained? Are there ways we know we could maintain it for a, a longer time window therapeutically? Yeah, these are very good questions. So, I mean, one, one question I'm, I'm always asked is, is why, why does it fail? We've all got monocytes and macrophages. And essentially, I think if you look at the cirrhotic liver when we, we, when we transplant it, um, there's, you know, we, we, there's a paucity of healthy monocytes and macrophages. Uh, and, and we find that some of the macrophages have eaten very heavily and they, they themselves uh, become inert. Uh, and so by resetting the system, um, uh, you, you know, we're, 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 we're just kind of, um, you know, acting on the, on the niche, essentially. In terms of targeting it with cytokines, yeah, I mean, people have shown uh, CSF1 um, stimulates uh, proliferation of, of the monocytes and macrophages in tissue and can help resolve acute liver injury and stimulate regeneration. So, so the cytokine approach is possible providing you've got enough uh, of your starting material, which in the chronic liver uh, disease we find is not the case, but, but it does work in acute tissue injury uh, where, where you have enough remaining monocytes and macrophages for, for cytokines such as CSF1 to work. Great, thank you so much, Stuart, and to those who submitted questions. So I'm gonna now pass it back to Quentin who will introduce our final speaker for the session. Um, so, for this discussion, we are happy to have the speakers from this session back, but we're also happy to be joined by Icebrand Noos and Joyce Ja, who are speaking in the Emerging Leaders section later this afternoon. So to just start this off, we had met a few days ago to kind of talk about the things we've been speaking about, and I, I don't want to steal too much of Pam's thunder, but the, there, there's a lot of talk of cellular therapies, both after discussing stem cells and the capacity to regenerate, and I know we talked about that earlier. Um, and with that come these sort of two key questions. One is one of scale, which is something we again discussed earlier, but in this case, it's, it's more of a numbers game. So, you know, we can easily go from isolating stem cells and making an organoid that we can transplant into a mouse, but how do we make that, you know, the orders of magnitude bigger than to go into a human? And then also of source. So what cells do we put into this graph that we would ultimately transplant? transplant back into a patient, both in terms of the specific cell type and also the origin. Is it going to be an autologous transfer or an allogenic transfer? Um, and so, Chuck, you had mentioned during your talk the need for tools to better identify the cells we want. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what your dream tool would have for this kind of a purpose. Well, that's a really important question. And, you know, in terms of identifying ways to address the scale issue. Um, I think it would be great if we could determine how to amplify these rare sources of stem cells into appropriate quantities that we can use um, to, for, for realistic trans, um, translational purposes. is actually defining the microenvironments and the niche uh, that these stem cells uh, depend on. 
And also, this also figures into uh, the questions of uh, mentioned by other moderators previously. Um, but how do you um, um, affect uh, translation of stem cell therapies for other tissues, like for instance, the liver and the heart? Um, and how do you facilitate the successful engraftments and integration of these new stem cells? And I think that all depends on formulating uh, methods to determine the niche. So I think um, tools that would be really useful for that are new techniques that can truly determine the uh, temporal spatial characteristics of the stem cells and its microenvironments. Um, and I know there's a, like emerging te techniques uh, for doing some of these, but a lot of them right now still relies on very specialized equipment um, that most laboratories might not have access to. You know, so maybe if it has to be um, um, require these special types of uh, equipment, perhaps there would be like a HHMI funded center for applying these tools um, or for optimizing these tools uh, for investigators. Um, so, you know, new tools for looking at cell-cell interactions in transgenic model organisms, as well as in human tissues, I think would be very helpful. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to follow up on that. I think that's a very interesting point. You know, the issue of kind of scale up and how do we organize tissues and the technologies that are needed to achieve that. So I'm an engineer by training and there are a lot of different techniques that we've been able to, to capture on the micro scale. So for example, supporting human hepatocytes kind of requires stabilization with other cell types. And in the lab, we can create these micro pattern technologies to really control the degree of architecture. Or, you know, there's emerging technologies such as 3D printing where we can create large scale tissues where we can organize vasculature. But yeah, this idea of this continued expansion really building larger tissues is something that we definitely need to, to think about. And also where are the best sites that we can actually implant these tissues? So Stuart, you really mentioned that like a cirrhotic microenvironment, which really controls the stem cell niche, is inhospitable for some of these cell therapies. So, you know, can we think about using ectopic sites as a potential vehicle or, me or mechanism to kind of facilitate regeneration? As the liver does over 500 different functions, we can anticipate, you know, that it can take on the metabolic load and process things within the blood. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So the ultimate... Um ectopic sites, the liver machine. So that's, that's a grand challenge that people have been trying to wrestle with for a time. And, and it's, been, it's been pretty hopeless for a long number of years, but I think there's a convergence of different technologies, including the ability to, to sort of grow cells and keep them in a, you know, a really good state. That means that you know, these liver machines um, may just you know, be, be, be a possibility again. In terms of something nearer the future, there's some very nice work where people are putting hepatocytes into um, uh, into into um, ah sorry my brain's gone blank <laughs> um, in, into into ectopic sites where you know um, into the lymphatics. I'm so sorry, um, and 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 show that the, 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 they can get very good function in the lymphatics because it's a very good niche to grow hepatocytes. I have. Um, a, a slight theoretical concern about that because I don't know if you've ever seen people that have got blocked lymphatics. It's the most terrible, terrible complication you'll ever see. Their legs grow. It's called elephantitism because their legs grow so huge and it's really untreatable, I would say. So I think there are some, you know, although it shows great biological promise uh, and some great people behind it, I do have some concerns about that technology in theory. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Sorry. Different computer, different room, better signal. <laughs> Wonderful. So if it's okay, then Kristen and Quentin, we'll go ahead and return back to um, Pam's presentation, and then we'll come back to about, you know, another 13 minutes of discussion. Um, what I can do is just kind of give you what I consider to be the bottom line, uh, which is that when we talk about bone regeneration, bone is able to regenerate, but the problem is that it just takes so long. And so what our real problem in this area is that we need to speed everything up. I had the title of my presentation was the need for speed. And part of that is that if you're thinking about using 
uh, uh, cells for cell therapy. Uh, if you're using endogenous skeletal stem cells like Chuck talked about, it takes time to grow them. If you're using patient-derived iPS cells, it, it takes time to grow them. Um, and then once you put them into an environment that's uh, very hostile with a lot of inflammation, um, this, many of the cells die. And it takes time for the remaining cells to get a foothold and call in the vasculature. So the vasculature is really critical for speeding up bone regeneration. And I think that uh, um, it would be very interesting to be able to think about how we can do that. Uh, do we mix endothelial cells with our transplanted uh, bone forming cells? Do we try to create a vascularized bone rudiment in a bioreactor and then transplant it into a patient? Um, that is really what, what it will take, I think, to go the next step. We've been able to heal bone defects in mice and rats for decades, um, and that's not a problem. The problem is trying to scale it up and get it done in humans. And some of the uh, uh, hurdles that we have to face is that we have to figure out what, what flavor of skeletal stem cell will do the best job. And it, in vivo, in their natural environment, I believe that each flavor of skeletal stem cell has its own particular role in skeletal metabolism. And so the question is, which one is the best one for regeneration? Um, some of the other hurdles I think are in terms of uh, getting the kind of financial support that we need to do these kinds of very rigorous uh, preclinical studies and then to do uh, rigorous uh, clinical trials that are properly designed. That's not me. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, and the, we also need to uh, be able to engage clinicians that are willing to work with us. And this has been, for me, a major problem. I haven't been able to uh, recruit a surgeon to do my preclinical study in jawbone regeneration. Um, and then the other problem is that uh, we have to uh, really think about what we are doing in terms of the cost. Are we really generating a therapy that could be used by many, many people? Or are we generating a therapy that will just be available to the rich? And I think that that's something we really have to think about in terms of how do we drive the costs down on these kinds of things? I mean, to get a, a clin clinical grade batch of cells uh, in my particular center, it would cost about $10,000 per batch of cells. Now that's not, that's not terrible, um, but it still is not something that you can you know, offer to all of uh, people, the people that need it. So that's kind of my take on things. I'm sorry that I couldn't get my uh, screen sharing to work here, but I, there's a, the Wi-Fi is very bad and it kept giving me this error message. Sorry about that. Yes, can you hear me, Stuart? Yeah. Uh, just as a fellow surgeon, can you comment on the need for uh, hepato, hepatoportal blood flow? Um, as I recall, when you put a liver in an ectomic position, it doesn't have those regenerative medicine qualities. So could you comment on that as the ultimate macro niche? Yeah, so, I mean, flow is, is actually very important. So, I mean, you get too much and you get shear stress. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons you get a thing called small precise syndrome. If you put a small bit of liver in, um, it, it destroys the vascular channels and there's lots of inflammation mediated by rage, among other things. So, so it's getting it just right. If you don't have blood flow, as you rightly point out, and the correct, correct flow, uh, you don't get uh, uh, appropriate regeneration. So it's, it's absolutely correct. And in fact, um, that may be one of the mechanisms how the liver um, uh, regulates its homeostasis, because we, we can show in, in rats and mice that if we give lots of growth factors all at once to the normal liver, it will grow bigger than it should do. But eventually it comes back down. You know, you get this apoptosis of cells and they go back down. And it may be that essentially the epithelial components not being sufficiently um, served by the vascular channels. Um, I, I can't prove, or I, I haven't proven that, but it, it would seem to be a plausible hypothesis from a number of 
different studies and, and, and observations. It's interesting. Thank you. Pam and Quentin, I, Pam, I know a big theme that you shared with us was this need for speed and this idea that there's simply too much that these cells that we may transplant need to do to get to functionality. And that time is too long than the host can tolerate. And so one of the things you mentioned was vasculature and perhaps the idea that if we could vascularize these structures from day one in our hands and transplant that in, that would overcome one of those uh, temporal barriers. And so I'd be curious from your perspective as a biologist, what we really need. And then Quinton, as an engineer, what are the promising approaches? Where do you think the best um, paths are to get this live? So there are people that have been trying to transduce uh, bone forming cells to produce higher levels of VEGF to call in the vasculature. And um, I don't know that that has been terribly successful. Um, there was a question in the Q&A about what about heterotopic ossification, you know, which occurs pretty quickly. And um, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, HO is dystrophic calcification, which is the chemical precipitation of calcium and phosphate. And then when there, it is true bone, it does grow uh, faster, but it's still not that fast. But there are people that are studying a disease called uh, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is a mutation in, in ALK2 as a way to perhaps get a better handle on uh, getting uh, faster bone formation. But the faster the bone, the poorer the mineralization. So it could be weak bone, so it might not be useful. Um, but in terms of something Quinton said, uh, there are people that have taken bone forming cells and put them in a cage surrounding a vascular bed. There was a patient in Germany who had a, a jaw tumor removed and they grew a new jaw in his shoulder and then moved it to his jaw with the intact vascularization. I think that would be a little uncomfortable, but you know, it certainly uh, it could be done. The patient died, unfortunately, of the cancer but um, it, he did have a functioning jaw for a, a number of years. Yeah, and I, I really like that example because it really highlights the need for us to build in vitro model systems that allow us to take cells in kind of a controlled environment and ensure that they remain functional. I think a promising approach is deriving vascular cells from pluripotent stem cells where we can rapidly produce these you know, essential populations that can help regenerate many different tissues. Like all of our tissues are, you know, nearly within 100, you know, microns from a capillary bed. So there are many different techniques that are necessary to explore that. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is this idea of really recapitulating shear threats. So this idea that you need to create these perfusible devices and engineered systems to really get those stem cell derived vascular cells to mature in a way that we need them to do. So I think, you know, that is one important approach and really highlights you know, the importance of modeling the niche in which these cells reside. And, you know, one of the most important niches are the mechanical cues that are present. So being able to reproduce that. So, you know, from an engineering perspective, I think we're really able to make large vascular structures, but I think it's really important for us to understand how we can start self-assembling some of the smaller capillary structures. So that's one of the, the kind of approaches that are necessary from an engineering perspective. Um, so I think, you know, there's several questions about, you know, the, the niche and the stem cell microenvironment. So Pam, can you just quickly discuss a little bit about, you know, the bone injury microenvironment and how that compares to other tissue microenvironment? Right. Um, well, in, in terms of bone injury, um, it's the periosteum that is the most reactive and it actually forms the fracture callus. And so uh, there are a number of studies showing, you know, growth factors and cytokines that are released from cells that are, that are in the uh, hematoma as being uh, influential in getting that uh, fracture callus established. And in addition to that, there's mechanical forces that uh, influence the cells to become activated uh, and to start to uh, replicate and form, form the callus. Um, I think Chuck probably has uh, more insight into the periosteum than, than I do. Great. 
And I, I kind of want to just to transition a little bit and bring up kind of a common theme that I think about is that, you know, we've been able to successfully demonstrate the regenerative potential in animal models. So for example, with the liver, there's like a human tyrosinemia where we can implant hepatocytes and, you know, we can fully regenerate the, the liver. How do, how do we translate some of these animal models to human systems? So I'm very interested in taking, you know, human stem cell populations and modeling the, the diseases. So, you know, what can we do as a field to start translating the differences between regeneration and animal models and really studying it in a human relevant system? Could I um, chip in on that, please? Um, I think it's a key question, and I think we need to be realistic as a field. Um, so, you know, some very exciting, lacking experiments. I mean, I've shown you one with a single cell, uh, you know, how, how it can be expanded and then transplanted. It's visually very striking, but it doesn't replicate the, the, the clinical situation. Um, we, we moved um, a few years ago, I decided I was basically not going to study normal liver in terms of regeneration. And so I, I gave up doing that about 20 years ago. So I only study severely damaged liver, really. And in fact, one of the ways we, we found that regenerative pathways is, is by inducing senescence in animals um, genetically and, and then doing injury and looking at the regenerative responses because you know, a lot of our patients are old uh, and with severe injury, you get, you get um, epithelial senescence, but, but also um, non-parenchymal cells can become senescent. So that's something that, that's really helped us uh, a lot in terms of getting the pathobiology uh, and the signaling pathways, if you like, um, to, to, to replicate more, more faithfully the human uh, tissue situation. So that, that's, and I think, um, it will pay off in the long term, my belief, because you'll have less failures. So, you know, um, you know, the re more realistic you are in your, in your, in your preclinical development and, and your trials, the less likely you are to fail with drugs and the less likely you are to fail with advanced therapies, including cell or cell or stem cell therapies, I think. Um, if I can add a few words in terms of the skeletal system, We've had some luck xenografting intact fetal human limbs into um, immunodeficient mice. And you know, we observed that the skeletal stem cells could be activated by injury in these systems. And under the influence of exogenous factors, they could then be guided towards forming either bones or cartilage. Um, so that is one way using these xenograft systems. Um, in terms of addressing the scalability and the tissue forming speed, um, a curious thing about the xenograft system too is that the xenograft human limbs actually has a memory of the size of the tissues that they're supposed to form. So that you don't actually conform to the size of mouse limbs, but you would have these, this large, uh, relatively large uh, human finger growing on the back of this mouse that would be larger than um, equivalent mouse phalanges or even like a mouse femur. Um, so by looking at differences between the stem cells of different species, for instance, uh, perhaps in utero also versus adults in terms of aging, you may get a sense of what controls the rates of stem cell expansion um, because they do vary in terms of development and across species. It's interesting. And I think it, I mean, that's a really fascinating system. And I think it, there's a sort of ever present question in my mind is what's the better path to go down? Do we try to build the best ex vivo system we can, where we can really bring in every cell type is of human origin, or do we try to humanize the mouse as much as possible, knowing full well that there's going to be some cross species interactions. And I, I don't know, it, I, there probably isn't a, a correct answer here, but um and maybe we need both and just and just see where they shake out. I just wanted to make a comment about um, sort of why it, it, this, this discussion really reminds me of we can cure cancer in mice 100 times over, but not in humans, right? And it's the same thing. We can regenerate things in mice a lot better than humans. And that may be because of scale and inherent genetic differences. 
But one element that I think we need to consider is our exposure to the external environment and what that means for modeling in mice. We use squeaky clean mice that stay in filtered air facilities. And I think that's a big component that needs to be considered when we think about regeneration or just animal models in general. So I just, you know, would love your thoughts on that. I mean, I completely agree with what you said. I've thought about this all the time in terms of liver. I mean, we see very low turnover of hepatocytes in mice and that has led us to you know, claim as a field that hepatocytes are quiescent. There's very, very low turnover. Obviously there's some endogenous homeostasis, but these mice are eating autoclave chow every day of their lives. They're not going out to the bar. They're not taking a Tylenol for the headache after. And so, I mean, we could, we could do that to them, right? We could try to better mimic the human exposures, but I absolutely agree. I think the physiology could, could, could be completely um, unrealistic in some cases. And it's just a question of how, how much, what is that Delta? Yeah, I mean, um, there are tissue banks of human liver where, where patients have uh, unfortunately succumbed to other uh, conditions. And, and we see that those, human livers do have very low levels of, of uh, quiescence, uh, which is not too dissimilar from, from, a, from a, an adult mouse. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, a couple percent approximately. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with the sentiment. And, and you know, the diet uh, will do many, many things, you know, uh, in terms of inflammation, the microbiome, et cetera. So completely agree with you on that. Yeah, and this kind of just reminds me from some of the discussions um, about, you know, cell therapies and what are the kind of next things that we need to think about. And one of them is like patients will need to be on immunosuppressants for the rest of their life. So I just wanted to point the question to Pam, you know, what is the idea of like using stem cells, you know, as a regenerative uh, medicine tool and kind of the thoughts of maybe reprogramming the stem cells so that they can be immune shielded? Yeah, well, um, for those of you that heard uh, Yamanaka, the ISSCR, he is in the process of knocking out MHC1 and 2 uh, to generate lines that would be universal donors for the Japanese population. Now, uh, that would be very challenging for uh, you know very diverse uh, populations, but it's something to think about, I think, but Stuart has some thoughts about that as well. Um, I, I, I think that um, in terms of what we need to do until we can get to that point is that we have to use autologous because um, even though uh, stem cells may show some sort of immune privilege, as soon as they differentiate, they start expressing histocompatibility antigens and they will be rejected. And we've, we've done this in mice several times by mistake, but it was very informative that, you know, that the cells would be rejected. So um, it would be nice to have uh, IPS cells for every person that would need them down the road. But as I said, it's a, it's a time game that, you know, can you reprogram them and differentiate them in a timely fashion so that they are actually are a benefit. I think controlling the immune system is going to be key, not merely because there are species such as there are very, uh, cell types such as macrophages and monocytes that helps facilitate the integration um, and the regenerative processes, um, but also in terms of mediating um, rejection in terms of uh, allogeneic transplants. Um, another approach is that I think are being tried is to engineer the hematopoietic stem cells and to engraft the patients with um, donor-derived hematopoietic stem cells to facilitate the polarization. Um, also, um, coming up, for instance, with um, a kind of like a universal uh, tissue source that could be iPSC or ESL generated that produces both the hematopoietic stem cells and also the more tissue-specific uh, lineages. in a less toxic manner. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for this really nice discussion spanning a bunch of different topics and disciplines. Um, I think we'll 
pass the baton back to Janine and wrap up this session then. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Um, in spite of the, the technical difficulties, I thought that was a great session. Pam, we really appreciate you hanging in there and, and Sorry about <laughs> that. your presentation. And um, no, it was wonderful. Thank you. And so right now we will take about a 10 minute break and we will resume with session four at 225 Eastern. All right, everybody. Welcome back to session four. Um, I am very pleased to introduce the discussion leaders for this session, um, and they are Mansi Srivastava from Harvard and Nipam Patel from MBL. So over to you guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks again to the organizers for putting together this wonderful set of sessions, and we'll move on to our next session, which is Regeneration in Model Organisms. And our first speaker is Ken Poss from Duke University. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here and um, noticing in this session that um, it is Eli Tanaka and Alejandro and I, uh, I should just mention that there's been many times we've been the fish, flatworm and salamander person in a regeneration session, but it's been a while. So um, this is a real treat. And I think that the, the three of us, um, as well as Nipam and uh, Manzi, all appreciate model systems and the idea that more is better. And, and I, I just wanted to mention a new society that's developing over the past year, the International Society for Regenerative Biology, which celebrates uh, the diversity of model systems for regeneration and diversity of scientists exploring them. And uh, it's my mission is to get people together studying regeneration from different perspectives and different tissues and, and species. So I'm excited about uh, about this and talking big questions and regeneration together. That um, is the task uh, that uh, we've had. And I think while all of us uh, can have a list of what the big questions in regeneration are or the next ones, uh, I think it's important to point out uh, that regeneration is a very complex, um, challenging, um, even alien process. And uh, it's quite possible and likely uh, that we don't even know uh, what the biggest questions are just yet. And um, which means we need exploratory approaches, probing approaches, uh, not only to answer the big questions, but also to find new questions. And I think model systems like zebrafish uh, are great for this, um, to give some of the benefits very quickly. It's a large community, hundreds, many hundreds of labs, very inclusive. Um, the tools one can use in zebrafish are outstanding and, and still evolving. Uh, one trainee can generate 20, 30, 40 transgenic or, or mutant strains for their projects. So cost is not as prohibitive as uh, with other models. And of course, uh, these guys can regenerate really well. And it's been known for centuries that uh, fish regenerate fins. Uh, they can also, um, in the case of zebrafish, regenerate a full transection uh, of the spinal, spinal cord, um, reversing a paralyzing injury by forming a tissue bridge, as you see here in the middle. And then on the right there, one of the very early uh, models for successful heart regeneration, I think Eric Olson would admit this looks like more than a millimeter here, uh, but I, I think we know as much about uh, heart regeneration in, in zebrafish as we do uh, in, in any system. So, so great for uh, regeneration. And, and so this uh, ability to, to make all these animals and, and go at regeneration uh, with an unbiased screening approach um, uh, ha has, has benefits. And, and I, I could go on for a while, but I just like, like to point out uh, some recent studies which, which, which show uh, how uh, the ability to make more mutants or transgenics uh, than you need can, uh, can uh, lead to serendipitous results, unexpected results. Um, for instance, a, a few months ago, uh, there was this, I think, important paper published by Kazu Kikuchi's lab where um, they explored the function of KLF1 
uh, in heart regeneration. And as I understand, this originally was meant to be a control uh, expressing this factor in cardiomyocytes uh, as, a, as a means to control for uh, setting, setting its original function in the hemopoietic hemo, uh, system uh, during heart regeneration. But it turns out it has one of the, the strongest effects on stimulating cardiomyocyte division of, of anything we've seen. And uh, you can see here, even in an adult uh, zebrafish, inducing expression of this factor can lead to uh, extensive cardiomyocyte division and expansion of the heart. Uh, similarly, um, studies started in my lab some years ago by Mesa Mokalad, who now has her own lab at Wash U. Connective tissue growth factor came up as a candidate factor for mediating spinal cord regeneration in zebrafish. Um, one would uh, tend to think that this was a pro-scarring factor, given the name and history. But after generating some tools, Mesa saw that this highlighted a bridging population of glial cells during regeneration in zebrafish, you can see here in green, and in fact was instructive and pro-regenerative during the process. And she has, in a very nice paper from her own lab recently, gone on to purify those bridging cells expressing this factor and, and find extensions uh, to, that, to that mechanism. Now, if um, uh, I, mean, I think there are many challenges to um, studying regeneration, I'm, I'm, I tend to cover a, a number of tissues, but I think one of the most exciting things to, uh, to look forward to in terms of innate regeneration is simply looking at regeneration at higher resolution. And what I mean by that is being able to capture all of the events, both cellular and subcellular, in all of the cells that are participating in regeneration, at least uh, as a goal. But there, there, there are many things we need to do uh, before we can get there. Um, heart regeneration is particularly challenging because we're talking about a beating organ inside an animal that's swimming uh, in water. So uh, live imaging that uh, can be difficult. Uh, I show here an image from uh, Jinhu Wang and Jingli Tao, who have their own labs now. Um, but they established methods which are promising for ex vivo uh, adaptation uh, of heart regeneration, in this case, showing how the epicardial layer of the heart undergoes regeneration. And some interesting cellular events that you need to see uh, by imaging, in this case, how the cells at the leading edge of the epicardium during regeneration form large polyploid cells. Uh, and they're studying that in their own labs now. Uh, when you think about the outside of the animal, like the skin, it may get a little easier, although there are still challenges. And I'd just like to highlight the work of Chen Wei Chen, who uh, is at Academia Sinica in, uh, in Taiwan. And he's mastered techniques for making uh, rainbow-based systems to mark individ individual cells, in this case, uh, the skin, and that allows you to take the animal in and out of water and still follow uh, individual cells in, in fields of hundreds uh, or thousands. So I think there's, there's great promise for these types of techniques. Uh, what I'd like to uh, finish with is just emphasizing the importance of people with different backgrounds and expertise getting together. And in my case, this has recently been uh, with Stefano D'Italia, who's a uh, comes from a physics background and has expertise in studying cell cycle dynamics. And he and I have worked together now on many projects, but our core project was to try to find a system in which we could map and analyze and quantify behaviors uh, of all cells participating in regeneration, at, at least of a, a certain cell type. And we chose regenerating scales largely because they're accessible, these are the bony plates of zebrafish. Uh, when they're plucked off of the animal, they begin to regenerate very quickly and a lot of the activity is done within a week or so. A big challenge here is imaging this, again, in an aquatic animal. And Ben Cox was the first student we co-mentored and he modified ways so that uh, he could uh, achieve full 24 hour imaging runs in an anesthetized, immobilized, but still alive and regenerating zebrafish, as shown here in this image. And Ben uh, came up with many movies through generation of, of different reporters. I just show you one of the simplest ones, 
so you get an idea of the platform. And that is as a scale regenerates and one visualizes the osteoblasts, these are the bone depositing cells. Here you can see how just a day long image can capture uh, uh, really every event that's happening to um, all of these osteoblasts during regeneration. That's its movement, division, where they divide and in what plane, uh, how they align with each other as well as the death events. And so having this initial study got us uh, got us excited about this platform. And so then very, very recently, Alessandro de Simone, who's uh, in the position of deciding between great jobs uh, in Europe, uh, wanted to take this to the level of subcellular uh, um, visualization. And so he chose ERK signaling because many growth factors go uh, into the ERK pathway. And uh, without going into too many of the details here, there are great sensors being developed and evolving to quantify the levels of different kinases like ERK. Here in scale osteoblast, you can see that if the fluorescent sensor re is retained in the nucleus, there's generally low ERK activity. If it's shoved out of the nucleus, it achieves these ghosts. And then imaging can uh, turn this into heat maps with relative levels of ERK signaling. And if, if you remember anything from this talk, I just wanna show uh, this video of uh, one of the results of this study where one looks at, Alessandro looks at one scale undergoing regeneration where he's able to quantify levels of ERK. And we saw something, again, uh, we never would have expected um, given what we knew about regeneration, but that is during scale regeneration, regeneration of this tissue, the ERK wave travels in waves. There are six or seven waves. They start in the middle of this pool of osteoblasts and they emanate out and repeat um, again about six or seven times. And with each propagation of this wave through a population of osteoblasts, uh, is, uh, it's correlated with a burst of growth. And we, we think this is a, a, a new way that, that could be uh, generalizable for controlling growth during regeneration. And we think that these types of sensors as well as transcriptional reporters are a big target uh, for the field uh, to improve on them uh, along with imaging platforms so uh, that we can look at regeneration in, in bigger uh, and in better ways. And I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, Ken. So we've got a couple of questions here. So Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz asks, are the polyploid cells seen at the leading edge of the recovering zone produced by cell-cell fusion or by impeded cytokinesis? Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. What happens there um, is that um, one can look at different indicators and uh, inferences to see that there's, there's more tension there at the leading edge. And so we see cytokinesis um, going through, uh, we see cell division going through the motion, but the block is at cytokinesis. Just um, following that leading edge of cells is normal productive cell division. It's, and it's those two events, both the cell division as, as well as the larger polyploid cells that are, that are part of, of this regenerative event of, of, the, of the epicardium there. Okay, another question that came in is, do you have any indication of what p erk is activating downstream? What ERK is activating uh, downstream? Um, now, we, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of questions with those uh, initial observations. Um, uh, and one is, you know, what's the source? What's the ligand source? So that we, we think FGFs are involved and how is that controlled in a way to provoke um, waves like these? As, as well as, as, as what, what ERK is, is, is doing. And we, we know it's affiliated with growth bursts of osteoblasts, but how, how it's controlling um, that growth is not clear yet. Okay, another question. This is probably one that all of you will get in this section session is, is uh, how much do you think we can translate these findings to humans? Yeah, that's, I mean, I. I generally think that um, if, if you want to translate regeneration, you have to know how it happens in, and, and knowing how it happens in any animal is, is, a, is a big boost. I think um, some fields uh, and some tissues are, are further along and closer. I think you know, the field of zebrafish heart regeneration has directly influenced 
uh, the establishment of, of model system uh, of heart regeneration, model systems of heart regeneration in, in mammals like neonatal mice. And a lot of the, the mechanisms there are shared. Um, for other systems, uh, we, we, we don't know that uh, spinal cord and regeneration, uh, spinal cord regeneration, zebrafish, I think also will have some similarities uh, uh, as well as some, some differences. You know, the goal of some of us is, is, is simply to, to um, you know, and the passion of some of us is, is simply to, to figure out how it works and, and you know, and hope that um, others pick up on this and it, and it influences, you know, those trying to translate. But I, I think the record for that is, you know, is, is looking good. Maybe I'll ask one final question here too. So, you know, the, it, it's clear that the advances made that you and others have made with live imaging is really useful for understanding you know, the events of regeneration. So what one or two technical advances would you most like to see for your system to be able to push that further? Well, I, I mean, the, the continued evolution of, of sensors and reporters transcription uh, I mean, so at a tools level, we rely heavily on, on molecular engineers who are pushing that first in vitro uh, so that we can, we can take them in the zebrafish as soon as we can. And then the, the, the imaging, be, being able to uh, dig into these tissues, um, image multiple sensors at once, um, get past kind of the burden of, of you know, a life support system for an adult zebrafish. Again, the biggest advantage here is that regeneration is is robust. It's it's fast, and um, uh, and you know we 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 can we can make a lot of strains. But um, you know some of the barriers are, are are what I mentioned there that 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 um, you know that that need to to happen concurrently. Great, thanks. So I think we'll move on to the next speaker. So our next speaker is Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado from the HHMI and Sowers Institute for Medical Research. Thank you very much, Nipam, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, like Ken, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share with you some of um, the thinking that uh, we are doing uh, with regards to the problem of regeneration. So I'm gonna to try to cover three general topics uh, when it comes to the problem of regeneration. And um, they are as, as follows. Uh, the first one is what's conserved and what's not. I think this is at the heart of being able to understand uh, what makes regeneration tick. And as you all know, regeneration is broadly but unevenly distributed across the animal kingdom. And it's not entirely clear to us why that may be the case. Uh, the second topic I'd I like to touch uh, upon is um, the fact that we are working with an adult uh, problem. Regeneration. Alejandro, I'm yes. sorry, can I interrupt for a second? Are you, um, are, are we supposed to be seeing something on your slides? Oh yeah, you're supposed to. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you try resharing one more time? Absolutely. Let me get out of this and uh, reshare again. There Can you go. see something now? Yes, there we go. Cis regulation. Very good. Sorry, good. my apologies. You didn't miss much. No uh, problem. Yeah, you didn't miss much. I'm just going to go back to the questions that I want to uh, cover today. So what's concerned, what's not concerned? Um, we are working with an adult system. So I think we need to question accepted developmental concepts. They were derived primarily from embryonic context. And I think that's actually uh, inhibiting some of our thinking with regards to how these temporal transformations may actually be taking place not in an embryo, but in an adult uh, uh, system, which is quite different. And then finally, this whole thing about using models versus non-model organisms is actually really, really inhibiting our ability, not just to ask interesting questions of regeneration, which as Ken just said, we don't even know what those may be, but also to uh, facilitate the introduction of new experimental paradigms into the uh, current fields of uh, the life sciences. And I'm gonna make the case that uh, instead of calling them model organisms, like we're doing in this session, that we refer to animals as research organisms, or even plants as research organisms. All animals are models of something. And the reason why we have model organisms is because they were arbitrarily selected to do something for us scientists that were asking specific questions of them. So I think it's, a, it's an artificial sociological construct that is really inhibiting our way of thinking about these problems, especially when we have very little mechanistic information 
about what may be happening. So what's concerned and what's not? So I'm gonna use as an example of how little we understand uh, uh, regeneration as a whole uh, by focusing on cis regulation. Uh, we all know that the genomes of multiple species are highly conserved. Uh, the, uh, the coding genes are conserved. Uh, there's great degree of homology and orthology among them. But how these genes, these very similar genes are deployed in time and in space to give rise to form and function remains, in my opinion, a, a profound mystery uh, in yielding complexity in biological processes. So let's think about cis regulation from the vantage point of the differences between humans and mice. And so evolutionarily speaking, we all accept the fact that uh, mammals have a common origin and that uh, mice and humans may have diverged from each other about 80 million years ago. So I think it's fair to ask how much cis regulation divergence may have occurred between mouse and, and humans, for example. And so there was a paper that was published in 2014 by Viestra et al, where they actually focused on trying to identify um, the uh, sites of uh, DNAs, uh, uh, DNAs one hypersensitive sites in the mouse genome uh, that are normally associated with the specific configurations and activities of those genomes in specific cells and types and just map them. And so they did this, they identified about 70,000 or so such sites. And then they realized, and as people have uh, shown before, but uh, they, they really show very clearly that a lot of these sites were specific to either cell types or tissue types. And so here's a couple of uh, examples in diagrammatic form. Tissue A uh, is, a, is, a, is a shared um, uh, DNA, uh, one hypersensitive site between tissue A and tissue B in the middle. But tissue B has two new sites in the same region of the genome. And this may explain why a particular gene may or may not be expressed in a particular context in a particular tissue type. Um, when they extended this uh, to the human condition, what they found is that yes, some of these sites are conserved, but not all of them are conserved. In fact, uh, tissue uh, B and tissue B from both mice and humans share the same DHS site, uh, but however, tissue B in human lost uh, this uh, second and third site, and tissue A in humans gained the third site that was part of tissue B in mice. Uh, these numbers are really remarkable because it shows that at least 42% of all the DHS uh, sites in mice have no sequence homology in humans, suggesting that they are really species specific. About 24% of them uh, that were active in, in mice were not hypersensitive sites in humans, and only about 36% of the hypersensitive sites uh, were, were present in humans as well. If you slice that even further, what you realize uh, readily is that about 13% of all of these hypersensitive sites in, uh, that were shared between mouse and humans, about 13% of them were repurposed. In other words, they were deployed in different tissues and different genes in different developmental contexts. So already after 80 million years of evolution, we see this dramatic uh, 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 divergence in, in, in activities of, uh, of cis regulation between this, uh, a group of animals that share common ancestry. If we now go to zebrafish, which is an animal that can regenerate, which is one of the reasons why we love this system, uh, is 435 million years of evolutionary distance. So the question, of course, is how much this regulation divergence may have occurred between uh, the, the uh, radiation of this vertebrate lineage from teleos all the way up uh, to mammals. And the suspicion is that this is actually going to be a fairly uh, 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 large uh, number. So one way to test this would be to actually compare two systems that can regenerate, that share common ancestry, and then ask the question, do they regenerate the same? So you can do this by selecting two species of fish that have evolved uh, separately and differently from each other under very different uh, 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 selection pressure. And here's the, um, the African killifish, uh, 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 Norosalmus uh, uh, cruzeri, and here's a uh, uh, zebrafish. So the question we can ask is, when they do regenerate, do they regenerate the same way? Or has this evolutionary distance also introduced changes in cis regulation of the genes that drive uh, re the regenerative process in planarian, so, uh, sorry, in the fish? So how much divergence has occurred in the regeneration response? And being able to define this, uh, this comparison will allow to identify species specific responses, which may be very important for the fish, but may not be very important for us to understand what is and what is not conserved. And then of course, uncover the things that may be conserved in this fish are, that may likely be conserved also in vertebrates. And now we can ask the question, if they're conserving vertebrates, why do these fish regenerate and why other vertebrates cannot? So that will be one methodological approach to this. So we did that experiment and uh, this was published uh, in Science uh, last year. It was work done by Wei Wang uh, when he was supposed to be in the lab. He has his own lab right now at the uh, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. But here's the, uh, the, the summary of the paper. We looked at regeneration at the very early stages, about one day post amputation of the tail. 
And out of thousands of differentially gene expressions that were detected and corresponding epigenetic marks, we only found about 50 shared transcriptional changes with the corresponding epigenetic marks between these two fish species, suggesting that the brunt of the response in killifish and the brunt of the response in zebrafish are not conserved. They're important to the species, but they were not conserved. Only a very small segment of the Venn diagram was really conserved between the two species. And so this would be prime candidates to try to understand what they may or may not do uh, in other species where you know, regeneration is absent. Here's an example of what such an enhancer looks like. This is the inhibitor enhancer that was found in both, uh, um, uh, in both tilios, and it seems to be fairly specific to regeneration in both tails, which is right here on the left, and heart regeneration of the killifish, which also regenerates its heart right here in the right. So we look for these enhancers in mammals. We found them in mice, thanks to the work of Eric Olson, uh, this particular location in the mouse genome underwent a transversion, but we were able with the work that uh, they published in PNAS to identify that this enhancer was present uh, and activated the neonate heart regeneration. And we also found a corresponding uh, region in humans. And so what we find is that when we take the mouse and the human enhancers into the killer fish, what happens is that it responds to injury, but it does not respond to regeneration. So these are now physical entities that we can really begin to compare to each other to try to understand mechanistically what the difference may be. So we're postulating the following hypothesis. We think that the separation of wound response and, and regeneration response, these are really artificial separations. It may very well have been that the ancestral state of all animals was to not distinguish between injury and regeneration. That anything that uh, damaged the animal was perceived as one thing, repair, replace, and restore just the whole thing uh, together. And as time went by, this particular enhancers to you know, repurposing like we saw for the uh, uh, DNA's uh, hypermethylation sites may have actually modified these non-coding regions and cis-regulatory elements that resulted in a separation of these functions, such that in fish, uh, this particular enhancer can actually respond to both injury and regeneration, whereas in humans, these particular enhancers may have lost the ability to respond to regeneration, but still respond to injury. This is an eminently testable hypothesis, and it's one that we would like to pursue uh, further. So in the last few seconds, um, I just wanna uh, um, uh, bring you to the attention to the following fact, which I think in the, in the several years I've been working on regeneration have really caused me a great deal of uh, headaches, which is to try to extrapolate what we learned from embryonic developmental biology into regeneration. And so concepts associated with the stem cell models, body and organ segmentation, terminal differentiation, all of these things need to be requested. Every single one of them needs to be requested. Uh, they, they cannot be extrapolated directly from an embryonic context into the adult, the adult context and expect that it's going to explain what we're seeing in the adult context. Some may, but in my experience, most of them has, have come very short at explaining this. I'll give you an example from planarians, uh, which is the, the concept of terminal differentiation, which is the starting point for regeneration. You, know, you have a hand, you amputate, it's supposed to be terminally differentiated, you're supposed to regenerate it, we can't, Salamanders can. So, what does terminal differentiation actually mean in a regeneration context in an adult? So, we did this through a transcriptomic analysis. Uh, we wanted to know what the uh, transcriptional changes would be uh, in the post mitotic differentiated cells of planarians and identify uh, out of 300,000 uh, um, uh, cells a number of uh, wound induced transcriptional states. And so, here's an example. There's one particular uh, molecule that we know is absolutely necessary for setting up the polarity of the regenerating structure is known, but what we see immediately is that not every muscle cell, which is where, where this gene is expressed, expresses the gene, and it's not always. It's a very small subset of cells at a very short and very well-defined uh, period of time. This turned out to be true for all other germ layer derivatives, so we're referring to these uh, particular states as transient regeneration activating cell states. And this is true for not just muscle, which drives polarity. The expression is very early on in a subset of cells, we see that also in the epidermis, uh, uh, these, these transient states are, are manifesting in these cells as well, as well as in, in, as in endodermal tissues, such as the gut, where these genes appear to be regulating, uh, uh, or these states appear to be regulating the stem cell maintenance and tissue remodeling. Uh, this is the work of uh, a very talented postdoctoral uh, trainee in the lab, uh, Blair Bainham Pyle, who's going to be starting her own lab at, uh, at Baylor College of Medicine uh, sometime early next year. So I'm going to end uh, by uh, just uh, uh, telling you that perhaps we should modify the term terminal differentiation to a stable differentiation. If a much more specific way, perhaps, to think about this problem, if it were terminally differentiated, there's no way it could conceivably reintegrate into regeneration. 
And with that, I am going to end um, by thanking the people that make all of this work uh, possible. Uh, these are the prior, uh, prior members of my lab, as well as present members of research organisms that we're using uh, to study this generation. And I'm going to stop here and take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Alejandra. So there's a question here. One teleological reason to separate injury response from regeneration is because regeneration may need to be regulated to prevent cancer. Any thoughts or evidence that the separation of regeneration from response to injury is a cancer in a cancer context? Yeah, it is, it is an, a long-standing hypothesis that that may be the case. There are some papers have been written and hypothesis have been put forward and, uh, you know, cancer is a, is a, is a wound that doesn't heal. Uh, I mean, th th this has been in the, in the, um, in the radar of, of many thinkers and many experimentalists in regeneration, but it's one of many possible, you know, uh, um, contexts. Uh, I heard at one point at a meeting, uh, Elliot and Aka saying that perhaps, you know, the reason why, uh, you know, we lost regeneration is such that we could gain intelligence. And so that's an <laughs> equally, equally viable hypothesis, right? And so that's the difficulty is that teleologically speaking, it's going to be very difficult to understand uh, what regenerations, uh, um, you know, loss or gains may be if we really don't have a clear understanding of, you know, what its uh, mechanistic and cellular underpinnings may or may not be. Uh, and I really believe we're at the infancy of understanding those processes at that level of, of granularity. Great, let me just ask one more quick question, hopefully. So do you think there's a neonate specific epigenetic state that allows us to, as you say, implement both injury and regenerative programs governing specific regulatory elements and that by aging, we lose these epigenetic states? Yeah, no, that is a really good question. That's probably gonna be part of the answer. But I also think that we have to invoke uh, the secret life of proteins. A lot of these, um, you know, uh, putative enhancers and enhancers once tested uh, through transgenesis or deletion, for example, um, what binds to these enhancers are really not just single proteins, they're complex of proteins. And it is known, for example, this complex of proteins can change in composition depending on the biological context and the demands of the cells that are going to deploy the activity of that gene. So in the case of the enhancers that we found, the common denominator for all 50 of them, they all have AP1 binding sites. This, is, uh, uh, this complex is uh, ancient. It's present from yeast to humans, and we know that its composition varies significantly, depending on whether it's, have, it's uh, during embryogenesis, uh, during injury, uh, during disease, uh, during metabolic acceleration, it just changes quite a bit. So I think to gain a really good picture of why, why the context is, um, uh, uh, is uh, important in understanding this process, not only do you have to understand the enhancers and the epigenetic marks, you're also gonna have to understand biochemically what is it that's binding to those enhancers. And that's just in cis. Trans, forget about it. We're not even close. That's just in cis, okay? Yeah. Great, thanks. I think in the interest of time, we should go ahead and move on. Um, so I think Monsi's gonna take over now. Great, thank you, Nipam, um, and thanks, Alejandro. So it is my great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Tanaka, who's at the Research for Pathology in Vienna. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Because uh, I hope my internet connection's okay. If it goes bad, please let me know, uh, because I could switch my... Uh, Wi-Fi. Anyway, so I'm going to uh, talk about limb regeneration, but actually get started with another, um, let's say, um, inspirational example of man changing their capabilities. Okay, so in 1889, Otto Lilienthal was studying uh, actually how uh, storks fly because he wanted to fly. And so here's a situation where man's trying to learn from nature. Then he engineered wings where he tried to fly and unfortunately he made some mistakes in calculation and didn't make it. Uh, then uh, the Wright brothers, of course, then started making gliders. And then this is already, this is only 1902. And then of course, by uh, 1919, you know, men are flying uh, thousands of miles across the ocean. And uh, so I, I think the other theme about this uh, along with Ken and, and Alejandro is, we may not know the form in which uh, our endeavors are going to take us when we come to success uh, in trying to improve the human condition. So uh, this is the phenomena that we work on, uh, the regeneration of a salamander limb. We do it in this particular salamander where we have access to the animal at all different life stages in you know, more than tenfold difference in size. 
And so this issue of scaling that came up earlier uh, can be addressed, for example, in this organism very well. And uh, in the recent years, uh, so this animal has hundreds of progeny. Uh, in recent years, uh, we've been able to develop the full molecular genetic toolkit along with the community, and we can do live imaging of regeneration in this system. So when we study regeneration, of course, uh, we've been working on, we all want to know how does it work? And, and by understanding how does it work, the other complementary question is how does it not work in situations where it doesn't occur? So really the value of these systems, of course, is to identify molecule cell types, mechanisms and concepts, which we've been doing over the last years. And uh, of course, uh, what people imagine is to engineer cells and tissues. But really for us as biologists, you know, the challenge is can we reconstitute formation and regeneration just even as a conceptual goal uh, along, uh, uh, to show that we know how it works. And so we think that uh, in that sense, uh, there's a great interface between the regeneration um, uh, uh, community and goals with organoid concepts and 4D multi-scale tissue organization. So I wanna go through some of the spectacular aspects of regeneration first and then come to the principles, which I think are very important. And uh, one is the spectacular positional discontinuity when we uh, graft a blastema, a regenerating limb from the left to the right side. And this generates uh, three interfaces, which, regenerate, which results in regeneration of three limbs. This of course is a very important conceptual insight into how, uh, how, what signals cause a limb to regenerate. Now, also in, in following the cells that undergo regeneration and make the blastema, what we've come to know is that the wound epidermis crawls over and then you start getting a callus, but actually this bone callus, which is considered a great part of bone uh, repair in mammals is not really what repairs uh, the regenerate. Rather, you get a lot of different progenitor cells and they shuffle around. There's a bit of disorder, but somehow then um, these cells shuffle out and they come back into order. And I think this order to disorder to order again is a very important aspect to study in regeneration. So um, how do they do it? Well, I think uh, very important is, as, as Alejandro said, is the destabilization of the adult state, both at the tissue and the cell level. Then there's templating information, and this can come in the form of epigenetic memory or homeostatic steady state that exists in the uh, adult cells, the reformation of organizing centers. Then of course, somehow these aspects interface with the stress and injury response. And then this concept of order to disorder to order, there's tissue, environmental, spatial, temporal, mechanical cues, cell type con contingencies, which allow the disorder to turn into order. And then there's spatial scaling of developmental pathways, which I hope I can get to in this talk. And there's matching of regenerate size to body size. So, and it's by understanding these concepts that then we can in a more precise way understand what's not working in a non-regenerative context. So I just want to point out this rainbow um, imaging of, scale, uh, of connective tissue cells during digitip regeneration that Josh uh, Curry undertook. And this gave us, this kind of live imaging gave us very important insights into regeneration. It told us how far back from the amputation plane the cells are coming from so that we could isolate the pre-blastema cells. And by looking at trajectories, he could show, for example, that cartilage cells, which proliferate and were considered to be a, a um, contributor to regeneration, don't migrate. And so they actually don't contribute to the regenerate. So, uh, and um, this was also confirmed by Kate McCusker's lab. And then the timing at which these uh, fibroblast cells cross the amputation plane and uh, corresponds with when they end up at the tip. And if they end up at the tip, they become multipotent. If they don't end up at the tip, then they retain their original identity. So fibroblasts enter into, uh, uh, into the blastema and their timing corresponds to location and fate. The proximity to the tip and apical ectodermal cap seems to correspond to the multipotent state. PDGF controls these cells migration and it's absolutely required for the migration and for destabilization of the adult state. And we know that once the uh, wound epidermis forms, there's an int uh, intimate interaction with nerves and immune systems to allow, for example, the maturation of this epidermal cell layer, which is absolutely required for the progression of this um, blastema. And there are many great labs who've been working on these questions in the field. 
as I said, chondrocytes divide, but they don't migrate or contribute to the growth of the blastema. Bone callus derived cells have limited contribution to bone growth. And the onset of developmental transcription network takes four to six days. So that means there's a lot going on during this destabilization stage to enter into this uh, developmentally competent state. So now I just wanted to go on to the integration of position and growth, where um, reminding you of this spectacular result. And uh, there, what we found is that the cells in the anterior and posterior part of the limb, the fibroblasts are sitting with different potentials if they're an anterior posterior cell. And then the act of amputation allows the anterior cells to turn on FGF8 and the posterior cells to turn on sonic hedgehog, which generates a positive feedback loop with each other. And both factors are absolutely essential for the continued growth and morphogenesis of the blastema. So, Leo Otsuki in the lab has been asking, how does the sonic hedgehog uh, signaling center form? Does it come from the original sonic hedgehog cells? So he's made a Cree reporter line where he can report in red the cells that were the sonic hedgehog expressing cells during development, and in blue, the cells that turn on sonic hedgehog during regeneration. And so you can see at six, uh, it, when he uh, has the you can see that in normal regeneration, those cells that had expressed sonic hedgehog are the cells that turn on sonic hedgehog again. But now what happens if he removes those sonic hedgehog cells? Can regeneration adapt? So he uh, removes it, amputates, and then looks. And so he, you can see the results, um, results of the, that experiment on the right. We're now with no previously expressing sonic hedgehog cells, there are other cells that come in and are competent to turn on sonic hedgehog during regeneration. So this flexibility to turn on signaling centers and is essential part of regeneration, uh, is a very important part of regeneration. So the other aspect I wanted to talk about is the scaling aspect, which has come uh, up. And, uh, Pietro Tardivo in the lab has been looking at the sonic hedgehog spreading of signals by looking at the expression domain of sonic and the downstream um, fa uh, signaling factors. And here you, he compared a one and a two centimeter blastema. And you can see that the sonic hedgehog signaling domain is bigger. And indeed the domain of patched signaling and glee signaling, which are responders to sonic hedgehog are this size in the limb bud, but much bigger in the 2.4 centimeter animal blastema. So that means signaling networks and the spreading of signaling is increasing with animal size. And this is a, animals with the same genetic makeup. And so somehow the system is responding to animal size and physiology uh, to regulate the spreading of embryonic morphogens. And so you can see we ha ha can have beautiful um, quantitation of this kind of data. And of course, we're interested in the mechanisms that allow this kind of scaling. Now, um, then the final thing I wanted to talk about is this beautiful work from Kate McCusker's lab at University of Massachusetts in Boston, where there's a other aspect of matching the limb size to the body size. So although blastema scale among small and large animals, in fact, at some point the limb um, as it regenerates in a large animal forms a, a, a smaller version of the limb. And then this limb actually grows, uh, expands, let's say, to match the size of the animal. And Kate has shown that this depends on the nerves on, uh, from the host animal. So there are many aspects of physiology interfacing with, org uh, with um, tissues and organ growth to allow for successful regeneration. So I'm gonna skip this part, sorry, <laughs> to get to the dreams <laughs> of approaches. So I, I think for us, uh, we'd like to see ways of understanding memory and transcriptional activation in vivo. So dynamics of defined transcriptional loci deep in vivo, looking at RNA and protein live at the same time, and then instating uh, transcriptional states quickly in a spatially defined way to test our hypotheses. Then we'd like to see signaling states, and, and Ken you know, showed a beautiful example of this in zebrafish, seeing gradients live in vivo of the morphogens of themselves, the responses, and seeing signaling handoffs between the different morphogen systems. Then in terms of tissue organization, imaging internal tissues such as bone or spinal cord in the limb without fixation and clearing would be a great challenge. And in many mature tissues, for example, the, that internal tissue is covered with muscle fibers, and so they cause, of course, problems with scattering for uh, imaging of internal tissues. Um, so of course, also live imaging of multiple cell types, how fibroblasts organizing the patterning of other tissues like muscle. 
And then finally, advanced engineering. So engineering uh, cells or materials that could recapitulate complex sequences uh, like the wound epidermis in, uh, becoming the AC, interfacing with immune systems and nerves. And then the integration of this field with synthetic biology, such as artificial gene regulatory networks to rewire cells and generate synthetic timers. So thanks very much. <laughs> These, thanks to all the guys in the lab. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ellie. It was a great talk. So while we wait for some um, questions to pop in from the audience, I guess I had a question about plasticity. So, you know, plasticity came up in many contexts earlier today, and you gave us this beautiful data on how, you know, normally there are these sonic hedgehog exp expressing cells that then set up the signaling center and are needed for regeneration. But then when you remove those, other cells can take that take on that role. So do you think in the sort of natural case of regeneration of the limb, is plasticity important? Or is this plasticity that you observe just sort of a, a happenstance of how these cells are, but is not really essential for the ability to regenerate? Um, well, I mean, I do think it's important. So when we profiled the fibroblasts that make up the blastema, um, we looked very carefully um, uh, whether there were cells that kind of in the mature tissue that already expressed a large component of uh, blastema kind of phenotype uh, before going into uh, the blastema. And uh, actually there's not. So our current data indicates that um, the cells actually sitting in the mature tissue have some kind of bookmark and they may be expressing some very small part of, uh, of an embryonic program, but for sure not the whole thing. And because mm -hmm. as you see in those sonic hedgehog red cells, they were had shut off sonic hedgehog and then they turned it back on again. And, and so the question is whether those cells have an advantage uh, to turn on sonic hedgehog because of their history or because of their location. And at the moment, we don't know. Great. So we have some questions from uh, panelists. Um, one of them is, do animals that have increased regenerative capacity live longer relative to non-regenerative counterparts, specifically those that are closely related? Uh, oh my gosh, oh, Ken and Alejandro help me. I mean, axolotls do live a long time. They live 25 years. And uh, maybe this is related to kind of being able to turn over and keep, uh, keep tissues that, uh, that are healthy over a long period of time. There are actually, uh, there was a story about an annelid species, but it had more to do with sexual reproduction, lifespan and regenerative capability. But uh, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on that question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, uh, I'm curious about this spiny mice um, because they are highly regenerative, and I, I actually don't know what their lifespan is. Yeah, it's not too dissimilar from from mus musculus, um, but I mean, there's already examples in fish. Uh, you know, the killifish actually gets to live for a very short period of time, comparatively speaking to uh, zebrafish. Both of them can regenerate quite well, uh, so there is a correlation, but there is no obvious cause-effect relationship between longevity and regeneration. But there is a correlation. Um, uh, we'll take one question um, and then move on to the discussion. So this is from Prayag Muravala, who is asking, when Leo removes sonic hedgehog cells and other cells contribute, do we know what the source of this uh, population is? Are these cells low expressing and not detected earlier, or are, um, or are they uh, FGF positive cells that can turn on sonic hedgehog? Yeah, we haven't investigated that in, in great detail. We assume that actually this posterior domain is bigger than the sonic hedgehog domain and that the cells are not coming from the FGF domain, but rather from this uh, a posterior domain that's competent, but had not previously expressed uh, sonic hedgehog, but that's something we have to confirm, um, yes. All right, great. So there's lots of other questions which you could answer uh, later on, um, but let's move on to sort of our um, uh, discussion with the panelists. And I'd like to welcome uh, two speakers uh, in later sessions, Walter Masseling from IMP and Alison Goldstein from NIH, who will be speaking in today's and tomorrow's uh, emerging leaders sessions. And maybe to get the discussion started, um, you know, what I'll point out is that you know, the three talks have shown the, the power of uh, our research organisms now 
to reveal insights into how regeneration works in a sort of natural um, context. And given these this amazing progress, do you feel like we are beginning to uncover any shared principles upon which animals regenerate? Uh, or are there general principles that you think we are likely to discover? Well, can I can I take that one? Because uh, if I could just follow on what uh, Alejandro presented a bit at, what you also studied. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, what I'm excited about recently are, um, are regulatory elements and the fact that um, there appear to be um, dedicated or preferential or specialized enhancers that um, direct injury responses and other aspects of, of regeneration. It's, it's been really nice to see this kind of exploding over the last five or six years in different, in different model systems. And um, you know, one can imagine there's thousands of those and they, they'll lead us upstream and downstream. And um, some are conserved and some are, some are conserved at the, are not conserved at the sequence level, but we're seeing are still recognized um, by different species, if not. So I, I just think the biology there is, um, is, is really fascinating and, and having all these model systems there to explore them is, um, is important. I guess I'd like to say on the theme of this positional identity that I don't know whether Ken and, and Alejandro agree, but I think in all the really spectacularly regeneration systems that I know that keeping somehow a positional map um, either as a steady state expression or as some kind of memory and we uh, uh, as of differences in different parts of the body seems to be very important and, and how that spatial map has evolved in, in other organisms I think is a very important question. Yeah, I have a sort of a maybe a general question for all of you, which is that, you know, as Alejandro, especially in his talk, you know, you talked about looking for conserved regulatory elements or these conserved things. Is there any concern that if you look at enough organisms, you kind of won't find anything conserved because everything is over time drifted into different directions. And, you know, in the end, it looks like there's many solutions to the problem, even though there was one common origin to the solution. Yeah, I mean, I think knowing the answer to that question yeah. will be very important, I mean, quite frankly. I mean, that's, that's where we are, right? I mean, it's either uh, ancestrally uh, uh, conserved or it's not. Uh, it may have been invented independently multiple times using different mechanisms, but my suspicion is that either of those two options will probably follow some fundamental guiding principles that we have not yet uncovered. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think getting to the answer, to the bottom of that question, Deepam, it behooves us uh, in, in trying to understand this problem. And actually, wouldn't you consider it kind of optimistic that it can happen in so many different ways, actually, you know, so it can probably happen in a way that we can't even imagine, you know, and I think that's what's, that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, but maybe I guess uh, I'm curious about what you think those fundamental and unifying, what the nature of those fundamental and unifying principles would be. So, you know, Ken brought up the cis regulatory elements. You know, we, we expect that probably there will be different genes. We know in axolotls, lineage-specific genes are activated um, during uh, regeneration, for example. So is it going to be about cells and tissue level um, properties that are going to be shared? Or do we actually expect genetic mechanisms to be shared? Well, I think it's going to be a mix of the two. I think that uh, one thing that one caveat that uh, we need to think about is that um, the genetics that we know is the genetics of domestication. Everything we know about genetics for the most part came from domesticated animals, starting with uh, Mendel's peas, right? So uh, Drosophila genetics, domesticated fruit fly. Uh, C. elegans, domesticated C. elegans. I mean, we, we really don't know if every single you know, genetic uh, principle that's operating in the wild uh, is actually represented in the genetics that, that we understand. So I think there's going to be you know, some surprises uh, when people start looking outside of domesticated animals because it's becoming easier and easier to interrogate these animals without necessarily having to generate lines and the like. That, that's one possibility. I don't know how probable it is, but it's one possibility. Uh, there's the other possibility as well that uh, with a limited number of, um, of tools, 
That's what all this genome sequencing has done for us, was identify a really large degree of conserved you know, coding genes uh, that uh, understanding the principles that guide uh, complexity and what, the, um, and what the spectrum of complexity may or may not be from those tools. I don't think those are principles we really understand fully. Um, natural selection obviously plays a, a role in that, but is that enough? Uh, I mean, it sounds heretical almost, but is that enough to explain uh, a complexity and diversity out there? I, I frankly don't know, and I would venture to say that we won't know unless we do, you know, what uh, Ken was proposing at the beginning, just explore, uh, see what is possible in biology, and then test, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the natural biological reality to what we think we understand about, uh, about biological processes. And I think those principles will emerge that way. Scale and proportion is one of them. I mean, we still don't understand why. Um, other questions, why do we have a fixed number of chromosomes? I mean, there's no reason, but species have a fixed number of chromosomes. There must be a principle, irrespective of, you know, how many different species are out there as to why chromosome number appears to be a really stable thing to, to have in a species. So, and that's, that's what I mean. It's probably gonna be a combination of things that we're familiar with and things that we're unfamiliar with and things, you know, as both uh, uh, Ellie and Ken said, we, we have not really put our fingers on it. One thing that, um, you know, I, I, that, I, that I kind of worry about in terms of, I mean, I, I completely advocate test, testing as many models, models, research animals as possible. Uh, but it can be tough to replicate their natural environment and really know whether we're giving them a chance to re regenerate. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I've, I've played around with uh, many species of fish that are kept in saltwater tanks where you know, trying to see if they regenerate. Um, and it's not, it's not as easy a conclusion as, as one would think. And also the different injury models um, can, can give different results and you really have to um, you know, go, go through a, a lot of motions before you can re really say something regenerates, something doesn't, something does it better than the other. So th this is, um, I mean, it's great we can use all these research animals and, and uh, keep them in labs and, and manipulate genomes, but also um, even just the husbandry is a challenge. And um, I guess at MBL that, um, you know, that, that's a place where it can be um, you know, maybe handled better than, than most. So let me, let me, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's something we're definitely interested in. But let me ask, um, you know, from a developmental viewpoint, right, and you've drawn the distinction that what goes on in regeneration could, of course, be very different in development. But one of the principles that often surprise people is the redundancy of mechanisms that's there. So have any of you found that regeneration also has redundancy built into it? And so that you knock out one pathway for regeneration and something else gets activated, it still gets it to regenerate just fine. It's very frustrating. We've made dozens, hundreds of zebrafish mutants or, or enhancer knockouts, and we, we typically do not get phenotypes. So I don't know if it's redundancy or how, how you explain it, robustness of mm -hmm. the system, and maybe we're not looking at things closely enough, but um, I think it's a fascinating question, also a very frustrating one from a zebrafish perspective. Jennifer, you have a question? Yes, um, I wanted to ask um, everyone, in particular Ken uh, and uh, Ellie, whether in any of your systems you've looked, I know you've looked at a lot of genetic markers or you know, pro specific proteins, but have you looked at specific intracellular organelle markers? like autophagosomes or lipid droplets or extracellular vesicles and see um, whether there's a correlation between the presence of those organellar systems with particular phenotypes. In particular, Ken, when you're looking at, you know, the regeneration of the zebrafish scale or whatever, um, to what extent are those cells that are coming in um, really all about, you know, turning over, you know, a, a big readout could be these organelles in terms of what, what's actually happening in the system. Lipid droplets can tell you a lot in terms of what the metabolism might be going on. Um, 
the extracellular vesicles, Ellie, I'm just curious as to, you know, you know, hedgehog signaling just has, you know, micro vesicles written all over it. Um, so what, you know, what do you think? Yeah. Is, how, yeah. how does this help if we have the ability to be able to actually now visualize these subcellular compartments? How would that help? Yeah, absolutely. Can I take this one, Ken, first? Because <laughs> I'm so excited about it, because this wound epidermis, you know, which is uh, super important. We have this, you know, Takuji, my lab, has this amazing finding where the wound epidermis is required, and we identified by expression cloning this factor that's meristillated, and in mammals thought to be an intracellular protein. But by the expression cloning, he found that the axolotl version is, gets outside of cells and stimulates cells to proliferate, a number of the cells. And by knockout, is required for the cells to start proliferating. And, it, and he's, he's done a huge amount of work on it. It's coming out in extracellular vesicles. It's, it's regulated by protein kinase C and ROC2. And the phosphorylation brings it into the cytoplasm. So in the mature state, it would be off and not secreted, whereas in the, in the wound epidermis, the uh, you know, you, you have a non-phosphorylated form of this, uh, of this protein and it gets out in extracellular vesicles. And it's super fascinating because then the topology of this protein with respect to getting out of the extracellular vesicle and stimulating the, the neighboring cells. And so he's at, at right now, in fact, doing EM uh, with the collaborators at Johns Hopkins. And we can see these like budding vesicles coming out with this GFP, you know, fusion protein of this molecule. And I think that's a, absolutely a future direction to understand regulation of processes like this. It's, it's super fascinating. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Ken, anything with autophagy or look at droplets in your system? Oh, uh, well, I, you know, we, I, I think it'd be great to visual, visualize it. Um, and, um, you know, there could be some dynamism there if we look over time in, in, in fast regenerating tissues, but uh, we need more cell biologists coming into this exactly. field. And uh, I mean, I'm a late maturing cell biologist, but my, my lab needs, needs expertise. So um, I, think, I think there's a lot of openings for people with, with, with this interest. And these, these systems are, are capable for it. You know, the amount, the type of imaging you can do, I think it's going to be very good. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you all. Jason. Yeah, I was just going to second that entire line of questioning. Uh, tra having trained as a cell biologist and then switched to developmental biology, I've been fascinated by the conserved uh, mechanisms that, that uh, cells that are stimulated to reprogram have been uh, that undergo. And one of the, the ones that emerged from the Keystone Plasticity meeting back in October in many systems and many species was autophagy, exactly like what we were talking about, that the first step is a massive upregulation of autophagy. And if you block autophagy or lysosomes, you can block reprogramming in multiple zebrafish systems and uh, uh, along the GI tract. So it almost seems like uh, that we're going to at least from a cell biological, biological cell intrinsic point of view have emerging themes of, of you know, organellar changes. I mean, one easy thing to think about is that a differentiated cell does a lot of secretion and making of things to, to function. So there's a lot of rough ER, uh, but a progenitor or regenerating cell needs ribosomes in the cytoplasm to be able to generate new ribosomes and new histones. So uh, the cells almost have to, um, by definition, have a massive switch between translation of of secreted in cell surface proteins uh, and ones that are more intrinsic uh, and uh, um, dedicated to cell proliferation. Anyway, uh, we're very excited about these conserved cell biological mechanisms. I was, um, sorry, go ahead. Did anyone yeah. have a response to that? I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess in the last few minutes, we have one of the questions I wanted to bring up was the one about development. So both Alejandro and Ellie, you, you, you brought up um, you know, the process of development. You know, Alejandro, on the one hand, you pointed out this idea that we might be somewhat constrained in our view of what cells do um, in regeneration because we are, are you know, stuck in the way of thinking from developmental biology, such as thinking about terminal differentiation. And then Ellie, you alluded to this fact that during regeneration, the organism has to recreate 
patterning systems, signaling centers, et cetera, that normally are found in development to then, you know, reform um, the organism. So uh, I guess those are, you know, uh, probably both are true. And I'm, I'm curious about how um, connected you think regeneration is to development. So particularly in the case of axolotls, for example, they are a pedomorphic species, right? Is it that they're so good at regeneration because they have, they are hanging on to a lot of developmental mechanisms. Well, I mean, I, I, it's actually not necessarily the pedomorphism. So actually, Chaka uh, asked this in the chat. I mean, so metamorphose X levels will also regenerate, actually, and we'll turn on these genes. But actually, I'm referring back to the statement I made that Alejandro referred to. I, I think that, I think, I really do think that x levels gave up intelligence in order to retain access to the full complement of a developmental gene regulatory network to regenerate things like the limb, right? And so you can't then shut off the, the, that system be able to use some sub part of it to regenerate another part of the brain. Do you see what I mean? And so the, it, it could be that, you know, there are constraints that have been put onto um, the genomic organization of how this gene regulatory network can be reactivated uh, that has constrained the evolution of this animal. Uh, and, and that's why I think, you know, the, the, synthetic, um, the synthetic generation of gene regulatory networks, you know, and is, is a really fascinating aspect, you know, can we complement you know, aspects of gene regulatory networks that are kind of somehow irreversibly shut down in other organisms to reactivate the, whole, the entire program. And that's what organoids are, right? That the stem cells are still in a competent state to do all that. And, you know, we want that, right? We want to be able to activate a small number of things and then get the whole program. We don't want to be at ten, adding, you know, 10,000 factors to get something to work. Yeah. No, I, I agree with Ellie. I mean, and two things about that with regards to uh, embryogenesis and, and uh, you know, what I like to call adult uh, development, which is regeneration, is that uh, they're quite different. You know, um, you know, you know exactly when embryogenesis begins by the process of fertilization. An animal does not know when or how it's going to get injured. So, you know, it, you may lose a finger or you may lose an arm. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, you're now tasked with the uh, job of not only regenerating those structures, but growing them to the appropriate scale and proportion and functionally integrating them to pre-existing tissue that's already fully you know, developed. Uh, I don't think that happens in embryogenesis. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, so it's already just at that level of observation, it's different. Now, will it actually need to invoke completely new ways of inventing the same thing or making the same thing again? No, but it will probably have to add something to it. Because if, uh, if uh, you know, let's say a human were to lose a hand and I'm 57 right now and I have to wait 57 years for my hand to regenerate to the right scale and proportion, that's not gonna work. And salamanders are really, really good at uh, accelerating that scale and proportion. And Ken had a beautiful picture of, of a tail regenerating with a proximal amputation and a distal amputation, it catches up. So, so that's very different from normal, you know, embryological processes that we are accustomed to look at. So I do think that there's some, going to be some differences that are not readily manifested in embryogenesis. Uh, now, if you perturb the embryo, yes, you will see concepts like regulation and things like that emerge, uh, but that does not happen, uh, you know, normally. Whereas injury is really something that every living organism is going to be exposed to, no, no matter where you live. And so, um, so, so there must be something that we're missing that uh, we need to uncover. And I, I don't know what that is, but it's clearly happening before our own eyes. And you know, we just need to, to take the time to come up with the appropriate experiments and, 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 and tackle it. Yeah, shout out to Bobber's talk that's coming up later in the next session, actually. He addresses that issue head on. Awesome. There, there's, a, there's a fun concept that uh, instead of regeneration, recapitulating, embryonic development, it's, it's more that, I mean, if you think about salamanders and fish, they, there's 200 progeny, they go through this hell of metamorphosis and survival, and injury is a part, it's a part of life, and part of their developmental process involves a lot of mechanical strain and tissues tearing apart versus a more coddled mammal. So, I mean, maybe earlier process of, processes of development are are undergoing regeneration versus, you know, kind of the reverse 
concept and, and regeneration is an integral part of, of development of, of tissues and structures and, and, and so on. There's just you know, multiple yeah. ways to look at this if you have perspective. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I largely agree with what you said, Alejandro, but I think we should also just again remember that we often look at embryos in a perfect environment. I know. In the real world, they probably do, just as sort of Kim is alluding to, they actually probably do have to rebuild things every now and then. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree absolutely. And that's why I think this whole notion of, you know, working with domesticated animals prevents us from, you know, really incorporating that kind of thinking into the interpretation of our experiments. Um, I always find it very amusing that uh, most of my colleagues uh, working with uh, Drosophila and C. elegans and present company excluded, know very little about the natural history. Right. of the organisms they work with. Um, it, it's, it's really astonishing uh, that that's not part of the uh, armamentarium in uh, helping interpret your experimental results, but it's the way that it seems to be uh, most prominent right now. All right, I think we're out of time. So thank you everyone for an engaged discussion and I will hand it over to Janine to close out the session. Wonderful. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you guys um, so much. That was a great session, a great discussion. We will break now for just about five minutes and we'll resume at um, 3.40 p.m. Eastern time um, for the last session of the day. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with session five. And um, Shruti Naik will be um, chairing that session. So Shruti, over to you. Thank you so much, Janine. Wait, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry, my Air my AirPods are always a bit tricky. Um, all right, folks, so we have saved the best for last, our Emerging leader session, and we're so excited. Um, so the, the Emerging Leaders were selected from a group of trainees that submitted their abstracts. Um, and really the ones we pitched, we were the most excited about, although all the abstracts were really exciting. So it really speaks to the future of this field, how diverse it is and how, um, how much we're looking towards hearing from all of them. So without cutting too much of their time, our first speaker is Yin Fan Yuan from Yale University in the Nicholson lab. So do you wanna share your screen? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. And see my screen? That's great. Um, so you need to be in present. Yeah, you need to, perfect. Okay. Go for it. Okay. So thanks for the introduction and, uh, and thank you for the organizers who gave me the opportunity to speak over here. And uh, currently I'm a postdoc fellow at Yale University working with uh, Dr. Laura Nicholson. And today I'm gonna to go over some of the research we have on the engineering, the endothelium in decellarized whole lung scaffold. Okay. So uh, as Laura mentioned in this morning session, so lung is the only organ in our body that's responsible for gas exchange and the smallest unit is called the alveolus. And in our lab, we are specialized in using the uh, uh, technology called the decellarization and recellarization uh, to regenerate the alveolus for the, like with the ultimate goal to build the uh, bioengineering lung for transplantation. In 2010, we have some success on, on the first generation of bioengineering lung. So basically we have put the epithelial cells and endothelial cells and some mesenchymal cells into the lung scaffold and culture for a period of time and then put a transplant into the animal. Uh, the successful way, basically the animal can survive but not for a really long period of time. So one of the key failure mode is because of the loss of blood gas barrier. In the alveolar compartment, there are different types of cells, including endothelial cells, epithelial cells, mesenchymal cells, and immune cells. Those cells are working together to, re, uh, to maintain the homeostasis of the alveolus and they're responsible for blood gas barrier. So in my, in, uh, in my research, uh, I'm primarily focused on uh, regeneration of the blood vessel in the uh, decellarized lung scaffold. So in the uh, uh, blood vessel, like a pulmonary microvascular endothelial cells that play a very critical role in re regulating the blood gas barrier. And uh, during the physiological conditions can regulate the anti-inflammation, resist the thrombosis and regulate the vasodilation. And disease in the pulmonary microvascular endothelial cells or pulmonary endothelial cells in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the lung, uh, for example, the acute respiratory distress syndrome or pulmonary arterial hypertension, or even the COVID-19 are a few causes of deaths uh, that are increasing over the world. So basically demonstrating that engineering a functional, uh, functional endothelial cells in the uh, uh, DSRS lung scaffold 
uh, is playing a very uh, important role in uh, regulating and maintaining the functionality of the engineer lung. So seeding of endothelial cells into the uh, DCRS lung scaffold appear very difficult. Uh, so one of the reasons is because of high, uh, high resistance at the uh, small capillary. So we can see in the H and E picture here is basically we use the uh, uh, a, a first generation seeding technique. So after we see the endothelial cells into the DCRS lung scaffold, the majority of the cells are actually in the uh, big vessel rather than going into the small vessels. And one of the uh, reason is because of the loss of hydrostatic pressure. So after desterization, uh, the uh, the removal of uh, cell cell component cell cell uh, cell components and also the removal of cell cell uh, barrier function, gonna make the uh, basement membrane very permeable. So all the uh, pressure that drive the cells seeding into a small vasculature can lost due due to the uh, permeable barrier at the uh, basement membrane. So basically, and then we have optimized our protocol by increasing the pressure. So basically we have uh, increasing gra the gravitational force uh, by increasing the height of the seating jar and also including the solenoid valving system to, uh, to basically input the uh, uh, pressure spikes to push the cells into the uh, vasculature in the lung. And after we use the uh, uh, optimized seating protocol and subsequent culture, so we can see that in the H and E picture over here. So the many uh, the cells can basically uh, extensively cover the whole lung scaffold, and not only they are not only in the big vessel but also in the small vasculature. Now the question is whether or not they can uh, form the barrier. The answer at that stage is no. My work is uh, primarily on improving the endothelial cell cell barrier in the endothelial repopulate lung system. So we know that the endothelial cell cell barrier is controlled by different kinds of proteins, including adherent junctions and uh, tight junction proteins. There are many different uh, small molecules has been established to regulate or upregulate the uh, uh, barrier function in the uh, in, uh, through the in, uh, mostly through the in vivo modeling system. And in this study, I basically want to identify whether or not there is a, uh, is a single small molecule that can upregulate the uh, cell cell junction in the decelerized lung scaffold. So by doing that, basically, I, <clears throat> uh, I basically screen a different uh, type of uh, small molecules, including angiopoietin 1s, uh, S1P, forsglen, ACPD20, cyclin P, fesodel, rock inhibitor, imatinib, uh, semostatin. And then uh, we, I use the uh, transfer assay to test this. So, and we can see that the angiopoietin 1, forskolin, and the ACP2 and the cyclin P can significantly reduce the permeability of the uh, uh, cell cell barrier. Consistently, we use the ESYST assay to measure the resistance. And we can see that the angiopoietin 1, forskolin, S1P can markedly re uh, increase the resistance of the cell cell barrier. Uh, interesting or remarkably is that the ACBD2 and cyclin P can not only initially uh, increase the resistance, but also can uh, uh, maintain the improved, uh, improved level for a long period of time. And then we have extended the culture condition for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And we can see that the ACPD2 and the cyclin P uh, can at least having the effect for 60 hours. And then we want to test whether or not this small molecule has any beneficial effect in the endothelial lung system. So before we do that, we need to put the endothelial cells in the lung. So in here, we have used IPS, ECFCs for translational purposes. And we have put the endothelial IPS, ECFC in the, uh, the DCRS lung and uh, consistent to what we've seen previously, the endothelial cells can uh, basically seed into not only the, the large vessel, but also can go into the uh, small vessel across the whole lung lobe. And then we have characterized the uh, phenotype of IPS, ECFCs. So we can see that in the qPCR, uh, after culture the IPS ECFC in the engineer lung, there is a significant increase of the uh, endothelial phenotype protein, uh, uh, genes. For example, PCAM1, CDH5, uh, uh, TI2, and geopointin one demonstrating maybe the physiological microenvironment in the uh, micro, uh, in the uh, decelerized lung scaffold under current culture may help the endothelial cell to gain some maturation. So to further look into that, we basically uh, perform some uh, initial single cell analysis to compare the human uh, to, to compare the human lung uh, endothelial cells versus uh, the IPS ECFC culture in the tissue plastic, 
and the IPS ECFC culture in the lung. So we can see the dot plot over here on the very left are the uh, uh, native markers. Uh, and we can see that IP, after IPSC culture in the lung, there's significant or markedly increased level of a native, uh, native markers, especially in the pulmonary venous and arterial. And now we want to know whether or not we can uh, use the small molecule we identified in, previous, uh, in, uh, in the previous slides into this IPS ECFC lung. So we have developed the uh, uh, assay to measure the vascular barrier. Uh, so basically we put the feed detection solution at certain height to drive the, uh, to allow the driving the, uh, uh, to allow driving the solution uh, to basically uh, go through the pulmonary artery. And then we collect the efflux at the uh, pulmonary vein. So the amount of the efflux that can be correlated uh, with the uh, uh, vascular barrier. So basically we have culture the endothelial cells or IPS endothelial cells uh, into the lung for four days. Uh, and then we have added the uh, EPAC agonist. And then we measure the venous outflow at zero, six and 22 hours uh, afterwards. And then we can see from the bar graph over here, the uh, at the zero, uh, well, in the control condition, there's no change among these uh, uh, time points. But after, uh, after treatment with the EPAC agonist, there's significant increase of the uh, uh, venous outflow or correlating to the barrier function. Demonstrating EPAC agonist may have the uh, potential uh, beneficial role in increasing the endothelial barrier function in the repopulate lung system. So I have shown you that the uh, uh, endothelial cells can be cultured in the deserized lung scaffold and, and they can form, a, to, to some degree, they can form some barrier function and additionally, the microenvironment in the DCRS lung scaffold under the current culture condition can push the cell to uh, gain some native phenotype. So uh, I'm thinking whether or not we can use this as a modeling system to study the pulmonary vascular disease or in broader view, pulmonary disease. So to test that, basically I have uh, input some uh, pro-inflammatory uh, molecules, including LPS, TNF-alpha, and nf gamma in there, and then test the permeability and also the uh, neutrophil adhesion to endothelial cells. So basically, uh, to uh, this is a proof of concept experiment uh, shows that the uh, after treatment with the LPS, there is a significant decrease of the uh, uh, decrease of the uh, barrier function, and after uh, putting the neutrophil in there. So we can see that in the HNE image over here in the control, we can see open lumen of endothelial and uh, endothelial lies the uh, lung scaffold, but those uh, open lumens occluded by neutrophil demonstrating an increase of the neutrophil adhesion to endothelial cells. So basically this pro concept experiment shows the potential of using this uh, whole lung scaffold maybe for the modeling system. So I'll stop here and uh, I'm happy to answer all the questions you have. Awesome, really cool talk. Um, so while questions come in, um, maybe I can kick it off. So I'm curious, does lung vasculature have, do, do lung endothelial cells associate, do they have associated perivascular cells? And have you thought about including those in your system and how that may affect sort of putting this um, tissue together? Yes, 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 absolutely. Like there are definitely a perivascular and a perivascular cells, for example, parasite in there to support the uh, stability and the maturation of endothelial cells. And we are actually considering uh, putting those cells in there. Uh, we haven't done that, but uh, I, in addition to perivascular cells, we uh, currently we are working because uh, we have the uh, the cool tool single cell analysis to help us to understand what cells actually in the microvascular niche. Additional to the perivascular cells, maybe we can also put in the fibroblasts, areolar fibroblasts, and also AT2 cells in there to uh, really uh, uh, recapitulate the uh, native uh, niche in there. Not only the uh, fetal contact, but also the paracrine signals. Very cool. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions coming in. So thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna move on to our next speaker, just in the interest of time. Okay, perfect. So our next speaker is Amy Glickman from the Carmichael Lab at UCLA. Welcome. And we're excited to hear about um, astrocytes and stroke. Great, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my work today. I work with Tom Carmichael at UCLA. Our lab focuses on neuro repair after stroke in a number of different contexts and a number of different mechanisms. 
I'm specifically interested in how astrocytes are responding to, to stroke, um, how, how these responses changes, change depending on the region of the stroke and, and the, the proximity to the stroke. And really, how can, we, how can we manipulate these cells to promote repair? And I think astrocytes are really potentially incredibly powerful sort of central hubs for a number of repair processes. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I think that. All right. First, just a bit about stroke. Stroke has the largest health burden of any neurologic disease as measured by disability adjusted life years. There's a, a number of different subtypes of stroke. I study two. I study large vessel ischemic strokes, which are what people sort of commonly think of as a stroke. Clinicians have gotten better and better at helping people survive these injuries. Mortality rates for these large vessel strokes have decreased dramatically over the last 50 years or so, but the incidence of these strokes is increasing, which means that more and more, these types of strokes are becoming a, a growing patient population with long-term disability. I also study white matter strokes. So these are small lacunar infarcts, specifically in the white matter, the connective tracts of the brain. These are currently about 30% of diagnosed strokes, but that's almost certainly an underestimation. And it's one of the most common causes of dementia, these underlie vascular dementia. These are progressive and as I said, undiagnosed. These two types of strokes present totally different challenges for us from a repair perspective. So large vessel strokes are gonna be diagnosed pretty much immediately making a subacute or an early chronic time point totally feasible from a repair perspective. White matter stroke is gonna be a, a different situation. So white matter stroke, we're not gonna know when the initial injury occurred, although, although by the time it's diagnosed, it's likely weeks, months, or years after the initial injury. But again, these are going to be progressive. These, these strokes are likely going to continue to happen. Right now, there's not much we can do for these patients therapeutically. Physical therapy works for a subset of patients, but that's about it. The focus on stroke research for a long time has centered on neurons. But of course, neurons are not the only cells in the brain that are affected by stroke or that respond to the injury, either in the core of the injury or in the parenchyma, the spared tissue. Really, all of the cell types of the brain are, are undergoing changes in response to stroke, especially in that, in that spared but reactive tissue. And we're going to focus today specifically on astrocytes. So these are about 30% of the cells in your brain, depending on how you're counting. Um, I think over the last 15 years or so, we've learned a huge amount about what these cells are capable of. And I think we're really still just, just scratching the surface on the function of these cells, both in the healthy and in the diseased brain. In terms of, of astrocytic functions in the healthy brain that I think have, have huge implications for repair, some of them are, are astrocytic roles in synapse formation and elimination, influencing neuronal connectivity, influencing uh, the blood vessels and influencing blood flow. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit interactions with the immune system and, and modulation of circuit excitability. And I think these are really are, are all critical functions that are, are necessary in terms of, of repairing a, a healthy brain. But even more so than that, after stroke, astrocytes undergo some dramatic changes, um, sort of depending on their region, depending on their location, that, that are associated with stroke repair and recovery. And the most obvious of those is that these cells tend to form um, what's been termed a glial scar after injury. So the astrocytes immediately adjacent to the injury over the course of the first couple of weeks after the injury will proliferate, processes will elongate, the stroke here would be right at sort of the edge of this circle here, and will contribute to the formation of what's been called a glial scar. And so traditionally or classically, that glial scar has been seen largely as a bad thing, that this glial scar was specifically inhibitory towards axonal re regeneration, and therefore maybe we need to get rid of it. The, the issue here is that really every experimental way that we've tried to interfere with the scar or remove the scar has made things worse. The, this fibrotic scar, the fibrotic core of this lesion um, tends to be larger after we remo remove the glial scar. Immune cells are infiltrating further into the spared tissue. Um, and we see worse functional outcomes. And so this has led to, to some people really trying to, to reframe how we think of these glial cells at the border here. And this is led by Michael Safraniev, but um, I think he's just the forefront of, of a lot of action in this field where really instead of thinking of these cells as a scar, maybe we should think of them as, a, as more of a limitans barrier where the astrocytes are really walling off this lesion core and really protecting, acting to protect the spared tissue. This brings up some interesting questions that sort of harken back to the discussion that we had earlier today about what should we do about this fibrotic core? Is the goal to try to grow through it and reclaim that territory? Is the goal to try to get it as small as possible, as quickly as possible to allow for plasticity in, in, the, in the spare tissue? Is the goal to just ignore it entirely and focus entirely on the spare tissue? And I think there are, there are interesting questions to be had there. Um, and I think largely some of those answers are gonna be injury dependent and dependent on the system that you're talking about. 
The scar isn't the only thing that astrocytes are doing after stroke. When we, when we look at astrocytes after stroke, this is a coronal section of a mouse brain. The stroke core is over here on the left. These cells in this first box, the cells immediately outside of the, the infarct uh, border here are the cells that are gonna form that, that scar or that border. But we see as we go further out, still clear evidence of astrocyte reactivity um, until we get to contralateral tissue, which looks largely normal. And as a postdoc, what I've really wanted to do is, is try to understand um, what these different cells might be doing, what, we, what, what sort of different functions these cells might be, might be losing or, or gaining in these different regions. And I wanted to do this in both gray and white matter, partially because we see such differences in terms of the patient populations, depending on where the stroke is happening. But also, if you're looking at astrocyte heterogeneity, the most obvious form of heterogeneity is, is white matter versus, pro, versus gray matter astrocytes in the healthy brain. And so these cells, we know, we know shockingly little, I think, about white matter astrocytes. Gray matter astrocytes are the focus of the vast majority of astrocyte research. But one of the things we do know about white matter astrocytes is that there are significant morphologic differences between white matter and gray matter astrocytes and some phenotypic differences. And so what I really wanted to try to do was use two different stroke models in the mouse, a white matter stroke model over here on the left and a cortical stroke model on the right to really try to understand how astrocytes were responding to this injury. What I didn't wanna do is what I've done up on the top here, which is to say, the cells in region one look a little different than in region two that look a little different in region three. What I wanted to do is to try to set in a more comprehensive and reproducible manner zones of astrocyte reactivity. And so I won't go over the details of how I've done this today, but I've combined um, extensive morphologic analysis. And thank you so much to Lauren Luker and Janelia, whose spaghetti monsters made this all possible, with a number of different phenotypic analyses um, to identify zones of reactive astrocytes after both white matter and cortical stroke, predominantly ips lesional, but including contralegional tissue as well. And then I've used this to inform a transcriptomic analysis where using GFAP ribotag mice, I can laser capture my specific defined zones, which means that I can, I can create zone specific, astrocyte specific transcriptomes of the changes that are happening here. And as you might expect, we can then use this to both identify and then manipulate targets for repair. There are thousands of genes that are changing here, impl impl implicating a number of different functions that I think are really relevant for repair. I'm gonna tell you about one today, one of the ones that I'm most excited about, which is astrocyte interactions with remodeling the vasculature and angiogenesis after stroke. So we see heavy angiogenesis in, in the cortex after, after a cortical stroke and gray matter regions in general. And this has been associated with, with functional recovery, both in animal models, as well as in patients. Um, and one of the things that's been really interesting to me is that in these most reactive astrocytes after a cortical stroke, they're upregulating a number of different molecules, suggesting that at least some of this angiogenesis is being driven by astrocytes. This is very different in the white matter, because white matter astrocytes don't really seem to be driving angiogenesis to anywhere near the same degree. And in fact, we do see far less angiogenesis after a white matter stroke. White matter vasculature is a little different anyway. White matter is a far less vascularized tissue. This is probably part of why it's so sensitive to these, these small infarcts, these small and progressive infarcts. And we don't have a great sense of whether white matter angiogenesis is really critical in terms of, in terms of repair after a white matter ischemic injury. And so for me, this was a really interesting intervention point. Could I identify some of these cortical genes, these cortical astrocytic genes that were driving angiogenesis and induce them in these white matter genes to manipulate angiogenesis? And so I developed lentiviral overexpression vectors to do just that in white matter astrocytes of pro-angiogenic genes. And in one of those genes, I saw really interesting and sort of unexpected results. So in a, with a control virus and stroke core here is over on the left, in this perinfarct tissue, I saw, I saw extensive angiogenesis, primarily in capillaries, exactly as I would expect. In overexpression of a laminin, again, specifically in astrocytes, I start to see the development of these large caliber vessels coming through the tissue, vessels, the types of vessels we very, very rarely see in white matter. Um, and this is quantified here. And so I was really curious about what the consequences are of having these large vessels coming into the area. And so I took these out to more chronic time points. These vessels persist, uh, looking a month after the stroke here, these vessels are certainly still heavily prevalent in the area. And what was really interesting to me is, is to see what effects they might be having on, on especially that fibrotic scar. And what I'm seeing in ways that I didn't really expect, if, if anything, I thought we might see an increase in the scar size. So we're seeing a decrease. The, the presence of these large vessels, the presence of this, this astrocyte derived laminin, specifically in white matter, is causing a decrease in, in the fibrotic scar area as measured by collagen 1A1 area, as well as a, a decrease in the axotomized region, this NF160 area. 
as an area that's missing in a form 60, I should say. And so I think one of the things that's really exciting to me about this is that this, this is, is in many ways a proof of principle that region specific differences in astrocyte reactivity from a similar, a similar um, target, a similar intervention point, a similar ischemia induced reactivity uh, can really induce functional changes in angiogenesis and fibrotic scar uh, maturation. And that's just one of the, the features that we're interested in here. And so in terms of tools that I would love to have going forward, one, I would love to be able to longitudinally image, image these injuries. Imaging deep in the white matter of mice is, is a challenge. It's, it's getting easier with 3P imaging, but I'd love to be able to do that more robustly and in greater detail. I would really love to have better glial specific viral tools. So especially in something like stroke, which is an age related disease, it's, it's really important that we be, able, we be able to replicate a lot of our findings in the age of animal. Um, or, or even do discovery-based studies in the aged animal. And that's very difficult to do, especially if you're, you're dependent on transgenic animals. The astrocyte tools aren't terrible, but there is room for improvement there as well. Um, but there's really nothing we can do right now in terms of microglia or really any of the oligo lineage cells. And it'd be awesome if we could start to intervene with those in a, in a viral dependent manner. And then finally, I'd really love to understand this fibrotic scar better. And I think that's going to come down to, for, for the level of detail I'd really like to understand, it's going to come down to glycoproteomics. So improvements in, in, in the granularity of glycoproteomic detail, um, I think would be really incredibly beneficial. And so I'd like to just quickly thank Tom Carmichael, who's a phenomenal mentor and just so much fun to talk science with. If people are looking for postdocs, please consider contacting him. Uh, the students who've worked with me over the years have been incredibly useful. Um, our collaborators, and finally, my funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a fantastic talk. So while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I actually have some questions about the angiogenesis, right? Why does the fibrotic scar go down? Is they bringing in uh, reparative cells? Um, yeah. It's a great question and we're, we're still sort of tracking that down. What I can tell you from some preliminary data is that we are seeing differences in, in um, immune cell populations coming into the area as a result of this for sure. Um, and so I think there's, there's differences in, in maybe the extent to which the immune cells are, are really helping to sort of resolve or mature this fibrotic scar. When we see this fibrotic scar a month out with, with um, the laminin overexpression, it looks very reminiscent of the way we see a scar maybe two months out. So it looks like, if anything, we're just sort of speeding that maturation process. And I suspect that's, that's related to immune cell infiltration into the area, but I, I, can't, I can't guarantee that. Interesting. So we have a question from Ellie. Um, she's wondering if you could create a kind of embryonic developmental like microenvironment would this reprogram or reactivate astrocytes or at least keep them at bay and keep them from, from sort of scarring? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. I, there is of course, I, I haven't focused on anything that's happening in development. Um, there are differences in terms of, of uh, immature astrocytes in development in terms of how they're responding to injury. Um, the extent to which we can sort of deprogram these astrocytes into, into sort of a more immature like phenotype and see the differences there, I think is, is, is completely unknown. There's some really interesting new data that's come out of uh, Chala Iroglu's lab at Duke that suggests that one of the ways that we might be able to trigger astrocytes into sort of a more immature like state is manipulation of cell surface proteins and, and manipulate how essentially these astrocytes create effectively a syncytium and whether or not it's that astrocyte connectivity and that astrocyte syncytium that then relates to to their ability to make a scar, I think is totally open. I think it's possible, but, but I have no idea whether or not it would work. So we have another question. Um, do you know the composition of the fibrotic core? It may re reveal about what function they have. Not. So do you know what the fibrotic core is sort of made of? Um, yeah, I don't. I'd love to, but I don't. Yeah, we've been we've been thinking about doing proteomics on that fibrotic core itself. It's a little difficult. We're talking about a pretty small tissue region here, um, and would probably be be dependent on laser capture microdissection. Um, but we've also thought about maybe going into some of the more spatial transcriptomic approaches. I'm, I'm hesitant to do that because I think so much of the relevant stuff here is going to be ECM rather than necessarily what the cells are themselves. Um, but but yeah, I'd love to have a better sense of what's happening in there. And so finally, I'm gonna integrate two questions, one from Sumeru, one from Renee Roscoe, but they're, they're kind of similar. 
Um, so they were wondering how the, if the vasculature perfuses the area and how astrocytes, what astrocytes are sensing, do they respond to um, hypoxia? Like what is it that they're you know, generating this, this vasculature from? Yeah, so the vessels, uh, the, these new vessels are perfused they're, they're, and their blood-brain barrier is intact, I can tell you that much. Um, in terms of, of how astrocytes are, are really sensing these, these changes, I think of that infarct core is almost like a morphogen gradient in terms of triggering astrocyte reactivity. I think, I think we're seeing a huge number of damage cues present in the core of that infarct that are, are um, sort of leaking out in just a natural gradient formation and that's inducing these, these uh, gradated changes in astrocytes as a result of that. The fact to me, I think the most interesting thing is that we're seeing differences in the white matter versus the gray matter. And so I suspect some of that might be differences in the core itself. In terms of what's really different in the white matter versus the gray matter, there are a few sort of candidates as to how these cells might be triggered differently. Um, but, but one of my favorite theories is, is really that there's something specific about injured neuronal somas, um, which are absent in the white matter that, that astrocytes are, are reacting to cues from. But that's, that's hugely speculative. I have no data to back that up. I'm just curious, this is just a curiosity follow-up and then we have to move along for, for the sake of time. Can you just transfer from one area to the other and see if it's a microenvironment versus cell intrinsic thing? It's really difficult to do that in vivo because these, these cells have so many elaborate processes and the second you start peeling them off um, in any sort of transplant situation, you're causing just a huge additional injury on top of that. The closest we've gotten to that, and this is in the absence of injury, this is just in, in sort of healthy tissue, is with astrocytes, um, human-derived astrocytes in culture. And so uh, Eric Gillian at UCSF has done some really neat experiments plating the same iPSC astrocytes onto neuronal somas versus, versus axonal bundles. And with that, he can recapitulate the differences that we see in morphology um, in the brain. So there's something that astrocytes are responding to differentially based on the, the neuronal soma versus the processes. Whether or not we can do that in vivo, I, I, I think is gonna be challenging. Yeah. Awesome, well, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And I think there might be a few more questions if you could just answer them directly, um, sure, that would absolutely. be great. And we're gonna move on to our next speaker, who is, do we wanna, Yuming, who is Yuming Jia from UT Southwestern, the Zoo Lab. Um, I don't know if you wanna pop on and share your, perfect. Sharing right now. Perfect. Okay. Is everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. You're good so, to go. Okay. Great. Uh, so thanks, uh, organizer, for inviting me to this talk. My name is Joyce. I'm a graduate student in How to's lab at UT Southwestern Medical Center. So our lab is uh, interested in using liver as a model organ to study uh, tissue regeneration uh, to see whether we can apply what we know about the liver to other tissues. So today I, I, I would like to share uh, with how we, uh, our lab take advantage of uh, in vivo high through our genetic screen to answer some of the questions uh, in the regeneration field. I think uh, one of our concepts has been brought up repetitively uh, in this panel is that uh, different animals and organs have uh, variable regenerative capacity. Uh, capacities. So on one hand, we have uh, lower invertebrates such as planary and newt, where they can regenerate the whole organisms after injury. On the other hand, we human have uh, super regenerative uh, tissues such as liver, but at the same time, we also have organs such as uh, uh, heart and spinal cord that do not uh, reduce uh, response, uh, regenerative responses after injury. So one of the questions has been asked repetitively in the field is what is contributing to this disparity? So one aspect, um, uh, our lab has been always interested is uh, how epigenetic state is connected to uh, regeneration. So for a lot of our previous uh, uh, studies comparing uh, homotopy structures in different model organisms uh, with a different uh, regenerative capacity, it has been hypothesized that the uh, regenerative ability of an animal sort of depends on how long we can maintain a flexible chromatic state 
that can easily adapt to the gene expression charges during the regeneration. So it is very likely that the uh, animals uh, with robust regeneration, such as the neutered plenary, this uh, flexible chromatic state is uh, maintained throughout their life. Whereas uh, in other animals, including human, uh, this uh, flexible chromatic state is converted to a more uh, inactive version sooner during the developmental stage. So we believe that by modulating some of the key epigenetic pathways, we may be able to help the cell to adopt a more uh, flexible chromatic state and therefore to improve regeneration. So, uh, so in order to identify such uh, pathways that regulate regeneration in a more unbiased way, we use uh, a mouse liver as a model organs, and uh, we developed a, a in vivo CRISPR uh, knockout and CRISPR activation screening system inspired by some of the in vivo screening system uh, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Lars Zadar at the uh, uh, Scott Lowe's lab. So. Uh, this uh, system take advantage of commonly used uh, liver recipient mice called FAH, now called mice. So the simple logic behind this uh, screening setup is that uh, for this specific mouse, the liver can only be repopulated by the FAH wild type hepatocyte. So because of that, we can deliver a transposer that express wild type FAH allow with other component for the CRISPR editing into the FAH uh, knockout mouse liver directly. And in this way, we, we, we will generate many clones of uh, FAH rescued uh, hepatocytes with a different guide that will compete uh, with each other during the regeneration after injury. And uh, uh, the, uh, we can imagine that the hepatocyte with a different ratio uh, proliferative, uh, proliferation advantage will be either enriched or depleted. So we applied this uh, system to about 200 epigenetic uh, 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 regulators that are uh, all draggable. Uh, we identified many uh, interesting targets. The two uh, targets that I will briefly talk about today is called uh, uh, it's called bat 2 and bat 2 b which uh, is uh, shown to be a uh, uh, inhibitor for the uh, liver regeneration. And that this two protein is also one of the uh, top genes with the most like full charge uh, for our screen. So what is uh, this two protein? So the bat 2 and bat 2 b you code a chromatin remodeling uh, complex called the imitation with SNF. So, uh, this two protein has a very similar, similar structure compared to the irid one a and the irid one b in a more well-known uh, uh, family called the Swiss Smith, although the function of these two proteins is largely unknown. So we first validated our screening by uh, generated uh, epibats 2 and epibats 2 b in uh, whole body knockout mice. Uh, we showed that uh, uh, the knockout mice seems to accelerate liver regeneration after 70% uh, partial hepatomy. And what makes uh, us uh, more uh, happier about uh, the mouse is that although it's uh, accelerated uh, uh, regeneration, it doesn't seem to accelerate uh, spontaneous tumor genesis, uh, even when we age the mice to one and a half year old. So, uh, so, so, so this uh, makes it easy to, to ma ma makes easy to be like translated to clinical settings. So what makes uh, the results more exciting is that we are very fortunate to find a small molecule inhibitor that acts as a dual uh, inhibitor for both that's where and that's to be, which inhibits uh, these two, uh, two proteins to interact with the uh, chromatin. So when we apply this uh, small molecule inhibitor to the wild type mice after we subjecting the mice to various clinical relevant uh, 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 injuries, such as a 70% partial hepatotomy, acute uh, liver injury reduced by carbon tetrachloride, as well as a, 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 a toxic dosing of Tylenol. We saw uh, there is some beneficial effect in the tissue repair. Um, more importantly, we seem to be able to apply this beneficial effect uh, beyond uh, 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 tissues other than uh, liver. So here I'm showing that we are given uh, 
the, the wildcat mice inhibitors, well, we are subjecting the mice to a, a colitis model induced by DSS. We saw that the, the, the inhibitor treating the mice have a much lower uh, uh, body weight loss, as well as, well as a longer color loss, which is likely to be uh, induced by a more uh, 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 cell uh, tissue repair. So up to this point, all the uh, so 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 up to this point, I think I have showed a uh, uh, a very good example of uh, how we can apply the in vivo physical screening to answer some of the question, uh, which in our case is to discover a uh, new druggable epigenetic pathways that regulate our uh, 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 tissue regeneration. So I think uh, this uh, this this question may now be answered if we are using. Uh, ex vivo or in vitro systems, this, uh, there are so many cell non autonomous effects such as a cell cell interaction and the immune uh, system involvement, involvement uh, that just that doesn't exist in the culture dishes. So uh, we can also imagine that by applying this uh, system to a different set of uh, uh, gene targets, we can answer uh, different question related to regeneration. For example, here I'm showing that. We have previously applied the same uh, system to a set of genes that uh, we have identified to be recurrently mutated in the human uh, cirrhotic livers, and uh, successfully identified some of the uh, genes that can improve hepatocyte fitness in this uh, chronic damaged setting. We also applied a, a, a modified version of uh, uh, this uh, uh, screening platform uh, to identify secreted factors that regulate liver regeneration, which can help us uh, help us answer some of the cell non-autonomous effects. So up to this point, all I have to talk about uh, for the screening uh, applications that you uh, perform the uh, in liver. So how can we do a uh, in vivo screening in tissues other than liver? So the common, we all know that the common use the vector for a uh, CRISPR uh, screening is now to, like a really applicable for in vivo uses. For example, like light virus do not really affect uh, in vivo tissues really well. And, uh, uh, the adenovirus or AAVs do not integrate, so there's no way for uh, later uh, readout uh, during the sequencing. So in order to solve uh, uh, this problem, we develop a new system by combining uh, AAV with transposer for efficient delivery of the vector as well as the uh, uh, efficient uh, integration. So what we do is uh, we flag the guide RNA with uh, inverted repeat for the transposer. While at the same time, we put this uh, uh, transposer cascade into the AAV system. So you can imagine that by package this vector into different uh, serotypes, you can target this vector to different tissues such as the uh, brain, muscle, uh, liver and heart, or even uh, primary cells that are difficult to manipulate uh, ex vivo. Uh, the, uh, by combining with a uh, Cas9 expressing mouse, uh, we can like edit uh, the, the, the cell population you are targeted, while uh, this uh, guide RA will also be integrated for later readout. Uh, the, with this system, you can, uh, you can easily perform phenotypical screening, whether it is uh, through uh, 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 growth uh, uh, advantage, or uh, uh, if you want to see some genes that regulate gene expression of specific markers using uh, fluorescent. So with that said, I would like to thank everybody in the lab, and I would uh, take any questions you have. Awesome. Very cool talk and very cool finding. So maybe I can kick it off. Um, I noticed that in your, um, in your, it was, was it the protein BAS2? Yes. I right? Yes, BAS2. In your BAS2 knockout, the basal mass is the same, but you really require an injury signal. So yes. what, do, what do you, what do you think the second signal is that, that sort of triggers all of this? So for instance, if you give things like IL-6 or some kind of damage factor to the basal, would you start seeing the liver get bigger? Uh, so, so, so far what I have found is uh, 
after we give uh, after we uh we inhibit uh the bats uh bats to uh proteins uh, that give a uh, 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 injury, it doesn't really make the liver bigger. So I think because uh, because uh, our body is uh, so like conserved, so I think there might be some other factors that are regulating the tissue size or other IP genetic factors or growth factors that are regulating the tissue size. That's really interesting. Um, and you do you have a sense of what those are or are you planning on reverse screens to look at what is limiting size and limiting cancer? Yeah, so so uh, there has been very uh, a lot of questions of uh, what is uh, limiting uh, the, the the tissue size because uh, uh, if you perform a, a partial hepatectomy in the liver, it's never grow bigger than the original masses. So there must be some uh, inhibitory uh, signals uh, that are regulating uh, uh, the liver sizes. So this has always been a mystery in the liver biology. So some people have done like blood uh, transfer experiment to in order to find those uh, 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 secreted factors, but uh, uh, until now nobody has known what is actually regulating limiting this fact, limiting the tissue sizes. Very cool. Um, all right, folks. So if we have no other questions for time, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. But thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, just a very cool approach. I like that it's unbiased and very cool discovery. Um, so our next speaker, our next and last speaker um, is Wouter Masseling from the Research Institute of Pathology, the Tanaka Lab. So do you wanna pop on? Sure. And did I totally butcher your name or was I kind of on um, the mark? Only slightly, only slightly. Okay, how do you say it? Wouter Masseling, but that's all right. Okay, so I totally butchered it, I'm sorry. Wouter Masseling, so please take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. So I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Tanaka lab and I feel very honored and excited to give you just a flavor of some of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years in the lab. Now, uh, regeneration, as we all probably know by now, is the successful attempt of an organism and regrowing a structure post-embryonically. And while the end result of development and regeneration can be quite similar, Today, I hope to convince you that the underlying mechanisms that control the two can actually be quite different. Now, I didn't do this work by myself. This is a very collaborative project between uh, both our lab, the Tanaka lab and the Troitline lab. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of my collaborators here. So in some ways, the axolotl is actually a pretty typical vertebrate. It forms so much during embryogenesis just like any other vertebrate, which will result in segmented vertebrae, just like any other vertebrate. But unlike any other vertebrate, or most vertebrates, I should say, the axolotl manages to redo this patterning event during regeneration. So what happens is that upon amputation, a blastema will form, and as the tail regenerates, both the spinal cord and a cartilaginous rod will form. And eventually, it is this cartilaginous rod that will give rise to a full complement of segmented vertebrae. And this is not just a structural reestablishment. This is a complete reestablishment of function. So animals with a virgin tail display typical C bending as an escape response. And this is also reestablished in the regenerating tail. We thus have an example of primary body axis regeneration in a vertebrate species where the end result of regeneration mimics the end result of development incredibly closely. So the obvious question that we ask here, what's the mechanism that leads to such an accurate reestablishment? Is this recapitulating development or is this something different altogether? So during embryogenesis, vertebrate segmentation occurs essentially in a three-step process. Initially, so much will form these uh, epithelial balls on either side of the notochord. This is then followed by a further subdivision of each somite in rostrocaudal domains. And after which the caudal domain of one somite and the rostral domain of the adjacent somite together will go on to form a single vertebrate. The end result being a register where muscle and vertebrae are half a segment offset relative to each other. 
So in the axolotl embryo, these somats are quite easily identified through H&E staining. We can show that here. And keep in mind that it's these somites that are responsible for these segmented vertebrae. Now, while the end result of regeneration is also a segmented vertebrae, no evidence of these somites can be found in a tailblastema. Instead, what we see is the earliest segmenting structure seems to be the musculature. So what about rostral cordal polarity? In the embryo, this is typically exemplified by the expression of TBX18 and UNGS in the rostral and caudal domains respectively. But when we look at our RNA-seq data, TBX18 and UNGS, well, they are observed in the axolotl somites, but in the regenerating tail, they're virtually absent. So without rostral cordal polarity during tail regeneration, is that whole muscle vertebrae register then accurately recapitulated? Now, in the virgin tail, we can see that muscle labeled with CAGS GFP here and vertebrae in alizar and red in magenta, they're both nicely in register with each other. So vertebrae consistently line up with the muscle boundaries. However, when we now look at the regenerated tails, what's quite striking is that these uh, vertebrae, they do not line up with the muscle boundaries. Instead, based on our quantification, this actually seems to be completely random. Now with somatogenesis absent, muscle and vertebrae segment seemingly independent of each other. And if vertebrae segmentation is indeed somewhat independent, could a local injury then accurately regenerate? So that's what we looked at here. So here I'm showing you an axolotl vertebral column with col one a 2 GFP, a transgenic line that labels the cartilage, and alizar in red, again, that labels the vertebrae. Now we removed three vertebrae, and if we fast forward three weeks into the future, we can see that a cartilaginous rod has formed, and in just one more week, all three of these vertebrae have regenerated. Now this shows us that vertebrae segmentation during regeneration is a somewhat independent and autonomous process, and therefore fundamentally different from what we canonically understand about development. So with the patterning mechanism so different, what about the cellular basis? Is there a, any evidence for a multipotent resident progenitor? So in order to determine this, we made several transgenic tree lines and performed a whole bunch of lineage tracing studies. And here I'm showing you just some of the results that we got in this case for this col one a 2 Cree line. And after labeling, we can see that all major connective tissue populations are labeled, including the cartilage, the intermyotome population, and also the fin mesenchyme. And we can see that during regeneration, these cells contribute and reestablish all of these lineages. So we have the cartilage, the intermyotome, the fin mesenchyme, but now also a labeling of the musculature. Now we performed a whole bunch of several other grafting and lineage tracing experiments. And we found that most of these populations have only a very limited potency to contribute to the regenerating tail, except for this intermyotome population. And we speculate, therefore, that they might harbor a multipotent resident progenitor. So these intermyotomal cells main, are mainly made up of the myotendinal junction. And in our single cell RNA-seq data, these can be identified using several markers, including MEOX, FGF8, a little bit over there, scleraxis, and also lunatic fringe. So to test the potency of this population, we then went ahead and generated yet another free transgenic line, this time based on a lunatic fringe promoter. And we traced the contribution of these cells during tail regeneration as well. So while initially you can see only very few cells are labeled, during regeneration, we observe a very dramatic contribution to both the musculature, the intermyotome population, and also the dermis. Now this is perfectly consistent with the hypothesis that the MTJ could contain a multipotent resident progenitor. So just to recapitulate, I've shown you that vertebrae patterning during tail regeneration is a somewhat independent and autonomous process. And interestingly, this is somewhat analogous to a process that was previously observed 
and thought to be specific to Crown Telios. Here, the notochord provides a template uh, to the vertebral centra, possibly through some mechanism based on notch lateral inhibition. Now, in the second part, I've told you that lunatic fringe and MEOX positive cells located at the MTJ could represent a multipotent progenitor with somat like lineage potential. Now, to really examine this, we are actually in the process of taking this clonal barcode labeling approach. And we've adapted the cell tag system described by the Morris lab to our preferred foamy virus system. And with this, we can now perform in serial infections with tens of thousands of GFP tag unique barcodes, allowing us to trace the lineage contribution of each and every infected cell. Now, in the future, some experiments that I really dream of and what I found absolutely fascinating is trying to understand how the system, quote unquote, knows how much to regenerate at what scale and the correct length. So the number and size of vertebrae are accurately reestablished. Now, theoretically, we should only need two of these three to be specified, while the third could simply be an emergent property of the other two. Now, the Echeverry lab managed to induce an artifact artificially longer tail by overexpressing the MER196 mimic. And this image shows you the beginning of segmentation and actually reveals that vertebrae number and tail length during regeneration can be uncoupled. Moreover, it reveals us that vertebrae numbers are fixed. And we therefore think that segment number and tail length could represent fixed properties with segment size possibly be being the emergent property. Now to examine segment size specification in this regeneration specific context, we're actually in the process of generating notch reporters. So here you can see just one of these reporters and that uses the CBF1 responsive element to drive nuclear venous expression. And if notch activity is indeed the mechanism by which vertebrae are patterned, Precise and detailed imaging of such a reporter during regeneration in various sized axolotls, so small, medium, and large, would provide priceless information towards understanding the interplay of tail length, segment number, and segment size. Now, it's been my absolute pleasure to provide the last talk for the day, and I'm actually already looking forward to seeing what day two is going to bring. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Um, and you know what, we couldn't have ended on a better note, but uh, we're open for questions. And I want to kick it off actually during your talk. So you beautifully showed, and this really draws from the discussion for the last session, that regenerative programs are different than developmental programs, right? And that we should, in adult regeneration, and that we should be understanding these programs, their unicity, because that might inform regeneration better than development programs. But I'm wondering, is there actually a disadvantage to repurposing developmental programs in adult regeneration? So if you take your developmental transcription factors that you were, you know, you kind of said these don't show up in the adult lastima and overexpress them, what happens? Do you know? Uh, we haven't done that experiment. The, the problem in this case would be to control the overexpression specifically enough to reconstitute the same pattern. And currently we wouldn't have any mechanism to do that. Uh, of course, general, a broad overexpression of any of such an important transcription factor would both during embryogenesis and during regeneration most likely lead to uh, gross abnormal development and regeneration. So we haven't tried that. And we, unfortunately we don't have the tools to do this yeah. specifically enough. But I'm just wondering, oh, so I guess maybe we can speak about your broader thoughts of like, why not repurpose the same mechanism? Why create a completely new mechanism, right? So maybe it is, and we don't understand development properly. So what I mentioned uh, towards the end is this idea that uh, vertebrae segmentation, at least in crown teleos, uh, seems to use this uh, secondary mechanism. Of course, they also form somites, but the notochord plays a role in patterning the vertebrae as well. So there are some analogies there. And it actually, if you go into the literature, even in mice, even although it's not 
very clear. It seems that the somat mutants in mice have fairly mild vertebral defects, milder than you would otherwise maybe expect to see. So there could be some redundancy and alternative mechanisms that are just particularly uh, pronounced or more obvious in uh, crown telios and are very obvious uh, in the axolotl during regeneration because somats are absent. Very interesting. So we have another question. Is feedback from the axolotl attempting to use the regenerating trait is the, uh, sorry, uh, is feedback from the axolotl attempting to use the regenerating tail important for correct structure formation? So I guess the motility of that tail as it's regenerating, how does that inform structure? Um, we haven't done that experiment. Uh, I could imagine a theoretical mechanism. We could transect the spinal cord and immobilize the tail from the uh, transection down that the problem is that probably won't regenerate. So, but this, this is not necessarily a uh, me, um, dependent on um, motor cues and uh, physical stimulation and activity, uh, but more dependent on the uh, molecular cues uh, that we, uh, that you prevent uh, that can't reach the tail anymore. Um, not sure, not sure. All right, well, that's a good place to end because we're, we're, we're not sure either, right? Yeah. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining us um, and please come back tomorrow. Thanks for our wonderful speakers, discussion leaders. Um, so please come back tomorrow at 10.30. We'll see you bright and early, 10.30 Eastern Standard Time um, and have a good evening, everyone. And panelists, please uh, log on to your your next Zoom link, which Janine is going to send out. So have a good night, everyone, or afternoon or evening or, you know, whatever it is in your time zone. <laughs>